order the regular session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, March 19, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vatikiotis. Here. Vice Mayor Eisner. Here. Commissioner Koulias. Here. Commissioner Koulianis. Here. Commissioner DiDonato. Here. Uh, this evening's uh, invocation will be given by Reverend Milton Smith, chaplain for our first responders. If we can remain standing and turn and pledge allegiance to the flag afterwards. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather the city leaders, these commissioners and mayor, vice mayor, our city leaders, our police chief and fire chief and heads of all the departments of this city. We pray, Lord, you would bless them and keep them and guide them as they do things to make Tarpon Springs a better place. We thank you for this first day of spring. May it spring new ideas and, and new, and new uh, things that will bring us together and new things that will make this city shine. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, liberty, and justice for all. I just have one uh, brief announcement. We have a community rating agency meeting right after the Board of Commissioners. I want to remind everyone of that, and we'll also have uh, uh, Attorney Dan Lewis sitting in for Mrs. Uh, Kardash on that one. Now let's go to public comments. Are there any public comments this evening? Public comments on anything that's not on the agenda. Don't be shy. <laughs> Good evening. Katie Taylor, 1991 Douglas Lane, Tarpon Springs. I wanted to follow up uh, on the the paint strips that was gonna repaint the street at the corner of um, Live Oak and US 19. I was just seeing that those arrows have not been painted yet. And I think, uh, Cap was it Chief Captain Young was gonna check on that. The second thing was, I was gonna ask if they can not, not have a speed bump because I know you can't do speed bumps but speed strips to sto slow down traffic between Gross Avenue and Levis Avenue uh, um, because it's a lot of traffic that's going through there fast and I understand that the city told that community one time that they could not put a speed bump there for liability reasons. I think they said, you might have said it, Mayor, might not have been you, but it was a mayor at that time. But I wanted to ask if that could be followed up on because there's a lot of speeders going through that, right through that um, particular block. And also on the, the corner of Levis and Lime on the east side, that empty lot, cars are doing donuts in there. They say it's doing donuts so, so much spinning around in a, in a circle that it's causing dust to actually go up. So I don't know if, any, if you can put any kind of speed uh, signs out there to see, check that traffic that's going from uh, Martin Luther King uh, on Levis all the way to Tarpon Avenue, or Pinellas Avenue. So the main thing that we want to ask for is speed bump strips between Gross Avenue and Lime Street by Mount Hermon because it's a, it's a kid's <coughs> play out there. And we'd like to have that area checked for traffic if we could. Um. City Manager, of course, we're going to have. Um, do you want to say anything? I was just going to ask. Oh, that would just Chief be Young something to... that the that the uh, traffic unit, uh, the police department, right. would look at. So I'm sure Frank will get that message back to them, and they'll look at those those issues. Ms. Okay. Taylor, somebody will be contacting you, and you can have a long conversation about that. There's um, speed bumps or something that we've uh, not done here for some very good reasons and the police department can explain to you, but that doesn't mean there are other things that can be done to slow down traffic. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you, that. Taylor. Are there any other public comments? Good evening. Peter Alakis 514. Oh, I need to get reset. Peter Alakis 514 Ashland Avenue, Tarpon Springs. Um, 
I'm going to read a little part of a passage of Psalm 106, and uh, I pulled it up by looking for something of gratitude, and I'll explain that afterwards. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are they who maintain justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. So, sorry I missed the last meeting, but I did watch it. And uh, part of the reason was that I had gone camping out on uh, Cumberland Island. If you're not familiar, it's an island right off the coast of Georgia, just above Jacksonville, off of St. Mary's, and you have to take a ferry to it. It's not what I'm used to with pulling a trailer, but uh, you hike in three and a half miles to your campsite with 45 pounds of gear and food and stuff like that. And you're out there for three or four days and uh, you're dealing with the elements and that's when that storm last Tuesday came through. Thankfully, we we're far enough east that we just mostly got rain, but then you hike back and uh, take the ferry back and you come home. And I guess the point I'm getting to is sometimes we, as Americans and maybe other countries also, forget how important and how nice it is just to have some of the simple things in life and being grateful for it, to come home, take a hot shower, open your fridge, have juice and food. So when you think about what you have, quit looking at what you want more of and be grateful for what you do have. Now, as far as to some more city stuff, I would like to follow up on the previous comments and what have been mentioned many a times before about opening up distant. I know in some areas it may be controversial, and I'm going to remind the board that we had workshops. You can check with Renee and Alice, Allie and Pat. They were at that meeting. Commissioner Correction, former Vice, Vice Mayor Lunt was there. All the legwork's been done. It's been noted what the people want out there, and it needs to be done. About three weeks ago, I'm sure Assistant Chief Regario can mention it, uh, we had driven down to Dunedin to go hear some music. We left around 8-something. It was a Friday, driving down Alt-19, traffic backed all the way to Klosterman and all the way Klosterman up the hill. Coming back at 10.30, same thing, found out later, I guess there was a motorcycle accident and that part of 19 was closed out. All those people forced all the way to Alt-19. You need to open up Diston. And when those issues occur, to relieve the fears or the concerns of the neighborhood, you know it's going on, station officers there to help direct traffic and keep things calm. And in the meantime, I've mentioned it, there's three intersections that you can put stop signs on, on the north part of Disson from Klosterman all the way up to Ivy. There's Ivy Place and Sandy Hollow, two stop signs, they'll break up the speed path. Things can be done already to alleviate traffic such that the concerns of the people in that area will not be heightened when we open that road, which needs to be done. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Uh, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments this evening? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jacobs, did we get any emails? Not for this. No emails, okay. On any other items as well? I'm just on the one item uh, for the... Which, which item would that be? I believe it's number 10 for Inkvote Road. The RV park or, okay. Um, all right, let's go to the uh, consent agenda. 
Are there any of the three items that um, commissioners would like to pull? Okay. Uh, the, the consent agenda, agenda is uh, 1A, Eunice Salzman Jensen, uh, invoice 80597. Item 1B, Eunice Salzman Jensen, invoice 80598. Item 1C, person Cohen Mooney Fernandez and Jackson PA, invoice 4779. And item 1D, Johnson Jackson, invoice 12446. Item 2, increase file number 200087-CAM, maintenance, repair, and operations, supplies, and related services through the Omnia Partners Contract R192006. Item 3, award file number 240039-B-PH, flexi paved tree well installation. Are there any public comments on any of these three items? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments on any of the um, consent agenda? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Okay, thank you. Commissioner comments, uh, Vice Mayor Eisner, you've got your light on. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Once again, I just wanted to make the residents aware this is just another $35,000 increase and they have been relentless with these increases um, for whatever reason. Um, classify it as you may, but this is just continuing to affect all the residents in Tarpon Springs. Um, not to say that it's not necessary, but <clears throat> at each meeting, we just get one after the other. As you'd know about your grocery and your gas and everything else is just going through the roof. So that was my comment to make. Okay. Are there any other commissioner comments? Uh, commissioner Cuyas. Yes, Mayor. I just wanted to follow up and I would ask that on the city attorney billings that, and I, I've spoken with uh, Ms. Kardash, that um, when they talk about conversations, it, it would mention the mayor or vice mayor, but then commissioner would be blank. And I, I'd just like a little bit more detail as which commissioner was talking during the bills, because now we have three. And uh, as the vice mayor spot will change, I'd just like to have some. Um, You'd like to have more, more information on the conversations? Um, Just I, who, the, who the commissioner was. Ms. Kardash, would you like to comment on that? I, I'm fine with that. I can include it. I usually just put, when I'm talking to a public official, I usually put their title and that's it. Okay. Um, so I have no problem identifying, you know, which commissioner I'm speaking with. Would, would you, uh, Commissioner Kuya, are you interested uh, in for the uh, backup so that the residents can see it as well or just for your own information? Well, just uh, as it's in the details, when it says commissioner, if we just add that extra <coughs> name inside, okay. that would be perfect. Um, Ms. Kardash, I'm going to leave it to you and, and, Absolutely. and mm -hmm. have some more information with uh, Commissioner Kuyas. Okay. Anybody else? We have a motion to approve consent agenda items one, two, and three. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. If there's no further comments, roll call, please. Commissioner DiDonato? Yes. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Kouliannis? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Batikiotis? Uh, yes. Uh, special consent agenda, public art committee submission for board of commission uh, approval, the coach Rudy Mural, Dorset Park. Um, I'm going to leave, let you start it off, and Ms. Jennings is here, the chair. Yeah, we're going to we're okay. going to team. I'm going to do the first part, and then Ms. Jennings is going to come up. Right. Um, what this relates to the, the city commission has already approved um, a historical plaque, a proclamation for a Rudy Day, and we've got a we've got an event the last Saturday in April, which I believe is April 27th, honoring Mr. Calvin Royal. Um, when we brought it before the board. Um, you saw what his, what his contribution was with the community and the Union Academy, and especially um, with kids in that neighborhood. And of course, it was the direction of this board for this year to start honoring the history and doing things in the community to honor that history. We've, we've got Friday, we've got the historical plaque for Mr. Dorsett, and then this would be the second one that we're doing on the 27th. As a dual 
item for that. The family had been working with the Public Art Committee. This is not connection with what I was doing with there, but there was a dual request with Public Art about a mural on one of the sides of the building to depict that. And the, the hope was that on the 27th, when we have the, the event at the park and we unveil the historical plaque, that we can unveil the mural too. Now, that was never a guarantee. In fact, I didn't know if the Art Committee could get through and get it by that time, but Thanks to Ms. Jennings and the Art Committee, miraculously, in fact, before their meeting, I was thinking, you know, I had a game plan for having maybe a replica on the thing saying this is coming, this mural may be coming and something like that because we wouldn't make it. But um, it was approved and what we're bringing forward to you obviously is the, is the approval of the board um, to put the mural on, on the city piece of property, which is, that, which is the building there and the contract attached to it. And because of the timing and the ability of the Public Art Committee to get it done at their March meeting, um, we will be able to have simultaneously the unveiling of the mural and the unveiling of the historical um, as we do the celebration of the event. So with that, I'll turn over to Ms. Jennings, who, who made this all happen. Oh, thank you her, very with much. Her, with a group. Thank you. Uh, this was a rather unusual project for us because the artist and the design were brought to us by members of the uh, Rudy Committee and the family. So um, the original design was submitted to us at our March meeting. We made some suggestions for some tweaks in the design. Uh, the artist submitted it. Um, uh, Ms. Woods, our city liaison, did a lot of legwork in um, contacting Speed Pro because the uh, Public Art Committee had uh, decided to have the uh, work put on the building in the form of an applique similar to the Christopher Still uh, applique that's on the uh, Chamber of Commerce building. So if you look at your backup, you have two invoices. That's why I wanted to explain it a bit. One of the invoices is for the artist, for his fee, and for his materials. And the second one is uh, Speed Pro for the uh, applique. And that also includes uh, you know, prepping uh, the building that the applique is going to be applied to. Um, the artist is going to be submitting an original art piece, which is a combination of an original painting, which are the figures, and a graphically designed background. So it's kind of a hybrid uh, art piece, which is very interesting. So um, the, uh, the art piece will become uh, property of the city, and I thought it would be nice if the uh, Board of Commissioners would also approve a presentation of the actual art piece to the royal family, since it does honor, you know, Coach Rudy. Does anybody have any questions or comments or? Let me, um, let, let me ask the public first if they've got any comments sure. and we'll go to the commissioners. Any, uh, any comments from the commission, I'm sorry, from the residents? concerning this item. This is the uh, Rudy Royal uh, mural that's going to be placed on the uh, concession stand at Dorset Park. Be short here, Peter Ox, 514 Ashland Avenue. Thank you, Ms. Jennings and all the people on the uh, committee. And I'm assuming this might be the artist. No, uh, oh. Graham Jones is the vice chair of the public art. Oh, committee. okay. I'm sorry for the misrepresentation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I appreciate the fact that the city has worked to coordinate this all together. And I'm really proud to say that it shows we are a community of diversity and we are reaching out to those in our area and our neighborhoods who've not had the equal publicity or marketing or respect that some of the other cultures in the area have gotten. So thank you for all your hard work. And uh, this will be fun to see. And will we be getting notices through f Facebook or? Yes. Or... Yes. One comment on the city's website has news. You click on it, it's old stuff from like so can we also post We're something? presently working on revisions to the website and that's one okay. of the top things on there. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments on this item? Mr. Jump, any remote access comments? Online, would like to speak on this item? Please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk.
and we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, um, let's get back to the commission. Any questions from Ms. Jennings or comments? Vice Mayor Eisner, I just saw you push your light off. That so usually yes, means I have on. something to Go say. Ahead. Thank you. Um, would you be able to explain, I know what the $2,500, would you explain the $300? Uh, the $300 is reimbursement for the artist's materials. And, um, you know, as usual, the committee has a fiduciary responsibility. So when uh, that invoice is submitted for, for payment, usually we pay in, you know, uh, increments. Uh, it will, he will have to also present uh, receipts for reimbursement. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other commissioners uh, comments or questions? Oh, by the way, I just realized I also like to acknowledge uh, Katie Taylor, Ms. who's Taylor. also a member of the Public Art Committee. And also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Great. Graham is yes. behind you, he's the assistant chairperson. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanna thank everybody for all your hard work on this. I know it's, it was kind of a unique project and a lot of mm -hmm. um, um, loose ends that actually had to be wrapped around together to get this mural done. And, and I think the applique is uh, a, a good idea uh, because of the maintenance that's always gonna be done on that building rather than having to worry about uh, painting over the mural and then redoing it, just order a new applique and, and putting it over the old one, which in the one, by the way, especially with the sun that beats on it at this, on the side of the chamber seems to be holding up very well, including right, the, yeah. the colors. Right, so. I think they apply a special UV coating that prevents, you know, fading and, you know, just general wear and tear from the elements, which we obviously need down here in Florida. So yeah. they do a really good job. I think um, next time we do directional signs for the city, <laughs> maybe the applique process would be the best way to go, It'd prevent the fading and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So but that's for the future yes okay okay um, thank you very much oh, any, okay thank you um if there's um no further questions for ms jenning may i have a um a motion to approve item four please so moved, so moved. is there a second second okay roll call please commissioner d donato yes commissioner Koulianis. yes commissioner Kouyas. yes vice mayor eisner yes mayor batikiotis yes Item five, the dredge spoil site lease extension, city manager, of course. Yes, Bob Robertson will be doing the, the next two items. The first one is the dredge spoil site lease extension. Bob. Thanks, uh, Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. I'll start this item with some good news. Um, dredging work is finally complete in the Anklet River with respect to the federal channel and the city turning basin. I'm really happy, I'm waiting a long time to be able to say those words. Uh, and now we're moving into the demobilization and the restoration phase of the project. So um, as you're aware, the city leases the property for the dewatering of the dredge spoils. The lease is set to expire at the end of this month. That's the reason for this item. So we're requesting the board's approval to extend the lease by up to six months to allow for plenty of time to restore the property in accordance with our DEP permit and the lease contract terms that would extend the lease to the end of September, 2024. That's my brief staff report, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, we might wanna talk about the, uh, the issue before that we dealt with about the transportation of dirt, how we're, how we're resolving the uh, not having 600 dump trucks come through town. Sure, no problem. <laughs> uh, so we've revised our plan and DEP has approved this plan to leave the materials on the property. We're gonna regrade the site. Um, and uh, what this does is it's obvious, it's a less expensive option because we're not moving material. And as the city manager said, we're not trucking material offsite and through town. Uh, this board had, has previously stated concerns regarding trucking material through town. So we're happy to be able to re resolve that as well. And do we know estimate of how much money that's gonna save us? Um, it's, it's ballpark in my head from numbers I've seen, but probably three to $500,000 savings. Okay. by leaving it on site. Okay, that's money we could spend on somewhere else, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm teasing you. I'm, it's, <laughs> money's been getting hard to find, so uh, uh, any kind of um, uh, savings or money that we don't have to spend in one place is well appreciated. So um, let me go to commission, I'm sorry, residents' comments. Are there any resident comments on this item? Your Lax 514 Ashland Avenue. It's good to hear that we're all done with the dredge in part. And I can appreciate the fact of not wanting to 
haul all that material off. Um, but then it strikes me, your dredged material off the bottom of the Anclote River that has accumulated, I would say, probably numerous potential toxic or carcinogenic chemicals, arsenic, lead, fuel components that had broken down. So my only concern at this point, I'm not familiar with the land itself, how it will be spread out if it's treed, but you may want to cover yourself for any kind of future liability if it comes out that the land is no longer usable for other purposes because of what we put on the site. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Uh, Craig Lunt, 743 Chesapeake Drive. Um, you've doubtless heard me mention this before. Um, we're saving money on the fact that we're not removing the material from this dredging site or from the spoil site, rather. Um, we're always on the continual hunt for a permanent spoil site. Um, I'm aware of the current conditions as far as pricing with that site. But as we look to what we're saving for not moving the material, what we're having to spend for just basic restoration, even if we don't remove the material, what the cost is of finding another dredge site and what the cost of is, is of conditioning this dredge site. And we have a dredge spoil site that's just literally working really well for us. I think the city needs to seriously consider uh, further negotiations with, with the Stamus group to, to, uh, to get this site. It's, if we don't get it now, um, trust me, I've looked. There's not too many sites that would fit this, and none is adequately. Um, so I know it's a huge expense for the city. I wish I could make it less. I think when we take into account the decommissioning and recommissioning and, and et cetera, with acquiring new property, all that sort of thing, I think we'll find that you know it might mitigate maybe a million dollars or 1.2. I'm you know pulling this out of my head. Um, but that should be taken into account when we're looking for another drill. We, we've got to do it now. I mean, the, we, yeah, we've done the turning basin and the federal channel. We still have to do all the other um, auxiliary channels and so forth to the bayous in the city. And 10 years from now, we're going to have to dredge that channel again. So it's, it's a long-term commitment, but I think it's one that's best for the city. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's probably a piece of property we should have bought a long time ago when this thing first came up. We used the same site in uh, 1995 for the uh, Spoil Island, and, and um, so we've had opportunities to do that. Uh, we did talk to the Stamus family about purchasing it. We actually did do a, um, an appraisal on the property that came, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, three and a half million dollars. And then the, the Stamus family, it's not any one, it's the family has to make a decision, um, was asking five and a half million dollars. And they'd actually had someone offer that amount of money for the property. I don't know whether they agreed to it or not or, or whatever, but uh, I did get a call uh, from Mr. Stamus uh, maybe a month or two ago asking if the city's position has changed on a piece of property. And I told him at five and a half million dollars, I, I just, we just need to look for some other options uh, at that time. Now, if the commission wants to negotiate uh, further with Mr. Stamus and see if they'll come off that five and a half million dollars, I don't think they're going to get down to three and a half, which is what the property is is worth. Uh, I, that would be fine. I don't have an issue with it. Uh, I do know that city manager, of course, is talking to um, to some other people right now for some other potential sites and waiting to hear back on that. Um, in conjunction with some other work that they're doing, uh, the developers work doing together with the city. So we'll see what comes from that. And that's also, uh, it looks like it's a pretty good site as well. Low, but that's okay, it would be cheaper. <laughs> so, um, Commissioner DiDonato, did you have anything? I, I just want to concur, because I know that's been talked about on multiple occasions. And I think your, your point's well taken. The land is not gonna get cheaper, it's only getting more and more scarce. And it, uh, hopefully, 
through this last process, Christy, you would know more, more than I on, on this because you negotiate a lot of it, but we, we need to plan as if we're gonna do this every five to 10 years and let the powers that be know that. And one of the ways to do that is if we have her on site. So I would hope that we continue to search for the proper location to do that. I, I think what would probably need to happen is uh, city manager, of course, probably should have a conversation with all of you to bring you up to speed on what he's doing. I know we've tried to get a real estate consultant on board. We've advertised twice with no uh, takers uh, for the real estate consultant to help us do the technical search for the property. But and he's and the city manager's looking for a an alternative to that, so I'm hoping we'll hear better. Um, I've, I've talked to him privately about it a, a few times, so I'm hoping we'll hear something back from him on that as well soon. So it's not anything that's been forgotten, it's just that this particular site is a, is a hard nut to crack at five and a half million dollars. That's for 14 acres. Um, let's see, somebody else, Commissioner Koulianis. Yeah, just, uh, Bob, what are we, what are we currently paying uh, a month? Eight thousand one hundred and sixteen dollars a month. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, anybody else, yeah. Commissioner Kuyas? Mayor, I want to ask if <clears throat> if this site was purchased by the city, how will it be used? You know, every five to ten years, is it you just keep adding spoils on top of it, or you use it as a a base to get all the spoils there at some point and, and transfer? And that's it would be basically our our station to, you can just explain that a little bit? Well, I mean, it, it's an ideal site because it's a adjacent to the reverse osmosis uh, plan and it'd be a terrific site for expanding into that in the future. We don't need 14 acres, but I don't, uh, I do not believe that the family would uh, split it out. They'd no, want to sell the whole thing. It's also adjacent to the trail. And also we still have the Project Hope with the um, Shepherd Center would be a perfect location to take a couple of acres for that and uh, relocate the Shepherd Center from downtown, the food, uh, and, and along with whatever uh, services that they're providing for the indigent to that new location as well as planned. So there, it's an ideal site. It's just a, a, an expensive site. And again, if, if the commission wants to have an agenda and a discussion on that, uh, City Manager, of course, could contact the Stamas family and, and bring some additional information to us on it. Thank you. What, what, what about an off-city site? If we go further, further east, for example, so the land's a little bit cheaper. Uh, further north, I mean, you might you have to travel, I understand, but I, I just, it's, it's an ongoing need. We depend on the Anclote River. We need, we need to start well, there's, planning more, I guess. There, if, I don't want to get into too much detail, but you want to go just, ahead and Just let me make it simple now, especially since we're into something. What we've done, especially without being able to, being successful in getting a real estate person looking for, we're basically staff-wise looking at chunks of land that would be possible. We found one, but that, that'd be more pricey than the, than the Stamets prize. That was completely out. That was a little more, we, and we got another piece. So we're looking at the pieces of property that are big enough looking and we're gonna, and the one that's a good prospect, um, you know, soon as soon as one person gets back into town, we're going to be meeting to see if that's even a viable process. So probably within a month, I'll know there's several other sites that we've looked at and tried to find. Um, if there's no hope for those and uh, the other prospects, it may be something that we may need the agenda and say, here we are. We've we've got out ourselves and looked at some pieces of land and approached, is it willing to sell? Is it gonna be in the price range to sell? Um, again, the one piece, pretty ideal and stuff, but it was gonna be more than the Stamus property was offering because they almost paid as much as the Stamus offering. So um, we're kind of doing it in-house and looking at those pieces. Uh, the good prospect that uh, the mayor talked about, you know, I, I know nothing except they're gonna meet with me to talk and to see if that's even a viable solution, um, if the board even has a viable solution to look at. So, so I'll probably have that information within the month. So, so we may need to bring this back and uh, talk about where we are. If, if, if the five and a half million dollars doesn't give you a pause to, you know, to, to think about it, that's probably something that we should discuss. It, it's gonna be up to the residents that make decisions. Absolutely. This secures a site for who knows what, 40, 50 years. 
for the, the it's river. It's a secure that's, site forever if we ever buy it. Long-term yeah. planning, so yeah, yeah. It should be a discussion soon. Okay. Vice Mayor Eisner, you got your light on. Thank you, Mayor. Um, isn't it somewhat the responsibility of the federal government to help us with some of those grant money for this, or is it our responsibility totally for the site? Isn't it th th their responsibility as well? The, the sponsor, the local sponsor, in this case would be us, is responsible for securing the upland site for the dewatering of the spoils material. Monies for dredge can come from federal funds, but we are responsible for the spoil site. <clears throat> where do other locations, when they do a dredge, where's their spill site? Is it usually local to their location? It can be any site. Um, you mean for this project or just right. in general? Well, no, for, you know, many, many locations have garbage disposal. They don't dump the garbage on their own property. They could put it elsewhere. Do we have the ability to do that where we could, as uh, Commissioner DiDonato said, where we could rent a location in a, in a different location and truck it in? Just have a smaller location for us to place it and then, you know, ship it somewhere. Oh, Pla I see. Place the material? Yes. I think what, maybe I'm, I want to make sure I'm understanding the question. I think maybe you're thinking of like a, a local small location for dewatering, then you would move the material to another location. Correct, yes. Yeah, that's certainly an option as well. Well, I'm trying to think of options other than $5 million. Sure. And I also would like to have that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with the city manager to know what other options we have before we discuss in public, you know, whether this $5 million, you know, it could look good to us in 50 years from now, $5 million. But right now, it doesn't look good because everything that's that we touch has been going up quadruple. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm sure if we dealt with that a while back, it could have been one million dollars, but we can't now. So, and I know as the uh, ex vice mayor spoke about, which I always agree with him on, you know, we have other dredging that we have to do that's not just the Anclope, um, you know, river, we have local that is long overdue. I think I asked the city manager, and I'm not even sure when the last time we actually did the local, um, you know, dredging. And that needs to be done, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see that we can have some place to at least possibly temporary, temporarily place this and then ship it out elsewhere um, if we can't have this location. So, but again, I don't want to speak before yeah. knowing what's in his plan. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Koulianis, go ahead. Just one. Um, I know, I, I, I would assume we're going to have some, before we move forward on something like that, we're going to have some kind of a workshop or um, special session. But what are the, and just briefly, what are the options for, disposing of dredge material besides land. Can dredge material be taken out on barges out into the Gulf? They, they do that. Um, that has been done. Um, they are talking about doing what is called in situ disposal for the outer cuts, which are coming. That dredge work is coming. Um, so that it's basically you're taking the material from a shallow part in the channel where we don't want it and moving it into a deeper part. Um, and then there's restoration, I'm sorry, then there's um, materials that can be stored on spoils islands and things like that. I think those are t much harder to get permitted than what is called an upland disposal, which is what we did for this project. So there are, there are other options. None are as good as the upland option. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other comments? Uh, City Manager, of course, you want to finish up on this? No, one? again, we'll, when we bring it back, we'll have all those. We'll be talking okay. about all those. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more information I can offer, but it's probably not, uh, you, you know, uh, related to the extending the, the lease right now. So um, if there's no further comments, may I have a motion to approve the lease extension? Mm -hmm. So moved. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner DiDonato? Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Batikiotis? Yes. Um, city Manager, of course, item six, city projects update. 
Yes, we want to give another for the commission and for the public some updates on our project, especially since we've got some good news on, on some of them to do. So, Bob, if you briefly give a review of the projects that we want to get to the commission and the public the information on where they are. Yes, sir. So I'll run through a list of projects here. Um, I'll start with uh, Mango Street. Uh, just today, Mango Street got its first layer of asphalt. Uh, the second lift is, uh, of asphalt is coming supposedly scheduled for tomorrow and the first level of striping by the end of this week, weather permitting. So I'm going to say my, uh, my best estimate for opening the road is next week. It could be as early as Friday, uh, weather permitting. Lemon Street is completely open. We're working through punch list items, uh, final things that need to get fixed, tweaks here and there, but that project is uh, substantially complete now. The MLK intersection project is, ex is experiencing um, a little bit of delay, maybe a couple of weeks. We discovered some interesting things once we tore the road up, uh, most notably um, concrete poured in places that you wouldn't expect concrete to be under a roadway. Uh, so having to remove all that is gonna cause some, some delays and, and um, pipelines that need to get relocated around it. But um, I think we're still looking at um, early to mid April to, to reopen MLK. Uh, let's see, Penton Gross, you may have already seen uh, some work happening out here on the stormwater project. Uh, most notably, the work is happening in the pond reconfiguration. That's the, the large stormwater pond next to the, the school, the elementary school. Um, you've probably seen the lay down yard over here is active in a construction mode. I don't have a road construction work scheduled just yet, but we're preparing for that and we'll send information out as that becomes available. Uh, we talked about the Ankle River dredge. I want to let you all know that um, with the completion of the dredging work, um, the contractor is now starting to demobilize. And what they need to do sometime next week is shut down the, the channel for a maximum of eight hours, just like they did when they installed uh, the pipeline. This is to remove the pipeline out of the, out of the river. Um, so they're going to send out the, the uh, local notice to mariners. They've already notified the Coast, notified the Coast Guard. Um, brought, they're going to be broadcasting this on the, uh, the radio channels, uh, the VHF. And then we're going to issue our own notice of that uh, through Facebook and uh, through all of our normal channels. Uh, as soon as I know which eight hour block that they've, they've got scheduled, they don't have that targeted just yet. But I should know that by the end of this week and we'll have that out. Um, Let's see, uh, I want to touch on Seabreeze Drive. We reached substantial completion on March 6th. We got the pump station working, tested it extensively. Uh, we sent notices to residents last Friday to uh, the, uh, uh, notifying them that uh, they're able to sign up now um, and complete their paperwork. Um, and now, um, as with most projects, once you reach substantial completion, now we're in the settling of the outstanding items uh, punch list items and all the other things that need to get fixed up before they get their final payments. Um, I'll touch on Bayshore Drive septic to sewer project. That contract is signed. We are scheduling a pre-construction meeting with the contractor probably for early April and probably won't see contractors on site till uh, early May as we get through the shop drawings and, and approvals and all the things required to get a project going. Um, just a few more for you here. Uh, the Elfer Spur trail extension construction is going to be starting soon. We finally got approval from DEP uh, through which our grant is, is been authorized to issue the notice to proceed to the contractor. Um, Fire Station 70 design is 99% complete. Uh, looking to probably May to advertise for construction bids on that. We're going to do a qualitative based uh, RFP to help us um, <coughs> get a good contractor for that. And then finally, um, you've seen we're making steady progress on the clerk's office. We, we know we're way behind the schedule there, uh, but the contractor is committed to continuing to work through it and uh, getting to the finish line. So those are the main highlights for you. Um, you have any questions or other co projects you'd like to discuss? Let's, let's go to the public first. Are sure. there any public comments on any of these projects? Peter Lacks, 514 Ashland Avenue. Um, first off, thank you, Bob, and all your staff. And I know Paul's gone, but he probably had some play in some of this. <sighs> what a plate this guy has to carry. And yet, he's on top of it all. 
we are so lucky to have Bob and some of the other people in that department who are diligently working hard to get these things done for us. I, uh, when I go up Mears to, because of the closure at the MLK, uh, I don't turn it distant, I go up to north. And today I went and I saw all the trucks there and uh, did my rounds and I actually had to go on the other side to deal with another business over there and they're all the way through there and it's just nice and smooth. So I'm hope that looks like, you know, you'll be done soon. However, <laughs> being that I live on Whitcomb Bayou, I sometimes drive up to the bridge there to see and I think middle of April is optimistic. Um, there's those big concrete things they have to set into the ground, all the plates, there's like some weirs. It's just, there's a lot of work yet to be done, but I appreciate the fact that uh, our staff is diligently working on this. And because the Anclote uh, Basin was also discussed, I'm going to bring up another point I thought up after the last discussion, eminent domain. I know you're afraid of the word sometimes. Y'all looked at it for a course, and Ms. Kardash gave you some information you could use, but if anything, this particular site probably would qualify more for any kind of eminent domain. And if you're looking at other sites, you talk about eminent domain, that might help your negotiations. But in the meantime, it's still in your back pocket. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, Mr. Robertson, I've got just two questions on the, um, on the uh, actually the one is a request on the um, notice to Mariners with regard to the closing off the channel. If we could make sure and, and be timely to email the commission as well so we can contact people down at the sponge docks as well. Um, I, I'm sure some of them look at the notice of Mariners on a daily basis, but there's others that are more into the recreational boating and dependent on boating that uh, people tie up at their docks and things like that. They don't don't read that on a regular basis, but they rely on us to communicate that. So that's the one request if we can yes, make sure of that. The other thing is the uh, firehouse uh, going out to bid. Um, did, I, I remember we have a discussion as far as the funding goes. Um, do, maybe you can help me recall. Wasn't there some money being moved around for that, and and or was that? fixed as far as um, go ahead that one was that that one was fixed we're, we're all set as far as i know in last time with ron that that money is all in place and, and is it for what was it for six million dollars yeah 6.7 million i think okay yes. and that that estimate is still uh correct as still far holding. as you're concerned okay yes, sir still holding um when when the design is done is it something that the commission is going to see as well or is this going to go straight out to bid what, what's the next item that we'll be bringing back to the, to the board? Uh, typically, we just bring it back for approval of a, a award of the construction contract, but we, I'd be happy to bring it back to the board if you'd like to see it before we do that. So, so site, plan. site plan, so you're going to hear it at site the plan. The site plan will come to us. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. You, that's what I was hoping for because there's going to be some adjacent, you know, neighborhood issues and things yes. like that. I want to make sure that the residents at least have Forgot some that. Yep. knowledge of what's being done before it actually yes. starts getting built. So that's good. Uh, let me go to the other commissioners. Uh, any other commissioners have questions? <clears throat> Commissioner Kudias. Yes, uh, thank you, Bob. I appreciate you putting the outer cuts out up on the, the project list. Those are expected to start in January, January 2025. I'd only ask for the Orange Street improvements as you're designing to consider the on the north side of um, Orange Street between Hibiscus and uh, Stafford to try to get an extra couple feet of right away because that area gets jammed up during the first Fridays as parking on both sides uh, start to occur and there's there's a lot of um, right away I think we can uh, take advantage of for that area. Yeah, that item is going to be coming within the next 
probably month or so, it's probably the, one of the main meetings, the, um, some different options on our, is gonna come back to you before we go any further. So that's, right. that's one of the projects that some items need to come back to you for you to make some of those decisions on and stuff. So that, that'll be coming probably one of the main meetings. Okay, thank on you. Orange. That's it, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, do we have anybody who has volunteered to hook up to Seabreeze yet? Yes. Um, is there any, who would be the liaison that if they ask, who does that go to? Does it go to you? Does it go to, who does that go to? Uh, we're facilitating that, but it starts with a building permit. A plumber has to, or the homeowner has to apply for a, per a plumbing permit to connect to the sewer. Okay. That's where the process starts and they, they'll pay their fees through, through that. Would you be able to tell me how many? How many have connected? No, no, yeah, how many have applied? I don't know, it's probably two or three right now. It's okay. only been since last Friday. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I know. I know when it went out, believe yeah. me. Okay. Um, so right now nobody's utilizing it, correct? I think we have one that's, that's connected now. Right, that's the, yeah. I know which one house it is. Um, the, Anclote Road project I want to speak about later. Um, the public safety building, did we have a follow-up? And I know I didn't ask this of you, I asked it of the insurance. Did we ever get insurance money for that loss? I'm not, that's one of the few things I'm not clued into. Again, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't know about sorry that to one. pin you with that one, but. <laughs> I don't know, I'll have to get the hands for you. I don't know that either. Yeah, because I ask that pretty much every time I see it. And I just want a, a yes or no, or a reason why they've denied it, because it is a viable loss, and you know we have the coverage. So, um, that's it for now. No, uh, I was. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Kulianis. Do you have anything? Mm. Okay. Um, do you do you want us to accept this or this? Yeah, just if, if, if you'd accept it. I have it. a motion to accept the uh, presentation on the project update, please, in a second. So moved. I'll second it. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner DiDonato? Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. Thank you. Uh, City Manager, of course, we're going to continue on with um, item seven and yes. uh, request to negotiate development agreement for property 44098 uh, US 19, former driving range. Um, yes, um, Renee's going to present it. Just to introduce you, we, we had this come before us and it, it was turned down. All you're, all you're doing tonight, and Renee will go into slightly more detail, all you're doing tonight is giving me permission to to work with Renee and go back to them to try to negotiate um, and agree with them to get an acceptable project. Um, the concern is there's a lot of other projects that are permitted uses that could be worse, not only for the location, but for those residents who had agreed to this project on. So we want to kind of work at what the qualms of the commissions were in the project, work with them and, and try to negotiate a development agreement to bring you back um, something. Um, you'd be given permission for me to negotiate tonight. And then there's a, in a period of time, I think 60 days or something, I have to bring you back a report and then eventually come back to you. But all you're doing tonight is giving permission um, to, to work with Renee and go back to them and negotiate to see if we can come into something that the board and the residents of that area would be acceptable for. Okay. Renee, do you want to add yes. the details to it, please? Uh, sure, before we do, is the applicant here, representative? I was looking around and I do not see Ms. Huber here. So I'm not sure. They very much knew the prop, the meeting. It was on the agenda tonight. You can go ahead and just give the overview. Okay, I thanks. say this is just permission to okay. negotiate. So um, if you recall, um, over the course of a, about six months, in, starting in February and look, going up to uh, July of last year, um, the board entertained, between the Planning and Zoning Board and the Board of Commissioners, um, uh, a couple of different attempts to amend the land use on this property uh, from residential office retail to commercial general, and really for two purposes. One, to get a slightly higher uh, floor area ratio, but more importantly, to allow a conditional use for a potential um, mini storage facility, which requires that different um, land use designation, and also to remove the, the requirement in the comp plan 
for a basically a residential mixed use project. So that was the, the genesis of why the, the application came forward. Ultimately, that through all that process, it was denied um, because there were just, you know, the board felt there was an inability for us to enforce the city to enforce a private agreement between the applicant and the adjacent residential land community or residential community. Um, the increase in potential dra potential traffic generation, uh, and there were questions about the Duke Energy easement, um, and then just lack of certainty regarding the site layout um, and inability to really enforce a site plan. So, um, in order to address those concerns, the applicant is requesting to negotiate a development agreement. Essentially, you know, they have submitted the same uh, site plan, example site plan, you know, and conditions that they would be willing to enter into um, as part of that negotiation negotiation process. So um, it doesn't bind the board. It basically opens it up for negotiation, but it, the development agreement process does allow you to address those things that you couldn't address through a regular land use map amendment because you couldn't put conditions and things like that. So that's the uh, the request from the applicant. Um, it's, uh, it's a legislative decision as to whether or not you want to entertain that. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, let's go to the public. Uh, did the applicants walk in, Ms. Vincent? I do not see them. No? Okay. They may have any, thought it started at 7.30, but... Um, oh, that's okay. okay. Any members? Well, this is part of the... Um, this is under special consent, so... Right, so we're, we're okay. Um, I, and I think we can address it without them being here. Okay. Um, is there any public comments here on this item? This is um, on, on redeveloping the old driving range, which caught fire and burned, and, and now it's just a vacant piece of property sitting there. Um, okay. Um, Mr. Jumper, are there any remote access comments on this? If anyone online would like to make a public comment on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. I, uh, Ms. Vincent, I've got just uh, one question, or actually a, a request as well. Um, my, my issue is more on public safety uh, with the potential of increasing traffic onto US-19. Um, I know that that was tied to the floor area ratio, and I, if I remember, if I... If I recall correctly, you, I know you sent us an email. If I recall correctly, what's being proposed right now would cut that traffic count to about half of what the original, uh, the current zoning would allow. Is that correct? With um, using the, the countywide plan generation of trip per acre, um, or trips, converting that to trips per square foot, um, it, would, it would decrease from what would be allowed the 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 far that would is being requested is a 0.45 the applicant is agreeing to a has stated in their application they would agree to a 0 0.30 so yes that would definitely reduce what would be allowed under the under the land use map amendment um uh if it goes forward yes is the 0 0.3 uh, floor area ratio uh part of this item that you're bringing to the commission it would be it's yes absolutely number. okay all right good that's all the questions I have. Vice Mayor Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in that last meeting, we held side a discussion on the wall that separates Brittany townhomes from this property. And one of the discussions was who was going to, I think they said they wanted to take care of it, correct me if I'm wrong, 25 years. And I think we want, at least I asked, you know, what happens at the end of 25 years? I didn't want to be in the midst of <coughs> litigation. So did, I, I don't know if you were able to discuss that with them. No, I, have, I don't have the ability to negotiate anything. Um, this is, that's why it's in front of you. That, that can be a negotiation point for the city manager at the point that if we move forward, that you know, who has to maintain we're that We're going to look perpetuity. at all those concerns from last yes. meeting, and that's one of them. On, that's what you're giving me permission to go negotiate with them on. You have my permission. <laughs> Anything else? Vice Mayor Eisenhower? No, no. That's it. Uh, that was anybody mainly. else? Uh, Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I'm going I'm to support the city manager being able to negotiate. I think uh, the applicants 
come back a couple times before and, and uh, try to work in within that zone. And it's just a negotiation point at this right now. So willing to support it. And uh, there was somewhere in the backup that uh, the HOA president of the nearby property was in support with, with most of the residents. So um, I'd like to see it before. Yeah, I, I just want to add, the, I, I know the city manager kind of follows these very closely, and he's uh, very good at uh, stating what he thinks is going to go with the commission and what is not going to go, and, and basically he even has voiced in the past for wasting your time to bring this to the commission because he knows it's not going to work. Uh, those are the extremes, but at least he'll be there as well. And you said 60 days, right? I think it's 60 by the... Uh, you have to report back ordinance. within 90 days. 90, okay. Um, 90 days. okay. But they have That's they fine. have to now submit the full application, pay the fee, and everything, okay. and then. Yeah. Ms. Kardash, do you have anything that you'd like to offer? Mm -hmm. Not on this. Um, you know, the point of being able to have development agreements is giving the city some more flexibility outside of sort of the black letter law of the code. Okay. And this will be under our new ordinance, the um, the five years. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's important. Okay. Um, if there's no further comments from the commission, may I have a motion to approve uh, authorizing the city manager to enter into a, a development negotiate development agreement negotiations on uh, property at four four zero nine eight U.S. nineteen North. So um, moved. Second. The former driving range. Okay. There's a, a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Di Donato. Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, let's continue on. It's 7.30. We're going to continue on with the uh, ordinances and resolutions. Application 2303-01, resolution 2024-07, conditional use approval and site plan approval for property at um, 38954 U.S. Highway 19 North. And this is a quasi-judicial matter. Um, Ms. Kardash, if you could read the resolution by title, uh, go over the instructions for the quasi-judicial process, swear in any, um, any witnesses that we may have, and also uh, request if there's any ex parte communications. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Resolution number 2024-07, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 2301, requesting conditional use approval, and application 23-98, requesting site plan approval to allow for a game room building bingo hall totaling 9,626 square feet of gross floor area and including parking and other site improvements on property located at 38954 U.S. Highway 19 North in the Highway Business District, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. <clears throat> the following Thank map, yeah. Go ahead. Um, the following matter before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners is quasi-judicial in nature. In a quasi-judicial quasi proceeding, the board's function is to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances. This is a legal decision regarding the application before the board. The board may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. If the evidence demonstrates that the application meets the criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances, then the board is required by law to grant the applicant's request. If the evidence demonstrates that the application does not meet the code criteria, then the board is required to deny the applicant's request. Any and all persons testifying at this hearing are required to do so under oath. All persons testifying must give their name, address, and must indicate whether or not they have been sworn for the record prior to proceeding with their testimony. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the application pending before the city's board of commissioners this evening. Any members of the board who have disclosures, such as ex parte communications or conflicts of interest, please make your disclosures at the beginning of the hearing. The following is the established procedure which will be followed. First, city staff will present its testimony and evidence regarding the application, and the applicant will have the opportunity to cross-examine city staff and any city witnesses. Then the applicant will have the opportunity to present their witnesses and evidence, and the city will have the opportunity to cross-examine the applicant and any of the applicant's witnesses. Then members of the public opposing and supporting the application will be given the opportunity to provide their testimony and evidence. 
Then the applicant, followed by the city, may present rebuttal testimony and evidence and a closing statement for summary, and the public hearing will be closed for the Board of Commissioners' consideration of this matter. Anybody who wishes to speak, please stand and receive the oath at this time. Is the applicant present? Ah, please stand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that you tell the truth on the matters before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners here this evening? Okay, please remember to state your name, address, and indicate that you've been sworn. Yes. My name is Jonathan Kreidler, address 1272 North Jasmine Avenue, Tarpon Springs. And yes, I've been sworn in. Okay. Um, ex parte communications, anyone? Go ahead, Commissioner Eisenhower. I don't know if this counts, but I did speak with his attorney on the prior case that came before us when they were buying the project, you know, buying the land. <clears throat> and did that converse, will that conversation have any bearing on your decision, or will you be able to make a fair and impartial decision based on the te testimony and evidence here this evening? I, it wouldn't affect me one way or the other. I mean, that was one thing. Speaking of it had nothing to do with this. So, yes, okay. I would be fair and Perfect. impartial. Thank you. Okay, see manager of course. Uh, Renee will give the staff report. Thank you. Uh, this is the application, two applications um, that will be covered by the one uh, resolution. Uh, 2301 is a conditional use application. 2398 is the actual site plan. Uh, the resolution number is 202407. Uh, the location is 38954 US Highway 19 North. Uh, the property contains about 1.3 acres. It is commercial general land use and highway business zoning. The proposed use, under, under which is the part of the conditional use, is for a game room uh, and, uh, more specifically, um, a bingo hall. The resolution also includes a site plan. Um, this is to basically uh, rebuild the site. It's a redevelopment site. Uh, if you recall, there was a, a abandoned Mexican restaurant on the site that sat vacant for quite some time. Um, that essentially has been uh, demolished. And so this, the new plan will include, um, you know, uh, upgrades to parking, landscaping, lighting, um, and stormwater facilities. And basically bring the, the site into current code requirements. So locationally, this is about a thousand feet north of uh, Klosterman Road on US 19, on the west side of US 19. And, um, so I'm sorry, I would, but this is the, just the general context of the zoning. This is all highway business. This is the park. Um, you have mobile home park here. Um, this is unincorporated county property here. Um, and then the commercial general land use is uh, predominantly north and south. So a little closer um, site. Um, you have storage here. Uh, this is a new public storage site here. And then again, this is just that vacant site tucked in the middle. It does share um, stormwater uh, with an adjacent site. This is what was there previously. This is the old restaurant. Again, this is the new storage space you can see. Um, this is the survey from the previous site. And then these, uh, this is the site plan and landscape. We kind of overlaid this. This is the new, um, the, the new building. Uh, footprint so they're expanding the footprint a little bit um, they're providing for landscaping um, and general cl generally cleaning up the site quite a bit just an elevation the interior floor plan with regards to the conditional use um, again this is on US 19 um, the bingo hall really should not have any um, issues with compatibility it's consistent with the conference of plan there are no historical or environmental resources. Uh, the city can uh, provide services. Um, the, uh, so far as property values, the redevelopment and site upgrade should have a positive impact on property values in the area. Um, and no issues with public health, safety, or welfare, and does provide for efficient and orderly development since this is a redevelopment site. Um, site plan criteria, it does com uh, comply with our comprehensive plan and the land development code. There are no issues with concurrency management and it, uh, the, build, the new site will comply with all building codes. 
So the staff recommendation is to approve. We do have a series of conditions. Um, the conditional use um, condition is uh, upon receiving a certificate of occupancy for the building, the applicant shall obtain a local business tax receipt for the new location and keep it active. And then the site plan conditions, um, all public utilities shall be verified on site by the applicant. Site lighting and design standards must be met. Um, a DOT permit is required to ensure that all drainage, sidewalk, siding, curbing, and other DOT right-of-way improvements are protected and restored if damaged. Uh, construction plans must be submitted com uh, in a consistent with the site plan, um, and all requisite fees should be paid. Uh, the site plan will expire one year. Uh, we are using the one-year expiration instead of six months because this site plan was received prior to that going into uh, that going into effect. And um, and then the advisory comment regarding public art. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions that you might have. Um, Ms. Vincent, this is technically a redevelopment, I would suspect. Yes. Um, yeah, the current owners had the other buildings, and and uh, so basically. Everything is going to be somewhat minimal. The uh, utilities are there. Uh, there may be some adjustments to the um, stormwater drainage if there's any change, but it doesn't look like there's going to be a whole lot. No. And uh, the biggest issue is going to be the reconfiguration of the parking, the building, and the landscaping. Is that pretty much it? it, it pretty and as much, far yes, as impact sir. fees, it's probably going to be no. pretty close to a wash Correct. on those. Okay, thank you. Um, any other commissioners? You're pushing their light on. Commissioner Koulianis, go ahead. You were in, uh, oh, sorry. Been, been gone for so long, I forgot how the mechanisms <laughs> work. So uh, I guess this is a question maybe for the applicant, but is uh, how, how many people will this house? I'll defer to the applicant. I'll, I don't have that number ticking in the front of my brain right now. I'd have to look Are it up. Are we there yet to have that come? You want me to? We'll, we'll wait for his turn. Okay, I'll, I'll hold on. I'm sorry, I have more. It's more for Commissioner the Commissioner Cuyas, com, Commissioner Di Donato, anything? Okay. Um, sir, do you, would you, do you have any questions for Ms. Vincent cross-examination or, okay. No. Okay. Ms. Vincent, would you like to enter your st city staff report into evidence? I would uh, just quickly to uh, Commissioner Colianis's question. Um, the full seating capacity is 84, according to the, the staff report. And, and actually, the question was: Is the parking adequate for yes. 84? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, I would just enter enter um, the your turn. Yes. The do you have any uh, presentation or anything that you'd like to add to no. Ms. Okay. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for the applicant? Ms. Vincent, do you have any? Uh, Commissioner Cuyah, did you have anything? No. No. Ms. Vincent, did you have anything for the uh, applicant? Absolutely. Okay, let's go Mayor, to. Gotta, pardon me? He was late. Oh, Commissioner Cuyanis, go ahead. So th this is just uh, informative for my, uh, myself, maybe the uh, residents as well. With Bingo, do you have to affiliate with a nonprofit? Um, yes, we do. All of our air, each night we have an individual nonprofit, which is a charity organization that obtains a license through the um, county, through Pinellas County each year. Okay. And how often would you be um, holding the Bingo? Um, currently, it's five nights a week. We th we may think about trying to expand to six nights a week. Where currently we've been fourteen years, just about a mile and a half north on on US nineteen. And what so, other gaming would be taking place in? Nothing else, just bingo. Just bingo. Okay, I have to let my wife know. <laughs> no problem. I'm so excited about my. <laughs> you better keep Dolly away from me. Um, all right. Anything all right. else on uh, my right side? Okay. Um, Let's go to public comments. Or, uh, you, you may sit if you'd like. Let me ask if there's any public comments on this item. Any public comments? Mr. Jumper, any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to make a public comment on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. 
Okay. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have any closing summation or no, sir. comments? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. I'm going to go to uh, uh, any comments from the commission. Do you have any comments? Okay. Um, we have a motion to approve the application 23-01 and resolution 2024-07. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Vice Mayor Eisner has seconded it. If there's no further comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Di Donato? Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, item uh, number nine, application 23-68, resolution 2024-09. Um, Ms. Kardash, if you could read that by title, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Resolution number 2024-09, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 2368, requesting site plan approval to construct a boat storage facility on 1.04 acres more or less of property located at 332 Ancloat Road, on the north and east sides of Ancloat Road, approximately 0.42 miles west of North Pinellas Avenue and located in the WDI, uh, WDI Waterfront Marine Industry Development District, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. This item is also quasi-judicial. Right, would you like to go ahead and yes. read the instructions and the, the usual? The following matter before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners is quasi-judicial in nature. In a quasi-judicial proceeding, the Board's function is to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances. This is a legal decision regarding the application before the Board. The Board may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. If the evidence demonstrates that the application meets the criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances, mm -hmm. then the Board is required by law to grant the applicant's request. If the evidence demonstrates that the application does not meet the code criteria, then the Board is required to deny the applicant's request. Any and all persons providing testimony at this hearing are required to do so under oath. All persons testifying at this hearing must give their name, address, and must indicate whether or not they have been sworn for the record prior to proceeding with their testimony. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the application pending before the city's Board of Commissioners this evening. Any board members who have disclosures, such as ex parte communications or conflicts of interest, please make your disclosures at the beginning of the hearing. The following is the established procedure which will be followed at this hearing. First, city staff will present its testimony and evidence regarding the application, and the applicant will have the opportunity to ask questions and cross-examine city staff and any city witnesses. Then the applicant will have the opportunity to present their testimony and evidence, and the city will have the opportunity to cross-examine the applicant and any of the applicant's witnesses. Then members of the public opposing and in support of the application will be given the opportunity to present their testimony and evidence. Finally, the applicant and then the city may present any rebuttal evidence and testimony in a closing statement for summary, and the Board of Commissioners will then close the public hearing for consideration of the item. At this time, anyone who's going to speak, please stand and receive the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth on the matters here before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners this evening? When you come up to the, the podium to speak, make sure you state your name, address, and indicate that you've been sworn. Yes, please. Uh, John J. Steckel, uh, MJ Stokes Consulting, uh, address 7702 Cedarhurst Lane, Tampa, Florida, 33625. <coughs> and uh, yes, to the oath. Jason Anderson, 1257 Ancloat Road, Tarpon Springs, Florida, 34689. Yes, I have taken the oath. Okay. Uh, any commissioners have any ex parte communications? Commissioner Vice Mayor Eisner. So this is my question. I didn't speak with the applicant, but I spoke with other people to gain information about the ANCLO project, not their project. Is that something that I would have to declare? 
Not if it's not related to this project. If, it, if the conversations that you had weren't relevant to this specific property and this specific development, then it doesn't fall within the context um, of an ex parte communication for the quasi-judicial. If it's generally about the ANCLOTE and other items that are going on with respect to the ANCLOTE, um, that is not specific to the criteria that you're supposed to examine for this particular item. So it's not specific to this, it's more in general the ANCLOTE uh, road project, not their particular project. Yes, then, then that is fine. That does not require specific disclosure. I'd rather bring it up than not. I, I, you're absolutely right to do Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Anyone else? Okay. Ms. Vincent? Thank you. This is application 23-68 for property at 332 Anclote Road. The resolution number is 2024-09. Uh, the property contains uh, right at one acre. It has a land use of industrial general and zoning of WD2 waterfront marine oh industry development. Goodness. The proposed oh. development of the site is for an outdoor boat and trailer storage and does include um, a covered boat wash down area. So locationally, um, this is the site. Um, it's right in that sharp bend of Anclote Road. Um, we have uh, industrial here, um, un industrial plan development here, vacant land. Um, you have the marina. Uh, you have, um, even though this is zoned multifamily, it's actually single family here, single family here. Um, so you're in presence of a residential and a mix of uses. Historically, um, this site was, this is like Unclaid Isles, this is the site. That, this picture shows um, a use that was put onto the site uh, without um, proper permitting. They were using it basically for fleet storage for trucks. Um, and that kind of spurred um, a code enforcement case. Ultimately, it's kind of led us where we are today. The site, as we speak, is, um, is, is, is vacant. And just another site, uh, aerial pho photograph. This is what, so historically, um, this whole site was previously used uh, for boat storage. It also had some homes that had been converted through the years and they did marine, you know, small boat repair and stuff as well. So this is an old Google Maps photo. This is what was previously on the site. So historically boat storage was used on the site. Um, again, just a, a picture showing, you know, when, uh, when it was being used um, uh, for this fleet storage. Um, some also, some improvements were made to the property, again, without site plan approval uh, with the entrances and um, some uh, material being brought on site and all that's being rectified by our site plan process today. Um, just a survey overlaid over top of the uh, aerial photograph. This will be difficult to see. Um, so essentially, um, just to kind of call attention, there's a there is a wetland area back here, so they will be removing some fill that was placed in that wetland buffer area, and plant and removing invasives and cleaning up that um, with a landscape plan. Uh, essentially, they will have um, 28 uh, spots for open boat and trailer storage on the site. Um, they have to get a right of way use permit from Pinellas County to uh, for these entrances that were improved, uh, they'll have to meet county standards, so that most likely they're gonna have to be paved. Um, the county will also have to weigh in on the turning movements in and out. Right now, this is, will be signed as an exit only. Um, again, we will defer to the county on whether or not they get to keep the, both of those entrances since it's their road. Um, and they'll have to be able to demonstrate you know, adequate uh, throat depth here with the gate, since it will be a gated facility so that you know, a boat and trailer can pull in and not obstruct traffic on, on Alt 19, uh, excuse me, on Anclote Road. They're also including a, um, a boat wash down area. This will uh, be connected to city uh, utilities. It will have an oily water separator. Um, it'll have to be covered so that rainwater cannot intrude into it. So uh, that is amenity that they are providing. That really is the only amenity, amenity that they're providing on site other than just the fact that you can store your boat there. So our review, re, the, excuse me, our review criteria, um, this is uh, generally consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, the application is consistent with the city's land development code. Uh, the adjacent residential is 
already buffered with fencing you know, in the intervening um, Anclote Road. I do want to call attention to this. This is a bit of a change from uh, the original presentation. So you know, a, there's been discussion about a sidewalk. The applicant would prefer not to build a sidewalk. There's no connecting sidewalks on either side of the, ro uh, of the property. Um, our code, you have three options. You can either install a sidewalk, you can pay in lieu, or you can obtain a variance. The applicant, you know, I think I'll let them speak to what their preferred option is. If option two or three, if they want to pay in lieu or if they want to try to obtain a variance, we're gonna coordinate with Pinellas County. It's their road. If they tell us they would prefer that it be paid in lieu because in five, six, seven, however many years it is before the Anclote Road project actually goes to construction, then they can do that. If, if they want to try to get a variance, we will, again, it's our board of adjustments, but we're going to ask the county for, to weigh in on any kind of a variance application. So, the, um, so that's their options. Uh, there are no issues with concurrency management um, or with the city's building codes. So the staff recommendation, um, initial recommendation is approval. Um, subject to the following conditions. Uh, the use is restricted to vessel and vessel storage only, vessel trailer storage only, uh, should not be used for storage of inoperable vehicles, recreational other vehicles, equipment, um, flammable explosive materials or similar items. That should say flammable, not inflammable. Um, a permit for, from Pinellas <coughs> County for the proposed reconfiguration of the driveway connection shall be submitted with the application for a building permit. Um, if the county restricts the site to one driveway connection, the east driveway shall be used and the western driveway shall be closed and remo or removed. The applicant shall pay a lieu, uh, fee in lieu of building the sidewalk per the land development code or apply for a waiver of sidewalk of the sidewalk construction per our land development code again the third option implicit but not stated is or they have to build a sidewalk the site uh, sh shall have prominent posting in view of patrons um, and the public showing a 24-hour contact information uh, construction plans uh, must be consistent with the approved site plan uh, they do and all the fees need to be paid uh, they must meet the minimums of the Land development code, all other jurisdictional permits and approvals. And again, this is another one that will get the benefit of the one year site plan expiration based on when it was submitted um, uh, to the city. Planning and Zoning Board uh, did review this um, at Feb on February 26th, and with the full board uh, present, they did recommend approval uh, unanimously. And at that time, there was no public comment. So, with that, I'll stop and answer any questions you might have. Okay, uh, let's go to commission questions. Are there any questions for the uh, for Ms. Vincent? I, I have a question. Um, uh, again, this is a, a basically a use that's already in place, and and uh, we're just needing to change the site uh, of it. Is that correct? The back in 2011, I'll show you that Google photo. That that use had had been established right. for many many years. And that went that. The property then was cha changed hands. It, everything was cleared off of the property. And then some improvements started taking place. Then the fleet vehicle showed up. None of that was taking place with any, any approval by the city. So that did prompt us to get involved. They are now coming in with a full site plan to, um, uh, to, to get an approval for the layout and specifically for the boat storage which is a the fleet the fleet vehicle i know it sounds kind of odd but this is wd2 which is waterfront marine industry boat storage is permitted fleet vehicles are not so it, it is a, it's a minor nuance but we you know we have called out in our conference of plan certain areas that are specific for waterfront related and what in in industrial uses and this is one of them so that use does comport. So uh, the um I, I know way back uh with what's there right now is certainly a a, 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 an improvement. I, yes. On the other hand, I, I do have the uh, um, whatever on the site plan has to be maintained. Is that correct? So basically, the screen on the six foot high, which I believe is existing, the six foot high fence is existing, and the screen is there already. Uh, but the screen has to be maintained. Um, um, if you want to make that explicit, I would add that to the resolution as a, as a condition uh, yeah. because I don't think it's absolutely required. Would, at least be, along the front. Well, so. I think it's actually part of, 
you know. It's on the site plan that's, now. That's what I was going to say is if it's in the site it's plan, the site it's probably going to be covered because of the language that you have okay. and the conditions that, makes that sense. say that the development has to be consistent yes. with that. The um, other part, do we have any ability to um, require, uh, I, I know it'll be boats on trailers, for example. Would, do we have the ability to ask uh, or to uh, require that the taller boats that are on trailers be placed towards the back of the property to keep them away from the front of the property from an eyesight? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think I would ask the, the applicant that. I mean, actually, the way the site lays out, it's, um, this is hard to see. But the parking stops really are along the back of the property, um, so I think functionally that's how it's going to how it's going to operate anyway. But with if, the larger boats towards the rear, I think the, I think most of the boats are going to. I'm going to I'm going to defer to the we'll, applicant we'll, about that. I'll but, ask them that question. Yeah. Okay, um, that that's all I have. Okay. Um, I understand the rest. Uh, are there any other commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Eisner? <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I know we got a um, email. Would you be willing to, uh, would you please make your comments regarding the responses that you provided to us as far as um, notification? Who did? Oh, so this is a permitted use by right in the zoning district. So there is no public notice for, for these types of applications. Um, let me see if I can pull up the email and I'll go through the rest of them. Yeah, there were only like, I think, five or six, but right. mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that the residents know that those, all those requests or questions were responded to properly. Uh, let's see. Um, so again, re regarding the sidewalk issue, I explained that same thing, that they have three options, build it, pay in lieu, or get a variance. Um, and that we would defer to Pinellas County's input when that decision is being made. Um, the site plan indicates parking for 28 boats and trailers. Um, there was a question about the entrances. Um, we are requiring that the applicant obtain a right-of-way use permit for both entrances. It is possible that the county might require removal of one. Again, it's their road. We will defer to them. Um, and the proposed access will also be reviewed by Pinellas County to meet the requirements for placement of gates, keypads, to ensure stacking space available. On the site plan, they've already showed the, the fencing and the gate being pulled back, and they're indicating a throat depth, I think, of at least 50 feet to, so to accommodate a, you know, a vehicle and a boat being towed right, in. Right, so they're not out in the middle of the street. Correct, yes. correct. Um, and then the traffic generation, you know, they're indicating less than 20 trips per day, you know, going in and out of the site, we indicate, uh, you know, based on ITE, you know, less than nine peak hour trips. In this instance, a peak hour trip is probably going to be on Saturday morning or Sunday morning, so it won't be during rush hour times for, for normal nine to five traffic. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, any, anyone else? Any of the commissioners' questions for Ms. Vincent? Um, okay. Uh, any questions from the applicant for Ms. Vincent? Just questions. If you don't have any, you don't have no, to we're, ask we're, we're good. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Vincent, would you <clears throat> like to have your staff report entered into the record? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, it's your turn now. Do you have anything that you'd like to offer? Yeah, I, I think, you know, given some of the, um, you know, let's just say up in the air items as far as the sidewalk and the county permitting, so we just give some updates. Um, we are working with the county right now. Um, <clears throat> The, the fence is 50 feet, uh, slightly, high, slightly longer than 50 feet as required by the county. That's an adjustment we made when permitting with them. Um, <clears throat> the driveway aprons are going to be concrete. That's required by the county, alternative to the, to the crushed concrete. Um, and, and as mentioned and discussed, um, right now we are looking <clears throat> at uh, ultimately the waiver for the sidewalks because of the oncoming project. We're in discussions with the county on that. I'm sure on their end, they're gonna look at the alternatives. Um, but of course, per the conditions, you know, we would look at a fee in lieu or to build as well. Um, it's just, it's a very, a very tight corridor, um, which also makes it very difficult to build without impacting drainage impacts and otherwise. 
So um, just thought that that would be just important to give that update, but that's, that's all. That's it, okay. Um, any questions for the applicant? Ms. Vincent, any follow-up? No. Okay, let's go to public comments. Are there any public comments concerning this project? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to make a public comment on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, we, do have, we do have one to read. Maybe. No, I know. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Jacobs. Um, hold on. Before you read that, um, I do want the commission to understand that that is not a statement under oath. So it cannot be considered as evidence. Okay. This, I, this email. The, the email cannot okay. be considered as evidence. Go ahead, Ms. Jacobs. This is from Mary Ann Ferretti. Number one, the Anklet Isle subdivision was not given notice of the potential change in zoning and property usage at 332 Anklet Road. Number two, the Anklet Isle subdivision, 19 houses, shares the intersection of Marina Drive and Anklet Road with three, 332 Anklet Road. This is a problematic intersection in that there is a dramatic left turn to get into, Ankl into Marina Drive as you are traveling west on Anklote Road. On a daily basis, there are near misses with traffic traveling east on Anklote Road. I'm quite concerned with how the boat storage property will impact this area and would like answers to the following. One, the number of boats that will be stored to the number, location, and orientation of potential entrances to the property, three, the type of access to the property, physical keys, electronic keypad, length of driveway area, etc. cetera. Four, the amount of traffic that could be generated as owners try to access the property and potentially pause at security access points. Three, it appears that yet another sidewalk variance may be requested for this property based upon a potential future project to improve the Anklote Road. The Anklote Road project was used by the Tarpon Key developers and the city in February of 2013 to forego the need for sidewalks along Anklote Road. So here we are 11 years later still deferring to a project that is potentially five to seven years out and according to the latest update has questionable funding. That being said, the city should not grant, grant variances based upon a project that may or may not happen. Okay, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Eisner, you have your light on. Do you have anything? Yes, I do. Uh, wait, for who or what? Say again? We haven't, um, uh, you mean for commission comments? Yes. Okay, I wanna go back. I've got two questions that I forgot to ask, so I know that we have to kind of go back to the beginning. Ms. Vincent, do you have anything new that you wish to add to your original presentation? No. Okay, applicants. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, as far as this fee goes for uh, the sidewalk, if the county gives the waiver, do we still get the uh, fee for the uh, paying into our fund? If the, if, they, if the county says that they will accept a pay in lieu, my understanding is what we have done is that if it's their road, they actually get the payment, not they get, us. They get the money, so Correct. it's not like the tree thing that we right. had a long time ago. Right. Okay, that's a question for you. Applicants, do you have anything new that you would, I have a question for you, but do you have anything new that you'd like to offer from what you had previously done? I, I think what I'd like to add to is just based on uh, the email, which I believe staff has, uh, the responses were to that email, I believe. Um, but part of our coordination and permitting with the county for our right of way, requires site distance calculations and showing on the plan. So the most recent submittal we provided to them is from the westerly most access point. The site distance to the right, which is the concern from the email, I believe, uh, is 180 feet, which actually just passes the eastbound travel lane. Uh, so we, we actually were very close to beating that, and that's based on a 35 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, the curve is a recommended speed of 10, understood. <laughs> very rare that people drive 10, but also understood, very rare somebody's driving 35 or 40. 
Um, so that is one of the main items we are working with them on, like I said before, with the sidewalk and the driveway. Um, and again, I, I think I just, for the record, want to state that um, the sidewalk, if we do seek the waiver, that, that isn't really part of this approval, I don't believe. We would have to seek that under the Board of Adjustments. So depending on how permitting with the county goes, we may go a different direction. Um, you know, we're not going to go seek that waiver if the county staff says, you know, we're not letting that happen. So okay. just wanted that to be on the record. Okay, I have a question for you concerning the taller boats. Uh, would you agree to a note on your site plan to uh, uh, store the taller boats to the rear of the property, recognizing that if, if you need some spots up front, you, 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 you don't have a choice. But the idea is to keep the visibility down from residents coming onto the road and those traveling around. Is that on the west end? It, it's yeah, a, the it's west. a request. You can say no, you can say yes. I don't think it's going to change the outcome of your well, the vote. It's back seven or eight feet from the west end already, you know. Well, I think what he's talking about is the, uh, the height that's going to clear the six foot. Um, oh. So I, I think we can I, talk I guess about adding a note, but I think we would want a threshold height, not just. Just to clarify, there's a big difference between a small bow rider and a Grady White oh, with no, a cutty understand. cabin and, <laughs> and a, a tower. That, that's what I'm getting at. I mean, if that's your decision. Thank you. Uh, to move it forward, yes. I mean, if that's what it's needed to move this project forward, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll into. Ms. Vincent, we can. Okay. Sure. Ms. Kardash, that. Do we did need... you have something you wanted to ask too? Can we add that in as a condition or? Pardon me? Can we add that in as a condition? That's, it would, if it's a note on the site plan, that would make it a requirement. Is that correct, Ms. Kardash? I'm not sure how to implement something like that. So that is not technically, I think, a site plan item because what you're talking about is um, Interpretation. The, basically the manner in which they're conducting the business. Um, it would be for this one because, you know, the boats are not permanent. They're not permanently affixed there the way that the fence is that we had discussed. Um, so that makes it a little bit different. Um, this one, in order to make it enforceable, you would have to craft it as a condition um, and you would have to put some sort of threshold um, to make it enforceable so it's clear. So on the, uh, it would be included in the resolution? Correct. Okay. Would that be acceptable to you to include that in the resolution? I, I would say within reason. <laughs> yeah. If the height is within reason. I mean, I think we'd want to verify that prior to agreeing. I, I'm not asking to conceal them. I'm just asking to, you know, one, it's a big difference when you've got three quarters of the bow sticking above the fence. Sure. And, and the tower goes above that. And you may even have the bow rider just barely sticking up. That's all I'm asking for. There is a big difference in that. Okay. Yes. I more, think the more. answer is yes Very to good. that. Yes. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant? I'm going to turn your light off. Um, okay. Let's go back to public comments. Very, thank you. Let's go back to public comments. Public comments. Um, Peter, I, I know I was going to say I haven't been sworn okay. in. Peter Lux, 514 Ashland Avenue. I do swear to affirm to speak the truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you, sir. Overreach. Overreach. When you looked at the pictures there, what's across the street from it? The marina. What's that area? Water district. De water development, what's the exact words? Water development district. <laughs> That's part of your visual aspect of a water development district. So if people are gonna move into those townhouses that were linger longer or into the enclote area that's, you know, the nice big fancy houses down there, <laughs> you gotta expect it. So. If he's all full and a big boat comes in, and all these spaces up by the front or somewhere closer, what's he going to do? Say, oh, I can't take your boat because the city won't let me put you up front? Come on. Come on. These guys are making good effort to redevelop a site 
that had this usage before, even though it may not have been technically legal or stuff, but they're clearing it up. Just it's overreach. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, let me go back to you. If anyone online would like to make a public comment on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and, and close the public hearing. Um, let me just say the, um, the, the condition that I'd asked for, I've, <laughs> I've been going down. I know exactly what that area is down there. I've lived through that area. I've lived through the storage there. I've lived through the boats that were there. Let me tell you something. Right now, without this site plan, it's a 1,000% improvement over what was there. And, and one of the big reasons is that sometimes boats on trailers become an eyesore, especially with tarps that get torn and start blowing in the wind and all kinds of things that I don't care what you describe it. It's not a boat to me. It's just an ugly sight. So that's the reason why I asked for that, to minimize that. If it's not feasible, that I, I don't think code enforcement is going to go out there and and start um, uh, uh, asking for something unreasonable. So that's my rationale behind that. Um, but on the other hand, let me just ask before I go any further, um, as far as the commission goes, is if there's any objection to this, that would, you know, just let me know so we don't add it uh, during the motion. Because if, if, if there's, there's no objection, it would be an added uh, to the, uh, uh, prove the resolution with the addition of the, uh, condition on the uh, taller boats being located to the back of the uh, to the property. Um, Commissioner or Vice Mayor Eisner, you've got your light on or? I okay. do. So I don't know how you can make this request. And that's my big question. I believe me, I understand you're wanting it to look appropriate. I'm also listening to what uh, Mr. Delacus said. I don't know how you enforce it. I don't know whether, you know, is the T-top sticking out? Is that where we draw the line? You know what I mean? I, so I don't know how we can put restrictions on something. And then even if it were to proceed to where code enforcement comes and they see this, whatever boat, let's say it breaks the rules that we've put out and then they just wheel it and move it to the other side and it's all said and done. So. I don't know whether that is going to be a necessary thing. As you said, I remember what it also looked like before. I know what it looks like now um, without the boats in it. But um, I just don't know how to enforce that. So that would be my, like, do we make it, if the fence is six feet, do we make it two feet over? Is T-tops included? Um, is outriggers included? You know, <laughs> where do we, it's that's... Just this is just why. the taller boats to the rear of the property. That's all. That's the only thing that would be on there. I'm not getting into size or heights or anything like that. I just don't know how to enforce what, what's a taller boat. A boat that's taller than the one that's in front of it. I, okay. If, I, I mean, I'm not from, I'm, it's a request. I'm not, <laughs> you're asking me questions. It's not an issue for code enforcement. I'm sure that they're very responsible owners. If you know, they're going to do what they can to abide by whatever our discussion is. If, if this is something that the commission doesn't want to do, that's okay with me. Yeah. I just made that request. I know the residents out there and I know how they feel about this. So, um, <sighs> Commissioner Quillianis, you have your light on. Yeah. Um, the, um, like the city attorney said, if we're going to put a condition and we have to be specific about what that condition is. So I don't know that we're prepared right now to say two feet, three feet, and what portion of the structure of the, the, the vessel, you know, constitutes um, the measurement criteria. So I understand where you're coming from, and I, I I understand. That's okay. It. No, I understand it, and I think it's a, a, a request. I don't know, can we, uh, Ms. Kardashian, can we put requests in a motion that have no specificity? 
Right. So in order to make it an enforceable part of the condition, you do have to be, it does have to be specific enough to enforce, and it does have to be enforceable by the code enforcement department. Um, the use at issue is not a conditional use of this property. The testimony um, and your code provides that it is a permitted use of this property. Um, so for permitted uses, they're already deemed to be compatible with the surrounding area. Um, so you really can't say that storage of boats is not a compatible use when it's deemed, or that is not a compatible use when it's already deemed by the code to be a permitted use or a use allowed by right. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm not willing to make an issue over it. I'm willing to withdraw my request as well. That's not a big deal. Commissioner Cuyas. I think what you're, you're asking for is reasonable. You don't want uh, towering figures or close to the sidewalk or close to the road that's very narrow and uh, you aren't willing to even have a sidewalk installed. So uh, to request that on the north side of the property is um, it's not too much of a request that you're asking for. Uh, my concern is the sidewalk. And do we have any, and please go ahead and, and tell us, do we have any authority of saying we want you to install a sidewalk? We have a procedure in our land development code that we have to follow. And so they either, they, they really do have kind of three choices at this point. They can provide the sidewalk, but they also have in our code in the sidewalk section, a process to request a waiver or excuse me, a pay in lieu, which um, again, because it's a county road, we're gonna defer to the county as to whether or not they would accept pay in lieu or if they want the sidewalk. And then the third option is an absolute variance, which gets them out of even paying anything, building or paying. And so, you know, I, I don't know, I'll defer to the attorney as to whether or not we can, you know, mandate something or take away an right. option. Yeah, um, the way that your code is written, it does give them the option to do it. So they have the option and the criteria to meet each one of those options. So whether they go for the variance, whether they opt to pay in lieu, um, your code was specifically drafted to give them the option of which direction to take it. Okay, do we have the ability to, when, when they're reaching out to the county, to have in a letter maybe that the Board of Commissioners prefer a sidewalk? What, what um, I don't, do they, is that part of a public hearing process? For no, Pinellas? it'll be an administrative process. It's just an administrative them. process. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you give me direction to provide to Pinellas County, that's what I'm going to do. But ultimately, you know, I was looking to, because it is the county's road, you know, to defer to their process, they know better internally what is really gonna happen with Anclote Road, whether, you know, regardless of where it appears in their five-year CIP and it's in there, you know, the, the county's pretty tough on sidewalks. They want them, you know, I would, I would prefer to defer to the county on this particular issue as to whether or not that is acceptable to not build and pay in, or, and pay in lieu. So that, that's... You can, here's what I will tell you, is that you can express your preference, but I'm not sure that um, it will sway them necessarily one way or the other, because I don't think they're obligated by law to consider it. Okay. So that, that's my overall questions, and I'll just have comments for the end. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to add that to the uh, resolution to send a letter to the county? Sure. I mean, I, you know, this project that we keep talking about, you know, it's been talked about for decades around that that area, that industrial plan, and um, we know that area, we know that road, yeah. we know that 90 degree an angle when you're turning and you're either coming back to alternate 19 or you're gonna bend that sharp corner. To, to think that there shouldn't be a sidewalk, you know, I, I don't need the weight on the county to tell me that, so I would like a, a sidewalk there. And as you know, that property was used for quite some time in a way it wasn't supposed to. So um, I'd like to see a sidewalk and that's for safety in that area. And I'd rather get ahead of whatever Pinellas County's plans are as opposed to, and that area floods anyway. So the runoff or the stormwater stuff, uh, it's not gonna make that much of an impact with that sidewalk when there's already an issue there that we're all aware of. So those are my thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner DiDonato, do you have anything? 
covered by, I think it's been covered reasonably well. I, I, what puzzles me is I've heard this, our city attorney twice say that perhaps we don't have the legal ability to tell them how to actually, as long as they're in the confines of the conditional use, we don't have that authority to tell them. Okay. I mean, I certainly, I, I, think, I think you've got what you asked for. They, they committed to try and do it. Uh, as far as the sidewalk is concerned, there, there's not, I mean, if, they're, if the county's coming in in five years or whenever they get here, I know, for, for example, Mears, I'll give you that project, for example, we had to, we actually solicit the county to move that item forward because uh, it was, it was going to take even longer and we had so many complaints in the city. So we were able to actually negotiate with the county to move that process ahead in their scope. But w with it up, uh, unknown, basically, they said five years, but it could be longer than that. We all know that. Uh, I don't know that, I mean, I like sidewalks too. I, and I, I, I think, but a sidewalk to nowhere or, or sidewalk that's by itself and that may get t torn up in five to 10 years doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, I, that's, that's my only thought. Yeah, I agree with that. The one question I was going to ask to forward uh, Pinellas was to uh, redesign when they get to that point, redesign that entire dog leg going to the right and the entrance into Anclote Isles. Uh, that was approved a very long time ago and and it's been marginal. I think we're just lucky there hasn't been any uh, any deaths on that intersection. And if that, if that happens, whatever sidewalk does get put in will be torn up as well. Okay. So I don't, I mean, I will make one more statement. Yeah, that sidewalk won't lead anywhere, but it's going to lead people away from the road towards a very sharp corner that people are familiar with taking sharp. So we want people as far away from the road as possible. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll tell you what, are there any other comments? I need to make a comment, yes. You want to make a comment? Yes. Go ahead. So I heard a lot of uh, questions, and I also agree with Commissioner DiDonato's comments about, I love sidewalks too, but... I'm not in agreement to putting a sidewalk, even though it's not our decision to do, uh, where it leads to nowhere, because you're just going to have to cross the street to the other side that has no sidewalks either. But uh, prior to this, I did make a call. You know, we do, I do sit on forward Pinellas, and I did call with Blanton, and I asked for his clarification just to give a clarification to the residents and to this board. So if you don't mind, um, I said to him that, you know, I wanted to know about a resident that claimed that this project would take five years or more and that there was no money to do it. His comeback was, that's what we will determine as a board when it gets done and how it gets done. So he wrote, Commissioner, this email seems to confirm that your res, because he got a, a, uh, a letter, an email, it says the project consists of both roadway and drainage impro improvements described briefly as below. Roadway, um, our preliminary engineering report will present the results of two basic alternatives to improve that roadway. It's for a bicycle and pedestrian safety. One alternative will construct an off-road 10 foot dash 12 foot multi-use path for bicyclists and pe pedestrians and the second alternative will provide for a four-foot bike lane adjacent to the roadway with five-foot sidewalks for pedestrians. Both alternatives will widen the existing roadway to 11-foot lanes. Drainage. The project will also address current flooding issues and provide detention ponds and new outfall to the river to help mitigate the majority of the flooding. The locations and the size of the proposed ponds and location of the new outfall will be determined in the PD and E and design phases of the project. He said, for any additional information or if there's any other questions, feel free to contact me. He also said, in addition, we have a stag grant from the EPA for this project for $3 million. Accordingly, after the per phase of the project is finished, I will be preparing a scope and eventually an RFP for a consultant to conduct the assessment and prepare a new preliminary engineering report. So the bottom line is we do have some money for it. He is predicting it could be five years out, seven years out. Um, but this, we, we've had really no voice on forward Pinellas. We do now. And as I said to the city manager earlier today, 
I'm not going to let them sleep without knowing that this project is on Tarpon Springs tip okay. of our tongue. So, and I think you know that as well. Yeah. So, um, it, it gives you an idea. It's going to be made safe, but right now, until inflation, you know, tones down a little bit or things change, um, it's going to be what it's going to be. So. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So for me, let me withdraw my request as far as the the boats and stuff like that, and um, just rely on the good nature of the owners to take that at heart. And if you do, thank you very much. And if you don't, that's okay too. But at least we we uh, I'm just wanted to make that request. Um, is there if there's no further comments, I'd like to have a motion on the resolution, the application, and on the resolution with any condition that you may wish to add to that. And if there's no condition, just straightforward application and uh, motion on the uh, resolution. I would do a motion, but I don't, I would only do the condition that has been given to us through planning and zoning and the planning and zoning board. Second. Is that a motion? Yeah, that's. Second. Okay. All right. If there's no further comments, roll call. Commissioner Di Donato? Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Let's take, it's 8.30. Let's take a break and we'll reconvene at 8.40. <coughs> I hate counting.
going to reconvene at um, 8.40 p.m. And next item is item 10, application 23122 and 23-123, uh, resolution 2024-06. Um, Ms. Kardash, if you could read the resolution by title, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Mayor. A resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 23-122, requesting conditional use approval, and application 23-123, requesting site plan approval to allow for a seasonal short-term rental facility, RV park, with 16 spaces, lodging units, and including parking, landscaping, and other site improvements on property, located at 512, 514, 515, 516, 520 Island Drive and 520 Hill Street in the SDC Marine Industrial Commercial Transect Zone of the Sponge Docks and CRA Special Area Plan, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. Okay, would you like to yes. continue? This item is also quasi-judicial, and the fall and will the, this matter will be before the board of commissioners in a quasi-judicial nature. In a quasi-judicial proceeding, the board's function is to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances. This is a legal decision regarding the application before the board. The board may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. If the evidence demonstrates that the application meets the criteria contained in the code of ordinances, then the board is required by law to grant the applicant's request. If the evidence demonstrates that the application does not meet the code criteria, then the board is required to deny the applicant's request. Any and all persons providing testimony at this hearing are required to do so under oath. All persons testifying at this hearing must give their name, address, and must indicate whether or not they have been sworn for the record prior to proceeding with their testimony. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the application pending before the Board of Commissioners this evening. Any board members who have disclosures such as ex parte communications or conflicts of interest, please make your disclosures at the beginning of the hearing. The following is the established procedure which will be followed at this quasi-judicial hearing. City staff will present its testimony and evidence regarding the application first. The applicant will then have the opportunity to ask questions and cross-examine the city staff and any city witnesses. The applicant will then have the opportunity to present their witnesses and evidence, and the city will have the opportunity to cross-examine the applicant and any of the applicant's witnesses. Then members of the public opposing and in support of the application will be given the opportunity to provide their testimony and evidence. Finally, the applicant and then the city may provide any rebuttal testimony and evidence in a closing statement for summary. Then this, the board will close the public hearing for consideration. At this time, anyone who is going to be provi providing testimony, please stand to receive the oath. Okay. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners here this evening? I do. Please remember to state your name, address, and indicate that you've been sworn when you approach the podium to speak. Okay, ex parte communications. Uh, let me start. I did have a conversation with the city manager and asked them to do a uh, traffic analysis on the uh, traffic circle uh, with regard to uh, RVs uh, being able to negotiate that, that circle. Um, and is that going to be entered as evidence this evening? The traffic, traffic study or has that not it, been completed? Uh, it was it's already part, in evidence. It is part of that uh, is part record. Of the uh, this, uh, Ms. Vincent followed up and actually made that part of the backup and her report. And you will be able to independently then consider the evidence as it is presented in the hearing this yes. evening? Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Koulianis. Um, I had the pleasure of doing some financial work for Mr. Spaeth. It's, it's been probably more than a decade. Um, so I did have uh, a client relationship with him at one point. The um, and I don't think any either of, the, of these items constitute a conflict, but I'll disclose them anyways. Um, my wife uh, owns property on Athens Street 
in Greektown, of which uh, most likely we will be building a home. So I'll be living in that neighborhood and anything that goes on there would have some effect on my quality of life. So um, those are my disclosures. Okay, and um, with respect to the uh, representation of the applicant, did it concern this project? Mm -hmm. No. And will it in any way uh, in your to yours or your family's or your business's um, private uh, financial benefit or detriment with respect to the decision that you make here today? I do not believe so. And uh, outside of just your general knowledge of the area, is there any reason why that general knowledge would prohibit you from making an independent decision based on the evidence here this evening? It would not. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a clarification uh, on the residency uh, issue. Is that really a, an issue? It is not. Um, it doesn't certainly does not hurt to disclose it, disclose it, um, but it doesn't constitute either a conflict. It just is a reflection of your general knowledge of the area where the application is being okay. sought. Because yeah, I live there too, but I don't, you know, so. Um, anyone else? Okay, City Manager, of course, Ms. Vincent. Ms. Vincent, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, this is application, two applications under one resolution. 23-122 is a conditional use and 23-123 is the associated site plan. Resolution numbers 2024-06. Uh, the property location is a series of addresses, 512, 514, 515, 516, 520 Island Drive and 520 Hill Street. Property contains approximately 1.3 acres. Um, it is in the commercial redevelopment district, uh, land use wise, which is under the in part of the Sponge Docks Character District, um, and the zoning is SDC, which is Marine Industrial Commercial. Uh, the proposed use of the property is a seasonal slash short term rental facility in the form of an RV park. Uh, the proposal is for 16 RV parking pads um, and and lodging units. So each each. Each RV constitutes a lodging unit. Um, parking and drop-off area, landscaping, fencing, and other site improvements are proposed. Um, the operation will be managed and overseen by the existing Turtle Cove Marina offices. Um, the Turtle Cove Gen general manager will handle any guest issues and staff will assist uh, guests with check-in and check-out. Um, the applicant's representative uh, is uh, Hush Gahovi with Northside Engineering, and the uh, owner is s and Tarpon Enterprises. These are the same individuals that um, own and operate Turtle Cove Marina. So just a little bit of location and context. So the properties in question are outlined in, in yellow here. So this is Island Drive. So we have the traffic circle here, um, Island Drive, Roosevelt. And uh, so there's two, two large parcels, one on directly on the water and then one on the other side of Island Drive adjacent to the existing clubhouse, uh, which uh, was part of the Turtle Cove Marina development. And generally, again, just looking at the future land use uh, designations in the area, the CRD is the Sponge Docks Special Area Plan. Um, and, and downtown uh, special area plan, which is this kind of light teal color. Um, Roosevelt Boulevard is kind of the dividing line or the, the line where um, Greek Town begins, or the, excuse me, the Greek Town Historic uh, and Cultural Resources District uh, is on the other side of Roosevelt Boulevard. So a close up of the site, this is the Turtle Cove Clubhouse and parking lot. Um, and then so this is the area where the parking pads would be proposed. There is a uh, buildings here that would be removed. So the site plan, uh, you have a, so that just a little overview, they actually intend to raise the road profile here because um, they will have to bring you know, the elevation up of the RV pads um, just to deal with you know, high water issues from, uh, from, from tides. Um, uh, so that's proposed. There's a pull off here um, for the routing perspective. The, um, the, app, the, the RVs would arrive uh, via, the, via the sponge docks and the applicant will do a better job of explaining this, but they would route around and come in this way into Island Drive. They would drop off here if necessary um, to uh, speak with staff and, and get situated and, and enter into the to the project. So these are the parking pads, the rest is green space around them. Um, 
again, parking pads here. And then this is kind of like extended pavement area for turning radiuses and things of that nature. Um, they do propose to put exterior landscaping in um, within the smart code. The only landscaping that's really required is along frontages, so they're certainly meeting that. And then providing additional landscaping on the buffer and um, along the, the water. Um, site circulation, again, I'll let the applicant uh, address this a little more, but they do have appropriate turning radiuses um, for the size of the RVs. So they've ran those turning radiuses and they're demonstrated here to, for functionality. So under the smart code, you can request um, warrants if they are justified. They are requesting two warrants. Um, the first is uh, the required lodging for a lot spaces for a lodging a unit would be 16. Um, they are proposing 13 parking spaces. Not every vehicle or every RV will have a, you know, be towing a vehicle um, based on uh, use uh, and similar uses that have been examined. They are proposing the nine of the the nine of the pads would have, um, excuse, eight of these would have extended parking so they can actually accommodate the RV and the car on site. And then they will dedicate additional five spots um, in the existing Turtle Cove parking lot uh, for those additional, additional parking spaces for, to accommodate the RV that may be towing, some, towing a vehicle that would not be able to park one on a parking pad. Um, importantly, that's the dedicated parking spots. If you look at the entire site plan and required parking, um, they actually still have excess parking available. It's just not dedicated specifically for the RVs. So, um, so it's really a reduction they're requesting of three required parking spots. Um, the smart code also requires what's called a street screen, which would normally be a wall. Um, unless a hedge or fence row is approved by warrant, which is what they're asking for to keep it more open, keep it a little more green. So they would have a three foot wrought iron fence with Indian hawthorn hedge row um, and longleaf pines um, along these frontages. So it helps keep things open um, along the water. So some context and what went into, and I wanna stop a little bit and kind of just talk about the whole conditional use itself. Um, in, within the smart code, you will not find a listing a, you know, anywhere that says RV park. Um, you do have a, a, a grouping for transient accommodations um, that includes hotels, motels, um, seasonal short-term rentals. So we took the same approach that we did with, with the, if you recall, we did a conditional use for the kayak facility um, across from the old Pappas restaurant. Um, again, commercial recreation is not called out anywhere in the smart code either. So we took the approach of the you know, seasonal and short-term rental itself is called out as a use, as a conditional use, and you know, in that character district and in, those, in, in that transit zone. So to give it a process and a fair hearing, we took the conditional use approach just like we did with the kayak facility as well as with um, Stumpy's, the, the, act, the hatchet throwing place. Again, not anything that's really called out. So in order to give it a process and not just be an administrative, no, you can't do that. This is the, the, what we were following previous practice and at least allowing it to come forward as for conditional use of, um, consideration. So along with that, you know, in the context, it is a mixed use area. <coughs> Uh, so you have a mix of retails, you know, restaurants, marine related uses, parking um, and residential in the area. Um, the, it is buffered from nearby residential uses by the existing Turtle Cove Clubhouse and the marina and with the tourist areas and with the sponge docks. So, it, you know, it does lend itself to, you know, park and, you know, visit, you know, the area in general. Um, trip generation is uh, the project would generate very few peak hour trips, less than one per occupied, we said campsite, that's the, what, the way that they use the term in the ITE, um, and the location minimizes the need for guests to use a personal vehicle. Um, and then, you know, RVs are able to navigate, you know, in and out of the proposed project site. Um, regarding the, the navigation, uh, as the mayor mentioned, we did perform a couple of different sets of 
we had our engineers of record do this of looking at the, the turning radiuses on the circle at, on the roundabout itself. Those are provided, um, I emailed them to you and they're also provided in the agenda backup um, through the portal. Um, you can take those kind of at face value, you know, a typical 45 foot RV has, you know, can clear these, make, make the turns necessary to access the site. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. And I'm sure the applicant will talk a little more about that. And again, some of the specialized equipment that are on newer RVs, which is what he's going to be limiting to. Um, hang on one second. I need to get my screen back up. out on me. Um, he can speak more to those turning, you know, how those work and the prevalence of them in the industry. So as I said, this is in the Sponge Docks Character District, which is primarily, con you know, comprised of tourist oriented com commercial businesses, restaurants, um, as well as water industrial uh, waterfront uses. There is a specific objective in the, in the special area plan specific to that, to the Sponge Docks to provide tourist accommodation options, such as hotels, motels, inns, and other short stay lodging within walking distance of the tourist destinations of the sponge docks. So we took that into consideration as looking at this from a big picture perspective. Um, so, and again, it's not a traditional lodging facility, but it does provide that short stay accommodation. So it would be subject to our six week minimum, uh, minimum or maximum stay. Um, and then that is set up as an enforceable condition. So intent being, we don't want this to turn into a place where people just live full time. It is for tourist accommodations. You come in, you're there for a few days, and then you go on to your next location. Um, and then regarding future development, again, it doesn't, it's a good use for the property in that it, you know, if somebody wants to redevelop it in the future, you're not having to undo a lot of a lot of infrastructure um, in, in, in buildings. So some example photos provided by the applicant. This is from um, another similar uh, uh, park. I think it's you know, further south in Florida, but it gives you the flavor of what the intent is. So under the conditional use review criteria, um, it does, um, the project does conform with the standards of the SMART code, at least from a you know, physical perspective, um, whether or not the use is you know, ultimately appropriate as a conditional use, that's gonna be part of the discussion probably t this evening. Um, the, we do think that based on the evidence that the project is compatible with the mixed use area and supports the overall intent of the character district and provides that short stay accommodations um, that are called out as an objective. Um, uh, we do not think that it's, uh, we do believe that it's consistent with this comprehensive plan and the special area plan. Um, regarding uh, any impacts to environmental or historical resources, the, the project is, it's not an environmentally sensitive site. Um, the, uh, they will be providing for stormwater drainage um, that doesn't exist now um, in improving uh, that situation. Um, it is across Roosevelt Boulevard from the Greektown National uh, Register Historic District. Um, so we recognize that, but it is not within the district. Um, and we, you know, the general area is, is mixed use and the site is buffered from nearby residential. So we don't really think that it will adversely affect property values. Um, we have the ability to, to serve this with public facilities. Um, the, the, the each, Pad will have water and sewer hookups as well as electric, um, and uh, so the the city has evaluated that and can provide facilities and accommodate that. Um, it's a it's a underdeveloped you know utilized underutilized site within the area. Um, again, it's it's kind of a a holding type of use until maybe a more permanent development would occur. Um, and then we do not think that this would adversely impact general health, safety, and welfare. Regarding the site plan, again, we don't think there's any issues with the <coughs> comprehensive plan. Um, the applicant, application is found to be compliant with the land development code. We do have those two uh, warrants that are being requested. Um, no issues with concurrency management or building codes. 
So the staff recommended um, the con initial recommendation prior to going to the planning and zoning board was to recommend approval uh, with uh, the following conditions. The total number of RV and parking pads and lot shall be limited to 16. Under the site plan, um, construction plans must be consistent with the approved site plan. Uh, expiration of six months. Um, it is under our new um, uh, timeline for expiration unless a construction permit is obtained. Um, and then at the Planning and Zoning Board in February, they did review this and recommended approval uh, by a 7-0 vote, um, including the warrant request with some additional conditions. Uh, the um, the first on the conditional use, and this is by recommendation of the city attorney, the rental term agreement shall be for six weeks or less in compliance with the definition of seasonal short-term rental in section 6.1 of the SMART code. And then the sec another condition was added at the, uh, under the site plan, at the time of the building permit application, off-sites parking and RV park must be titled in the same name, if not a parking agreement must be recorded with Pinellas County Clerk. So if you need more clarification on, especially number three of the site plan, I'll defer to the city attorney on that. Uh, we did have three people speak on this item. Uh, concerns expressed were the traffic impacts in the surrounding area, flooding concerns, the use of underground vaults, and impacts of the RVs um, in Greek Town. Oops, sorry. So uh, with that, um, I will stop and answer questions. I may candidly defer them to the applicant because he's gonna be better versed to answer some of your questions, I feel like, but let's go. <laughs> I understand. Um, let me, I've got three questions uh, for you. One, um, in the uh, application packet, there was some um, uh, technical information provided. For example, the uh, geotechnical report. Yes and also uh, the drainage, uh, stormwater drainage yes. uh, concept. Did our drainage engineers review those? Yes, yes they did. And did, is there a statement or anything that he, they, they came up with? It's not in the report. Yeah, it, that normally would have been probably in the TRC review comments, um, which we didn't, did not include, but we would not have moved it forward if our engineers of record weren't satisfied with, with the proposed drainage solution. Okay. They did, yes, they did review it more than once. It, and, but we don't have that information. I don't have that. it handy. Um, while okay. questions are going on, I might be able to look it up through ePlan. Okay. Um, the, um, uh, the dimensional requirements as far as, uh, I, I know you mentioned the SMART plan and the uh, special area plan, the uh, SMART code. Mm -hmm. The um, We do have that traffic, that RV district whatever uh, in our land development code and it gives provides some um, dimensional requirements but I, I it, does that play into this at all you can use it as a reference um, our 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 RV park requirements in terms of like individual like pad and you know lot sizes and stuff pretty much comports with um, with the state um, I, the applicant will probably speak to this but he has gotten his permit from uh, or approval through Department of Health for the, the layout and meeting the minimum lot size requirements. Um, I mean, our, our minimum area requirement in the in the RV park designation is much larger than this. It really contemplates a large, like a COA campground type of thing. So it, it it's but the individual like lot sizes and things. This does comp does meet it. Do did they provide that as part of their application? The 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 authorization or the permit for the RV, the approval for the RV uh, park? Uh, no, that's something they've attained since it went to planning and zoning board. Um, since the planning and since zoning planning board. Since planning and zoning board. They, uh, my uh, understanding is the applicant has gotten his approval from Department of Health for the layout and as an RV park. That wasn't, that wasn't, was, let me was ask not you part this, of was the it test provided to you? It was not, no. Okay. That, that's, that has taken place since. All right. Because I, I was going to ask, the, um, the Florida Administrative Code is a little different than, in terms of nomenclature between our uh, land development code for the RV dimensional requirements and that. And I was going to ask you, but since that's already been um, supposedly approved, then I'm going to hold off on that. The other question was on the, uh, on the traffic circle. The... Um, um, and also trying to uh, harmonize that with the RV park. 
I, I asked the city manager a question today, um, you know, with regard to the traffic circle. Is there something which, you know, that, the conversation I'd already had with him, um, would we be able to limit the size of RV, uh, RVs on Dota Canise? And I already knew the answer to that. The answer is uh, no, not as long as you don't limit everything else <laughs> in terms of size and length. And I would suspect the assistant chief would uh, agree with that. Uh, so we've got the necessary requirement of of the um, of the uh, semi trucks, but we don't have the um, uh, but they're necessary. But the RVs are different, so we don't we don't have that ability. I'd like to have something stated for the record on that, if we can. If not, then then. Is, is, do, is oh, the ability to limit the size of, of just RVs, generally of RVs, right. whether can, they're going here or somewhere question else. Is, my question is, can we limit the size of RVs traveling on Dota Canis? At large, I would have to defer to the police. Can you limit it subject to what this gentleman is allowed to receive on his property? Perhaps that's a conditional use. So I, I think that might be... You may be able to do it specific to him, but can you tell somebody that's just touring the area in their RV bus and takes a you know a ride on the do deck that they can't be there? I have no idea. I'm, I'll defer to the Ms. Kardash. Can you help us with that? Right. So, um, on, unless there's something specific about the roadway that makes it hazardous for vehicles, any vehicle of a specific size to travel on that specific roadway, no, you cannot limit it. Um, and there would have to be studies supporting that, and it would have to be, there would have to be signage that says vehicles of this specific size cannot travel down this roadway. So you can't um, just say that, that those vehicles can't limit down, or can't go down that road, but you can impose a conditional use um, on uh, the property that is reasonably oh, related, right? So one thing, as we kind of enter into this um, discussion about um, what you might be considering for this property, I do want to read from your code the definition of a conditional use. Um, a conditional use are uses which are not permitted by right in a specific, specified zoning district, but which, when subjected to a review according to established standards, may be approved subject to certain restrictions and safeguards. And what the law provides um, with respect to those conditions is that the conditions imposed must bear a relationship to the goal of compatibility between the use and the surrounding area. And should the property owners affected by the application decide to challenge the conditions as unreasonable, the court can consider whether the conditions are whimsical and capricious. So it's important that when you look at the conditions that you're imposing, um, that they be specifically related to whatever harm you are trying to prevent with respect to the condition that you're imposing. The goal is to make the um, use compatible with the surrounding area. Okay. That's why it's, condi that's why it's considered the, the conditional circle. and okay. not a use that's permitted by right. Okay, thank you. Those are the questions I have. Let me um, go to the commission. Vice Mayor Eisner, you've got your light on. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so I know um, the mayor touched base a little bit with this, but I needed to specifically, you have down um, seasonal versus short term. They're two different things. What season are we referring to? Oh, it, okay. It really is. It's it's kind of two terms that mesh together. What that basically means is the the maximum length of time that an RV can be on that site is six weeks. A sp specific RV. After six weeks, it would have to go somewhere else, not just move to another site on the on the page. So it's just like a. It's the same standard that we use for a tourist home. The, the the length of time you cannot be there you have you have it has to be six weeks or less um, so it's not really a seasonal thing it's a short term thing it, it's a short term thing we we use the terms kind of interchangeable but it is a it, in this instance it is a short term stay no more than six weeks I just want to make sure that we're not referring to that it could be used during the fall season when the snowbirds come down and then during the summer that's it's, gone. It's no, gone. Correct. It, it, so it that's is, not what no, we're discussing. Okay. Correct. So earlier you said 
people would come down and use it for a few days and leave, right? That's what you That's said. That's their model. <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah. I, heard, I heard their model. Um, so why do we have six weeks? Because that's what our, that's what our code that that's that's the that is the absolute maximum. Again, as a conditional use, if you want to limit that to something less, then otherwise it's no longer. We have to have a limit. Our code is six weeks or less for the stay. After that, it's considered residential. People live there, and we that's that's what we don't don't want. Okay. So. We don't want it turning into a full-time residential RV park. Um, it could be shorter by condition. Okay. I have a lot of facts that I found and that I would like to speak about, but that would be later. During the comments? Yes. Okay. Let's go to, uh, are, are you done, Vice Mayor? Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Koulianis. I have a lot of comments, but I'll save those for later. I. Um, how many entities own the property that this is uh, this project's going to be placed on? Because I think it's, it's under a corporation, so I'm I think it's multi to. isn't there multiple entities? Um, when this was reviewed, uh, the part of the parking requirement is being met by a property that is titled in a different corporate entity. I don't know if that's since been changed, but at the time of the Planning and Zoning Board meeting, um, it was a separate entity. So you had one entity that owned the, the main portion of it there, and then where those additional side parking um, spaces are there, that parcel was owned by a different entity, which is why I said there had to be an easement um, that is, is recorded and it should be actually not the Pinellas County Clerk, but Pinellas County Public Records um, is where the easement should be recorded um, from one parcel to the other um, in order to meet that requirement. We have to have a guarantee that that requirement is always going to be met and the only way to do that is, is you know, with having something recorded that says that that will be in place. Um, well, I'm sorry, what is the other part of the question? That, that was my question. Okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll um, share the relevance of that later um, of that question. But that's all I have. I had the, the same seasonal. I had the same seasonal confusion, but you cleared that up. Um, Commissioner Kuyas, do you have yes. anything? Yes, uh, Ms. Benson, can we go to the location and context page where it's zoning, where it basically has the special area plan boundary with all the different zones inside? This one or this one? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sure. So uh, in this special area plan, we have, we can see about four or five different zones. Uh, this SDC in which the applicant is in that zone trying to apply for, how is that different from the SDB that runs on the north side of the SAP? The SDB actually has a little more of a... Um, a tourist uh, accommodation. Um, this is was originally this was a little more marine industrial, but mixed. So there's not a ton of difference between the two of them. To be honest with you, I'd have to delve into the actual details of, you know, and look at the, the the district descriptions in the smart code. But it's recognizing that these were special districts. They're waterfront. Um, and they need to be certain things. This one, I would just say, has a little more of a marine industrial um, emphasis versus a little more tourist emphasis. Yes, ma'am. And that T5C and that T4A area, do they have the same potential if conditional use was granted for short-term or overnight stay? So let me talk about that, because um, I, I think what you're getting at is like, are we setting a precedent here by allowing this inside the smart code? So I don't think anything sets a precedent. Um, I would say in this instance, this you're setting, you're setting a bar. Um, this is a small site. It's very limited number. They're providing, they have facilities to serve it. They've got the clubhouse, they've got the pool, they have the on-site management. You know, to me, you're, you're kind of, a, if it's approved, you're kind of setting a standard of what might be appropriate. If someone comes in, you know, and with something that just says, I want to park, you know, 
45 RVs on an existing paved parking lot, you know, lot line to lot line, it's still going to be it's going to be a conditional use. We would give it the same consideration, but I think you know I think everyone each one is going to be unique, and so I don't know if that gives you completely answers your question, but sure. Okay, it seems like a case by case on right the properties that we're referring to, and and, and part of the criteria um, is number four: the use will not adversely impact historical or environmental resources, and, and I'd have to ask you. Um, historically, what part of that special area plan has been considered overnight stay or at least temporary overnight stay with your personal RV? Because we're not talking um, a hotel in which you're going to sleep inside a building that you do not own. You're going to sleep inside a rest area or overnight stay area in a belonging in a, 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 a home mobile vehicle that's yours so isn't that in a way putting people in a coastal high the coastal high hazard area with their own personal equipment and belongings so regarding coastal high hazard area um they they will have a mandatory evacuation plan if there's if you know they, again you have to think of this in terms this is short term this is not Park in an RV and I'm going to live there for a year. You basically you're coming to visit, enjoy the area, and move on to your next site. In the event of a hurricane, uh, just like a hotel, any of that, they would be mandatory evacuation. I'm sure the applicant can speak more to that, but they'll be they would be required to do that. And how is it your understanding that this 60 day rule is going going to be regulated? It's. It, <clears throat> It will be, it's their, their responsibility to enforce it. But if anyone is a casual observer goes down there and they see that RV with that license plate and it's there longer than six weeks, we can enforce that through code enforcement to say that one's got to go. And that, that's the intent. It is not meant to be, you know, that was my biggest concern in this entire project was how do we, I don't want it to turn into a full-time RV park where people come and park there, or the applicant decides to, you know, buy five or six RVs and park them there and let people come in, in and out. That's not the intent either. It is you drive in, you're there for the site for a week, two weeks, three weeks, however long, as long as it's not more than six weeks, and you move on. So it's not meant to be a permanent residence, and that's, that is my biggest concern about something morphing, candidly. So, for example, if the 60 days is met and day 61 they go stay somewhere else, day 62 they can come back and stay for another 60 days, correct? We don't have, I would say technically yes. You know, and again, if that's something if, you know, I think by condition you might be able to get at. Um, but I would say, I'll defer to the city attorney, but I think, yes, if they leave, you know, and come back a few days later, you know, they might be able to stay for another six weeks. That would be just like you would be able to for a short-term rental if you rented one. Okay. And uh, historically speaking, has there been overnight short-term stay with RVs down in that sponge dock special area plan? Not legally. If they have, they're, they're there because they, someone's pulled an RV in and parked it somewhere and decided to camp overnight. I mean, that's, but no, there's nothing. This, this use is unique to the area. Okay, now I believe that um, uh, Ms. Vincent's answered some of the questions that were needed for now and I'll have some additional questions for the applicant. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner DiDonato, nothing. Okay. Um, Mayor, I, I do have one follow-up question for Renee. Um, this is also not intended to be used as vehicle storage or to store RVs. Out, correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. And you are entering your uh, report into evidence for the board's consideration. Correct. Yes. Thank you. And all the attachments that are included in the agenda backup. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me ask, ask you one more quick. Mayor. Oh, you have some yeah, questions. Just yes, one more. Just a follow-up. So if um, the owner violates 
the conditions, what are the consequences? It would be treated like a code enforcement action. And so there would be the same running fine until compliance was achieved. And how many violations would constitute, would give, give way to a reconsideration of the approval? That is not provided in your code. Um, so there is no triggering event that requires reconsideration under the code. Um, if, you know, since this is a new use and you wanted to provide something in terms of a condition, um, you could reserve um, the right to revisit this in five years and also to impose new conditions at that time. That is something that you could do if you feel that it would be beneficial to make sure that there were no code violations and that it has been compatible over whatever period of time you were to choose um, and then review it in this process again. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, last call on questions from the commission? Okay, uh, does the applicant have any questions for Ms. Vincent? No. Okay. Ms. Vincent, would you like to enter your staff report into the record? Yes, thank you. Okay, the applicant's turn. Good evening. My name's Edward Spaeth, 515 Island Drive, and I've been sworn in. I'm the owner of Turtle Cove Marina and various other lots on the waterfront and around the marina's clubhouse. I've been in Tarpon Springs for a little over 22 years, at which time I decided to buy the old Virgo Seafood Market at which time was an abandoned property in disrepair at the west end of the sponge docks. In 2002, I started the process of redeveloping what is now phase one of Turtle Cove Marina and opened up <clears throat> for business in January of 2004 and continued over the next 20 years investing my family's money as a small business owner in Tarpon Springs in the sponge docks, building one of only 2% of all marinas in the US the size of Turtle Cove while working with city and staff with architectural appeal. <clears throat> Which brings me to my current development of building a boutique RV motor coach resort for short-term rentals on land I've owned for seven years. Over those seven years, I've been approached by over a dozen different restaurateurs, townhome developers, hotel developers, and nothing made sense to me especially after trying to negotiate a, a reasonable sales price for the value of the land. A year ago, I traveled to Fort Lauderdale with my family in a motor coach and stayed at Yacht Haven RV Resort and noticed that Turtle Cove and my adjacent land had very similar characteristics, which some of the photos that are in staff's package show and represent. I, just started, I decided to start the process of looking into building a first-class, much smaller boutique RV motor coach resort on my existing property that would also utilize my current amenities of the Turtle Cove Clubhouse, which includes a pool, laundry facility, showers, restrooms, and bar area, which has been closed since COVID. <clears throat> this is going to be 16 short-term transient parking pads with a maximum stay of no longer than six weeks with the average stay for guests of three to seven days. The majority of the RVers follow a rule, which is in their theory today, 333, which means while on vacation, they want to travel from one destination to the next, no further than a three hour drive. They wanna check in by three o'clock and they plan on staying three days or less, or you know, normally three days, unless they happen to love the location and the surrounding area. I have no doubt in my mind that this will be a win-win scenario for the sponge docks, the shops, the restaurants, and the tour boats. <clears throat> we are talking about a $70 billion a year industry and 40 million RVers in the US. The RV community is currently coming <clears throat> in their RVs to the sponge docks with nowhere to park, and this development would give them many more of them and the vacationers a safe place to park and enjoy the history of Tarpon Springs while keeping them in our community for more than a few hours to take all in that Tarpon Springs has to offer and spending their discretionary money in the community. 
The trolley trolley can take my guest as far as Clearwater steps away from my site. And they can also take the Pinellas bike trail, you know, for a ride as the majority of them travel with bicycles. In closing, I have chosen to continue to run and operate one of the largest businesses in Tarpon Springs and have been very fortunate to not only build what I said I was going to do, but also survive tough economies as us all have while raising a family of five. Now at this point in my life, I'm so getting choked up, I'm sorry. I'm so fortunate to have a young man who was four behind me when I started this journey 22 years ago who happens to be my son, 25, who has taken over the marina and is carrying on my family business. I'll answer any questions you all have. Okay. Uh, Ms. Kardash, I have a procedural question. Um, if there's questions for Mr. Spade, um, that's fine. If there's questions for Mr. Govayu, who is his engineer of record, um, would we call him up separate or together we should look at <coughs> questions all right. together? If he, if um, Mr. Gavaje has testimony to offer at this time, um, then then you can do that. If not, he can just um, come up and answer any questions as they come. I believe there may be, just based on some of what I heard, some questions for the engineer of record. Okay. Um, I, I, let, me, let me start out. The, um, uh, like I did before, the uh, uh, probably in reverse, the, the traffic circle um, and, and also um, there was, I watched the PNZ meeting, by the way, uh, for a different reason other than your project, but I, but I just I happened understand. to see your project. The, um, um, have you given any thought to limit the size of RVs for your park? Uh, no, I have not. I'd like to give some evidence to y'all regarding, so it kind of explains this whole turning radius situation, which I think we all have questions on. There's actually seven of them. There. Give them to them first. Yes. So to answer your uh, questions, uh, Mayor, as we all know, there are big rigs, which are tractor trailers, 18 wheelers, that travel the sponge docks on a daily basis that go around the turnaround. A tractor trailer at 18 wheeler is 72 foot long, as you can see on page one here. They go by the sponge docks down the sponge docks, around the turnaround, down Roosevelt Boulevard daily. The second page here is a motor coach. These are the buses that come down and bring guests, tourists, to the sponge docks that go into all the shops and restaurants, take the tour boat. You can see in the second page at the bottom, the overall length of those buses are 45 feet. And I know that we've made comments tonight about that that turnaround can go 45 feet so we know this is happening down there as well fifth wheels the third page it's not really it's a non-event at this point um, they basically range from 25 feet to 45 feet with an average of these fifth wheels being 32 foot long but they are being towed by a truck in the bed via fifth wheel the next page is a representation of a chassis of a motor coach. So we're talking about a 45-foot diesel pusher. There are two, 95% of all the motor coaches out there today, the luxury motor coaches, are built on two chassis. They're built on either a Freightliner chassis or they're built on a Spartan chassis. What I am limiting that resort to is nothing than 15 years or older. I don't want things in there that are older than that. A majority of the higher end places that are being built today, if you look in their what they call parking agreements, so that limits who can stay and who's got to go. I, I gave you a parking agreement to park on my property. 
these people that are traveling in these and the, and the motor coaches, anything above 40 feet, generally an RV, 40 feet and under is basically a two axle vehicle. When you jump from 40 to 45 and you have the option when you purchase a 40 foot RV to put a tag axle on it, which is a third axle on the back, it improves the, the maneuverability as well as the ride of it because it's a heavier, it's, it's got more tire to the ground, everything there. The tag axle on all of these new motor coaches out there today have a independent axle that turns. That axle, the third, the third wheel in the back, when you're going, it pivots. So when the front tires turn, it turns as well. And it takes 17 degrees out of the turning radius. So I'm just giving you this for knowledge and understanding that turning a, a motor coach, a luxury motor coach, around that turnaround is not an issue. You can literally, the new coaches today, you could turn it around in an intersection. <clears throat> the next picture I have here is, and this by no means is pointing out any of my fellow business owners on the sponge docks, but we all have a job to do down there and we all have businesses and families to support. The next picture there is an 18 wheeler, Land of Lakes or Land of Frost, going right in front of my clubhouse down Roosevelt Boulevard, and it eventually ends up at Hellas Bakery. Hellas Bakery has six, seven trucks a day pull into their property that are 18 wheelers, that are big rigs, and have no problem going in and out of there. And they use Roosevelt Boulevard and Dodecanese. The next picture is another 18 wheeler that's going around the turnaround heading down to eventually Rusty Bellies. They transport seafood out. Very good company, great family. They use it every day. Not only these people, F&Y Oil, Energy River, they deliver fuel to me and have for 20 years with an 18-wheeler. The Shell Factory parks across the street from me once, twice a month and supplies all the shops on the sponge docks with shells and everything that they need to support and run a business. Lockhart Seafood, Great Bay Distributors, and J.J. Taylor all drive bigger trucks down there on a daily basis. The next picture is an executive motor coach or a tour bus that is parked right in front of my proposed development and they're parked there daily. These are buses that are coming down to the sponge docks, bringing a minimum of 56 guests that are going into the shops and restaurants that are spending their money in our city. The next picture shows it exactly in front of my property again. I'm gonna go through this pretty quick from this point. The next one shows a black charter bus on the sponge docks, which stopped last Wednesday when I was coming to work right in the road and dropped off 56 passengers. I stood there and watched it personally myself. More importantly, where did that tour bus go? Because I've heard and I understand people's concerns about these vehicles driving down the side roads. It's parked across the street on Cross Street, right above, the, right above from my marina. But more importantly, if you go back probably three more pages, you'll come to this diagram right here and we'll show a yellow line. That charter bus went down the road in front of Hellas, made a left-hand turn on Hope Street, went up Hope Street, made a right on Cross Street, and the picture before that, you'll see they parked diagonal, taking up all the city parking spaces from nine o'clock in the morning till 2.15 in the afternoon. I'm not saying this to cause a problem or do anything, but I'm just making it state and fact that this is going on down there right now. So the length of my motor coaches or my RVs should not be a concern. And when we wanna talk about the length, the length is not an issue because there's much bigger vehicles coming down there. The last two pages in there, when the 
conversation came up about, um, you know, is this happening? Is it going on? You'll see that's my parking lot from the clubhouse. There are two guests or tourists that are parked in my parking lot, which they do every day down there right now, because my marina really is only busy on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. They're parked. I don't stop them. I don't say anything. I haven't for years. They're still walking out of their RVs and they're going down to the sponge docks, but they have nowhere to park. They see my big open parking lots and they pull in there. So it, it is happening, I guess is my question. So I just wanted to, you know, for evidence, so everybody understands, you know, what is going on down there right now and the size of vehicles that can go down there and, and the roads that they are traveling. Because I do understand that a lot of the smaller roads in Greek town down there are tight, they're small, but it's happening on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate all the information. Um, there's certain standards that we have with regard to evidence. And I, I think the best that we can do is that these are observations. No, uh, this is considered evidence. Competent from an expert. Uh, it's not competent, but uh, it, it's, uh, it is competent substantial evidence um, with respect to uh, the observations, but it's not from an expert witness. It's not from an expert, but it's also not on a, necessarily on a topic that requires expert testimony like engineering. What he has testified to is his observations. Um, with respect to the actual turning radiuses and that, that's the type of evidence that requires um, expert testimony to be weighted credibly. Okay, How, but um, I, that, that's clarification. The, uh, the, I'm not sure I understand completely and the reason why is that okay. we've got uh, a report from our traffic engineer who suggests that um, there is a conflict with a traffic circle with certain size RVs, and and you're indicating that there's not. I also understand. Well, I'm not asking you questions. I'm making comments right now. So let me let me get back to the the questions. Um, so the question would be: You're not willing to limit the length of our size of the RV that would frequent your park. Is that correct? I'm not saying I'm not willing to limit, but the largest vehicle. If you had a 45 foot motor coach and you were towing a vehicle, or happened, some of them may tow a vehicle, not everyone does. If you happen to tow that, you're talking in the neighborhood of 56 feet, approximately. All I am stating and saying is there are vehicles way in excess of that that are turning that turnaround right now on a daily basis. So. I'm not even, I'm, I'm not saying that there are 72 feet that are going around the sponge docks right now and I'm asking or requesting 80, but I'm certainly not saying that we're gonna go out and we're gonna measure via tape measure exactly what the length of it is, but I'm, I'm basically just trying to point right, out a I fact. Understand. That's it, that's it. So, no, I mean, nothing else. Uh, Mayor, may I ask a question? What is the, uh, largest length of an RV that the current site plan you have could accommodate? The, the largest RV out there right now, and, and that's just the charter bus is everything, is 45 feet. And, it, and, that, and, 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 the, and the, site, the sites are longer than that. Some are 54 feet in length. Okay. So they, it's, they're long enough to park in there. Okay. So. The, not, um, everyone, not everyone is, because not everyone has a 45-foot motor coach. Not everybody has a 70-foot boat, so same situation. Okay. Um, you, you, um, Ms. Vinson uh, stated that you had gotten state approval for your um, RV park. Yes, is that I did, correct? sir. Yep. And um, are there any conditions on that approval? And, and you, you haven't provided that to the city? No, I did not provide it to the city because um, what I'm going through right now and was going through, so there's clarity on that, um, was site plan approval. Um, as before in anything you do, 
you have site plan approval, then it states and say, it says that you have to acquire a building permit. When you went through the building permit process, that would have been picked up along that. I received an email stating that there was the intent that somebody made a phone call, that there was the intent of me trying to build a RV park in Tarpon Springs by the Florida Department of Health. I responded to her. I, three days later, had a meeting with the Florida Department of Health in Pinellas Park. And I actually have an approval that was dated March 7th, which I just received, which was after the PNZ meeting, that is approved from the Florida Department of Health that meets all of their administrative code requirements for the sites, the size of it, it's stamped and it's approved here. So yes, I do have it, and this would be part of the building permit process, but it was not something that was part of this. Um, I discussed with my engineer, he had never seen this, and quite candidly, the Florida Department of Health, when I got to three supervisors above and discussed this with them, they have not seen a new one be built in 30 years, nor have they seen a marina being built in 20 years around. So it, it was kind of a situation where nobody did anything wrong here. It's just, this is kind of the process that it went through and it would have eventually got picked up, but this was not needed to get a site plan approval at this point. It would have been, in order for me to build it, you're giving me the right to build that there, but in order to meet the state requirements when I do it, if I didn't and it would not work, then no, they would not have let me build this and they wouldn't give me the permit for it. So it is permitted and it is ready to go to okay. answer your question. Yes, sir. And then I, I do have a question for uh, Mr. Gavai. Good evening, Hush Kovahi, Northside Engineering, 300 South Belcher Road, and I've been sworn in. All right. Um, the subterranean drainage that you've got. Yes. Um, I, I took a look at what you submitted with the geotechnical report and also the, the I guess it, it's kind of some specs from the manufacturer of the system that you're proposing on using. I, I know that there's uh, the specific type of uh, uh, half culvert, if you will, that you're proposing is, is a, a, for shallow water, I'm um, sorry, uh, shallow depth, uh, high water table situations. The, um, the, the, the problem I'm having in kind of trying to understand how this is supposed to work is that um, the, the, the water table at the time that the, uh, uh, the samples were taken was, I think, four feet and 3.7 or something like that in the two locations, one in one spot on one lot, one on cross street. But the seasonal high water was, I think, two feet and 2.2 feet. And the minimum depth of the um, installation for the underground vault is 40 inches down to the base. Now, this is just based on the minimum uh, rock, the minimum, you know, the height of the uh, the system that you're using, and also the minimum cover uh, below the below grade. I'm not sure, and in, in, in quite frankly, um, it seems to me that given on a seasonal in a seasonal situation, that entire culvert is going to be filled with water. So I'm not sure how you're going to how. I, I don't see the drainage there is, is what I'm getting at, the capacity at all. It's not an issue of, of percolation. I just don't even see how you can catch a certain volume within a certain amount of time. Is, is that, I mean, am I missing something or? Well, um, the seasonal high, <clears throat> when you're so close to the, uh, to the bay, the Gulf, seasonal, seasonal high is influenced by what they call mean high, high water. So there's a mean high water that's like zero, and then there's a mean high high water that is generally 0.93. So 0.93 is based on this based on the tides. So you're not inland where you know seasonal high is established based on the stains in the 
in the soil. Um, when you're right on the water, it, it is subject to the fluctuation of the, the tides. So you're saying the lot across the street is subject to the tides yes, across the street from yes. Island Drive? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a uh, geotechnical report done, and the geotechnical report also established the percolation rate we kept the, we used the storm tech. Storm tech is basically half a pipe, as right. you were describing, with some gravel beneath that. So, and when you're under water, you don't have to accommodate what they call attenuation or a 25 year storm. You just worry about what they call water quality. And in this particular case, because uh, it's, it's in the OFW, we have to maintain uh, three quarters of an inch of the volume on this property so you can never flood the ocean you can't flood the bay so we don't design for attenuation we just design for water quality so whatever water falls on this property is captured through the uh, boxes inlets catch basins and directed into the storm tech basically retained in there until it percolates and then it has a um, a control structure where it allows the water to um, leave the site as long as it's retained three quarters of an inch over the entire site. So if you are claiming that these areas are tidal and, and you combine that with a rainfall, then I would suspect that at a high tide and a rainfall that we have, let's say a king tide, and the a rainy day tide that we have at the sponge docks all the time, then that entire area would be flooded. Is that correct? The site I'm talking about, not not the really the streets are going to be flooded, but we're talking about the site now. Uh, the streets are well, you know, when the water comes up in a hurricane, I mean, the whole place is flooded, so all the beds are off with salt water. With salt water, yes. We are designing based on the state regulation, based on the code requirements, and I've spoken with your engineer, David, uh, I'm sorry, Rick uh, Aguar, several times, and we have worked the project. As a matter of fact, he is very smart, is really very good. I, I give him a lot of respect because originally, when we had had the survey done, apparently there was an issue with the benchmark, and somehow he caught it and uh, we were able to correct it. We had sent a survey out there and corrected the grades. So um, we have worked all the drainage out with him and okay. he's totally happy. All right, I, I'm not sure how to deal with this at this point because I understand you're strictly doing it from a, a stormwater permitting perspective, but we're looking at it from more of a practical perspective um, as far as the, the lot flooding. And, and, um, um, and quite frankly, I would have not thought that at least a lot across the street was tidal, but if, mm -hmm. if you're claiming that it's tidal, that's, you know, and the other part I was gonna ask you about this system, how, are, how is the inspection done to make sure it's still functioning? Um, let, me, let me just, if you don't mind, let me just back up a little bit um, because I, I, I neglected to state that we are raising the grades to, from elevation, I think four, 4.5 to elevation six. So we are lifting up the property to elevation six. I just wanted to mention that to you. So well, what's the elevation now? Uh, I think it's about 4.5, uh, 424 or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's very low. Uh, right now it's very low, but um, so we're not building at grade. We have to keep everything above and we had to actually use the um, um, the software that we have to make sure that it percolates into the so, ground. So you're raising the elevation of the entire property? Absolutely, yes, and the road as well. Yeah, but you're not going to accumulate, you're just going to attenuate. We're not attenuating, we are providing water quality. Oh, I'm sorry, water quality? Yes. But where's the water that would have been there with the additional height that you put, where's that going to go to adjacent properties and how is that going to be dealt with? It's, it's designed appropriately where it doesn't impact the properties next door to us. We have been very mindful of that and your engineers have made sure of that. 
Okay. Did you share that uh, additional height? Is that on the site plan? Oh, absolutely, yes. The additional Yes, absolutely. Height. It okay. shows existing grades. But it shows proposed grades. Does it have the current grade on there as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Hoosier. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, let's go to um, the rest of the commission. Vice Mayor Eisner. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. So... I do appreciate you giving this, and I do appreciate you having a business here for so many years. Um, my question to you is, you would, do, you would agree that these uh, tractor trailers all are professional tractor trailer drivers, all the buses are trained um, bus drivers, and you know, no, no disrespect, but you're comparing um, all of the pedestrian traffic that we have on Dodecanese with people that have motorhomes and do not have that knowledge, that training that these professionals um, possess. I know you must have, my question is, how, how do you make that comparison? I mean, I understand they make it down the street and I, I picked up on that expression, you know, that, that analogy that you've given. But I can't compare a tractor-trailer driver to some of the RV people. Um, I've been alongside some of the RV people, and they're not even staying in their lane. And I know it's a million-dollar or a $500,000 RV, um, but I, I just... So I, I'd like you to give me some idea of how you could make that evaluation and expect me to um, agree with that. I'm not making an evaluation that any RV that's coming down the sponge docks is going to be remotely close to the length of what a big rig or a tractor trailer or an 18 wheel or anything is. I'm clearly was making a statement that they are doing that. And yes, you're right. Uh, do you have to have specific training to drive an RV? Answer is no. Do you have to go to boater safety courses to drive a certain size boat? Yes, you do. I don't make those rules. Um, the other reason for showing you the pictures was simply that there are current RVers and people that are coming down the sponge docks. Now, do they have six months training? Do they have six years or did they just buy it off a lot? I can't answer that and I don't know, nor could you answer that. So that's, that's like anything in the world. I mean, you can get in a car today and you could have a 16-year-old a run a red light and hit you. Uh, that's, that's, that's the environment we live in. Um, can I answer to the safety of the people driving down the sponge docks? No, and I don't think anybody can. So I understand where you're coming from with that, but I, I, I can't say that every RV coming down there is, is a skilled driver. No, I don't... I, you know, we see accidents all the time everywhere, so I, I, I can't answer that. But we're not, I'm, I'm specifically just saying the size of the vehicles. So, and, 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 the, and the vehicles that are coming down there are that size right now, as far as RVs are concerned. Well, that is yep. one of my safety ideas. Sure. I mean, uh, when I see a person who's working for a living bringing a delivery mm -hmm. versus someone who's going... Um, I don't want to call it a joy ride, but it is, it, it's, it's a joy ride. Um, so that, that concerns me. My other question for you, I know that you went to this other RV park and you've done, um, did you do any surveys on nationwide RV parks, what they accept size-wise, what they don't, what the average is? Have you done anything like that? I've, I've, I've been traveling for almost two years <coughs> researching looking at different properties, looking at different setups. So the answer to your question is yes. I've looked at other properties, what they take and what they do. Um, there are different size pads. Some are pull-through pads, which means you drive straight in and straight out. Some are back-in sites. Some are pull-in sites. Um, so there are differences, and, and all of that comes to the uniqueness of how the property is laid out. So there, and, and there are different size 
RVs on the road today. And there are, you know, tow behinds or fifth wheels. So the, it, it, it's a wide variety. It's like saying in my marina, you know, is, is, is every boat the same? No. You know, you have a T-top boat, you have a boat with a tower, you have a, a runabout, you have a skiff, you have all these different things. So there, every, everyone is unique and different. So I don't like throwing gotcha questions, but that's fine. I, I have to ask the question. Do you know what the average size of RVs in national parks are? You can, national parks, you cannot put anything, they, they will not take a class A diesel pusher motorhome today. In, in, the, in, the, in the state, majority of them out there today. Right, but do you know what the size is, is my question. <clears throat> Some of them range anywhere between 35 to 40 feet. Okay, the average is 27. Um, I'm just, I, I, I know, I, I just want you to understand the average is 27. I, I can assure you, if you want to go to Good Sam's or you want to look at multiple other things out there, and, and at, at, at that point, there are other national parks that you can go into that are o over 27 feet. They, they are out there and, and, and you can go to them. So if, if that's what you're reading on Google or whatever you're looking up, that's fine. And I'm not here to argue the fact of that, but there are bigger RVs going in. Well, a, 20, a 27 foot RV is, is not even a realistic animal that's being sold out there today. So I, I don't know how that could be accurate, but if you're reading it, and that, that's accurate. Well, it has to come as a question. Sure, later, I understand. Later, I will give you the facts in a statement, but right now, I can only ask you questions. Okay. Um, most, do you know what most of the campgrounds have? Is their answer, not national parks, in their size? I, what, 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 what is the average size of a boat in a marina today? I, I mean, honestly, well, I'm, 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 I'm developed a site plan and the criteria. Right. So I, I don't understand where any other RV park, no matter where it's on Alt 19, 19, Trinity, wherever this is, I, I don't understand the, the rationale for you know, the questioning of the, the size of what the average is in the nation. So I mean, we're you, not talking about, I'm not, I'm not talking about DC. I'm, I, I have no idea. So let me give you my okay. answer to your question. I don't know, can I, I wanna answer your question. I'm asking these questions um, because you're not building a RV park you're taking an existing area and trying to conform it to an RV park. So I'm giving you areas that were designed for RV parks and RV places, and they're not near the sizes that you're trying to squeeze into an area that's very tight. So that's my reason why I'm asking you these questions. Because if you were going up north into maybe Spring Hill and you bought this huge lot and you put this, this RV park on that lot and you said whatever size you want to put in, you're making accommodations for it. You answered his question. <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean, I, I don't, I understand. Well, you I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to answer his, his question. This was, it's not a design that you're designing. You're trying to fit the, square peg in the round hole rather that's, than... That's not making, an accurate statement. Okay. No, sir, it's not. No. Because the, the no. average road in an RV I'm, park okay. is yeah. only the width of one lane. If you look at the inside layout, the concrete pad that's going to each individual pad is 40 feet wide. There is no... RV park up north here or within a 30 mile radius that has a 40 foot wide street in front of the pad. So when you're pulling in, you're going down a road, a two lane road in an RV park that is not 40 feet wide. So you're having to turn off of that two lane road to pull into your parking space. So I have thought about this stuff. So again, it's, it, it, it's a design criteria, I guess, 
And yes, every RV park is going to be different. Every marina is different. The, my, the placement of my buildings on my property when I build it's different. So I, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I'm not really concerned about what's going on in California. I'm not concerned about what's going on in Fort Lauderdale. I'm, I'm looking at what I have one opportunity to make this right. If I build this and I make it to where it's inconvenient for my guests to come down here, I'm gonna get bad blogs and they're not gonna come and all the money that I spent to do this was for nothing. So I appreciate you pointing out to me that you feel that that's not a maneuverable site and it's not comparable to what's out there. And, and all I can say is I disagree and I, I believe it will work. I'll rescind all my other comments to later. But thank, thank you. you. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Any, anything else? Any other questions for the engineer or anything? No. Okay. Um, let me go to Commissioner Kuya. He's got his light on. Okay. Commissioner Kuyas. Mr. Spieth, would you consider yourself very knowledgeable on RVs? I would consider myself enough to be dangerous. Well, you, you've had, <laughs> you, you claim you've had two years of RV experience since COVID no, started. I, I, it, depend, it depends on what we're talking about here. Like, I mean, do I, do I know the, the average road? No. So, but no, I'd be more than happy to answer your question, but experienced in, in driving or are we talking experienced in what? I'm not, I'm not understanding. Uh, just answer the question okay. to, to the best of your ability. And, and I will say thank you for other previous projects, but they will have no weight and bearing on this application. I understand. Um, and so you've, you brought this book out showing different types of trailers and commercial trucks and RVs and stuff. And you've brought that and you've, you've stated that there's a lot of commercial vehicles they're delivering, but is it correct to say that they are contributing to the, the tourists, restaurants and, and industry that those commercial vehicles are coming down there for? As far as what do you mean? They're dropping off food, they're dropping off souvenirs, they're, 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 their intent, which has been going on for a while, is still continuing to go on in which they're operating uh, to provide the tourist oriented commercial businesses, restaurants and industrial waterfront uses. Are we talking the 18 wheelers or are we talking about the tour buses? All of that. The tour buses are coming down here to go into the restaurants. The, the 18 wheelers are bringing products down for the restaurants. The 18 wheelers are bringing fuel to my marina. So it, it, I think it all goes hand in hand, yes. Okay, and so, sir, what is a luxury boutique RV park? Because I've never heard of one before. And I, after watching the PNZ meeting mm -hmm. and hearing you and, and you've put it, what is that? What's a What's a luxury, a, a luxury RV park? A boutique would be no different than everybody I've heard as a property owner and a business owner here for many, many years that the city wants a boutique hotel. Which is which is a smaller like smaller scale hotel. So it, it's it, it's it's a term I put in there. It's it's more of a smaller facility. Boutique is like a, a smaller little property. I, I that that that's that's my version of where I get boutique from. So that that that's that's where that came from. RV resort is the same situation. You could have uh, you could have a marina that's. 100 slips, you could have a marina that's 500 slips. So I, I think we're talking about size here, that's all. So in the, in the last two years, have you traveled to any of these luxury boutique RV parks you can confirm with? I, I have not gone to, I've, I've gone to RV parks and resorts, some smaller, some bigger, correct. Yes, I have. So what's gonna make your place a luxury boutique place as opposed to others? It's it's what I named it. I, I don't understand. It's it's a part. We're talking about a facility to park multiple size RVs on the property. It, it's a word. I okay. So there's yeah. no 
what you're saying, it's, it's a word that you're describing it, but there's no really base or understanding of, I guess, the noun in itself that you're, you're trying to describe it, you know? So you've, you've made a couple statements about there's 16 landing spots or parking correct. pads, correct? Correct. I mean, the, these are luxury RVs. They're pretty big vehicles, are they not? Not everyone. No, they're, no, they're not. Not, oh. not everyone is. So I don't. I don't know. How many of them would come with a vehicle? How many would come with a vehicle? From your experience. From my experience. If if you look on the road today, and everybody drives on the road, some tow vehicles, some don't. So I've I, I've never towed a vehicle with ours when I've traveled. So you travel. So, you just travel in your RV. You don't have an extra vehicle with the majority, you. The majority. The majority. The majority of the places that I have gone to have been in tourist destination areas. I've either catched an Uber, I've caught a rail system into DC, I've been to Pigeon Forge. I've been, I've been all over. So each place is independent. And, and with things such as Instant Cart today, uh, for groceries, everything. I mean, not everybody tows. Not everybody has a vehicle. So, I, I, I the, the the percentage. I don't. I don't have the percentage of what people travel with a with a vehicle and not with a vehicle. But not everybody travels with with a with a with a car though behind. I, they just don't. So, you you have some people that are full time RVers. So they they travel further, and you have some people that are destination people that decide I want to go to to Fort DeSoto for the weekend. Okay, and, they, so you, and they stay there, so, yeah. All right, so you're not willing to give a percentage of vehicles that come with the RV? You How can I give idea. you a percentage when I, I no, I, I, I don't know that, I, I, no. I, how am I supposed to give you a percentage of, of the people? I'm sorry, you're, you're presenting the criteria and the information <laughs> to us. So when I wanted to ask you, if you have 16 RVs. Correct. Towing 16 vehicles, where are all those vehicles going to go? They can't fit on the pads. There's not enough space. Where are they going to go? On the balance of the property that I have at Turtle Cove, which I own, around the clubhouse, not everyone is 45 feet long. According to what I've been told, the RV is 27 foot long is the average RV today. So if the average RV is 27 feet, and I have a 40-foot pad or a 45-foot pad, that leaves room for the RV and the car if they're towing that. How are you going to go about regulating this 60-day stay? In the contract, just as a, a transient boater would come into the marina, what you are issued when you go to these parks is a permit or a parking pass, basically, if you read in their contracts. So it states no different than you go into a hotel room and you check in here, you have to be out by here. It's the same situation. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> when can they come back? A day later? I, I don't, people are not gonna come to, to stay in Tarpon Springs. They're coming to Tarpon Springs to look at the history, to go, you're, you're opening up an area for more tourists to be able to come down here, to be able to go to here. We, we, you have people right now that are staying outside of the area that come here. You're, 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 you're keeping them here, which is what I've heard for many, many years, trying to keep people inside the city versus leaving the city and spending money down in Dunedin or Clearwater Beach or whatever. They're here. They, they, they stay three to four days and they move on to the next destination. That's what this property is. So you <clears throat> wouldn't have an issue at all with this commission adding a conditional use of maybe seven days, if less? I, absolutely, okay. I have a problem with seven days. You would have a problem with it? Yes, absolutely. You're making it, you're not, you're not even making economically feasible for me to operate a business. Okay, but I just want to make sure. No, I, know, I hear You've you. also stated before that people come to stay about four to five days and they 
part of this 333 rule. And is it correct to say that at the planning and zoning meeting, are we allowed to ask a question from that city attorney? Uh, it's part of the record of, of this <clears throat> application, yes. Okay. So you stated that people are gonna stay at the planning and zoning meeting about two to five days. Do you remember making that the, statement? The average person would stay that time frame. Okay. And so you also stated that people aren't gonna wanna stay 30 days or so because the, the monthly cost of that would be anywhere from 3,800 to $4,200 a month? Correct, that's, that's what the majority of these places do. Correct. So I'm just, I'm getting these mixed reports on, on what you're saying your, your application is in which we're trying to work with you on your, you know, your 333 rule, but then you're trying to say that people wanna stay longer and you've given different testimony at that P and Z meeting. Uh, no, 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 sir. I'm not giving different testimony. What, what, what we're talking about here. I, I'm giving you a what people in, in in those areas. If 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 they are not coming to an area to stay, if you go on vacation, are you going to be told you got to leave now because you're here for seven days? If you enjoy it, what if they have family that come down? Or they, they enjoy the area. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not understanding why I, I, I'm, I'm you're saying stipulations you now, on, on and, and, the, and the six weeks was only what we went through with the city, so. You stated on the record at the PNZ meeting, I don't even know why they're offering me 60 days. I don't need it. Do you not remember making that statement for your they're, application? They're, they said to me, six weeks. So are people gonna stay? I, I can't tell you. That's like asking me, what's the what's the the majority what, what's the average majority of the people gonna stay? I don't know how long they're gonna stay, but if I have that I cannot keep them there any more than six weeks, they will not be there any more than six weeks. I mean, that's would be in our contract. So that's that's what I'm saying. And, and again, you haven't thought about any six weeks in a day and come back that hasn't come across your head at all or no, thought, no, I have not. Process during no. this whole application? No, not at all. No, I have not. I mean, absolutely not. Don't you think so when you're asking about overnight stay in the special area plan and, and the sponge docks in which you're asking for something that hasn't been done before? I'd like to ask the city attorney a question if that's okay. Can I ask a question of the city attorney? Um, I know you have short term rentals for, for like a like an Airbnb, um, is, is, do you have the stipulation for like six week stay? In the city's code, that is uh, the six weeks is the um, maximum for in your, short term in your rentals. Airbnb. For areas that allow, not every area in the city allows short term rentals, but for the areas that, yes. do, that do allow, that's what they're considered as six weeks. So how would you regulate that? the six week do you have do you have a code basically or a commitment that they can't stay beyond six weeks it's handled through code enforcement action when there's if it's identified that that that's the issue yes it would be handled through code enforcement action would it be safe to assume that this is in comparison the same thing like an airbnb and you can do the code enforcement same exact situation. We have styled it as a short-term rental, yes. So I hope that sort of answers your question. And I, I, know, you're, I know you're concerned, um, but I think Ed would be an extremely lucky person to have people that want to stay here all the time. <laughs> you know, people Ms. generally Cardenas, take a vacation. I, I think we're, excuse me, all of y'all, I think we're kind of getting into some issues that should be discussed at the TRC level rather than at the commission level. And um, I, I, I think these are things um, short term. I think Ms. Vincent explained it. There isn't anything in our code concerning RV trailers. So she's making a, a, an analogy to short term rentals. And I think what we need to do is stay, stick focused on, on the questions from Commissioner Kuya 
and either you agree with them or you don't agree with them. That's all going to get weighed into it's it. Just, I just want to make a point of clarification. It, there's really almost the same kind of situation. It's not an issue of clarification. Ms. Vincent already testified to that. You had an opportunity to ask her questions on that. You didn't do that. That's part of the process. So okay. let's stop okay. and let's get Thank back you. on track with our process. So uh, okay, Mr. Spieth, back to the special area plan and uh, objective. It's to provide tourists accommodation options such as hotels, motels, inns, and other short-term lodging within walking distance of the tourist destinations of the sponge docks. And that's inside the considerations on in this backup, correct? Yes, I read it, yes. All right, in the next bullet, it says, although proposed project is not a traditional lodging facility, this type uses provides necessary short-term accommodations. Yes. So it's not traditional. And so what we want to get back to is this conditional use. And can you tell me how, and one of number four on the criteria, the use will not adversely impact historical or environmental resources. And yet the sponge docks has not been known as short term vehicle stay, RV park stay. Is it not affecting the historical resources and perspective of that area? Is it his, his historical as far as where down there? I mean, it, it, are we, is it the sponge docks himself or is it down where this property is located at? Do you not consider your property in the sponge docks? It's, it's at the, yes, the, the north end. Or, you know, down there, correct, yes, I, I yes. And so, uh, with uh, these other nearby <clears throat> properties, don't you think they have, they have similar abilities to look at yours and potentially ask through conditional uses through a set precedent? As, as I heard tonight, everything is on an individual case basis. And we're talking about 16 parking spaces, so, as staff stated, it's on an individual basis. So we're talking about what I'm here tonight to talk about. So I can't comment about other properties. And so again, number two for that criteria, the proposed use is appropriate to the property in question with incompatibility with the area. So how is the short term stay in the RVs that you're claiming compatible to the area? It's 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 not compatible. It, it's a short term. What did you just say, sir? It's it's a short term stay. No, okay, I thought you said it was not compatible. No. And uh, we talk about future development in this back and this says project does not necessita uh, necessitate significant site improvements therefore the site can easily be redeveloped in the future if necessary uh, are you aware of any redevelopment of rv parks here in tarpon springs not to my knowledge no in the last 10 years not to my knowledge in the last no. 22 years since you've been here not to my knowledge no thank you sir Is that it, Commissioner Krios? No, I got one more question. Mm -hmm. Are you not, is your application that you're requesting for something that has not been done historically in that special area plan in the Sponge Docks Character District? Since I've been here, all of those districts have changed multiple times. So in the special area district, which was not the special area district when I first came here, no. So this is the first time? I, I don't keep track of the different districts that the city puts on different areas down there, just like there's a study right now going on about the sponge docks. I, I, I don't, no, I, I, I don't follow that. All right, so your knowledge on, on there are several questions you, I don't know if you skipped around or if you didn't, but relating to vehicles that come with RVs, you, you didn't want to answer that or you really couldn't give a valid answer, correct? <clears throat> I'm not sure where you're, 
What, what particular question would you like for me to answer regarding the size of vehicles? The, the, it, are they towing, towing cars? They're not towing cars. I, you're, you're, you're asking me questions that I, I, I don't know. Should I, pull, I mean, I'd pull my phone out and find out how many the percentage is. I, I don't know that. You're asking me to answer a question that I can't. So I will just say, no, I don't know the answer to that question. So I, I don't know what you want me to, I don't know what, what, you, what answer you're asking me to give you though. And you've also admitted that you do not know of any other applications in which you are asking for that are similar to anything in the sponge docks in short term stay currently, correct? I, I don't keep up with that. So I can't answer that question. So to your knowledge, you don't, I, 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 don't, I don't follow development of other properties in there. Thank you. So no, no further questions. Um, Commissioner Koulianis. Good evening, Mr. Spade. Hi, John, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Good. All right, so let me ask you, um, let's, let's discuss your business model. Okay. So you were, you were talking about, um, um, having one of your conditions that they not be more than 15 years old, right? Correct. Okay. So does this work similar to like an Airbnb situation where you know who the, these people are by, they either have to sign into some format, like a software, uh, like a, a, an app or something, or the, and then you know what vehicle they're use, they're driving so that that you can tell them, hey, your, your vehicle's too old, you can't come to my park? Is, do you, is there Cor some mechanism like Cor that? Correct, it's, it's everything with technology today, just as we've changed with at the marina. So okay. the majority of the way you go out and you book a reservation today in an RV park is you go online, you put all the criteria in. As far as, I, I can't comment because the vehicles that I've traveled are not that old. So, but I would assume that you could put a parameter in there if you did an online reservation that it would not allow you to book it and but it would is, say is the there call. Like so. a, is there like a standard format, like, like Airbnb or like uh, Yes, there, there, like there, there's, software, there's software programs out today that, that there, you, you do, correct, there, yes. So there's, there's something you can associate with that gets you, like you see a picture of the people, you know who they are, you know who's showing up. Let me, let me ask you, um, <clears throat> So a concern is the route, a uh, concern that I would have would be the route they go, right? It, especially if they're 45 foot and they are dra uh, uh, towing something and it's 56 feet long, you know, I can imagine an issue of them going down Athens Street, right? So if they came down Pinellas, take a left on Athens and Athens gets very narrow, especially when you get um, you know, from like Cedar Street up to, up to the docks, you know, going by um, National Bakery and all that, you know, there's cars parked and it gets very narrow. And then when they, once they get to Dota Canise, then they're gonna take a left. And I understand that these newer ones turn mm -hmm. better, but it still could be kind of a wide turn and, and could cause some kind of traffic issue. I understand. So with that in mind, since you're going to be communicating with these people in advance, you can give them the best route, right? Correct. So there, there are people that they don't, they, some of these people have never been to Tarpon Springs. Exactly. And they're going to be communicating with you and you're going to be saying, okay, here's where you're coming. Here's the best route to take. So what, in your, in your mind, what would be the most ideal route for them to come that would be the sure. least intrusive on the, the dock area? It, it, people are going to be coming north or south. So it would be 19 to the old Live Oak Road where they turn by the lows at the traffic light, come straight down to the traffic light at Dodecanese, and then straight down Dodecanese. And then come around. Come would around. They, would you ask them to come around the roundabout, or would it, you ask gonna, them to go? It's going to. It's going to be dependent on each individual's driver how how they feel. Right. We will show them an aerial map on our website that you could go left or you could go right, 
But they could go halfway around. They could go straight down and by just, Rusty Bellies, down Island Drive, and around. pull in from there. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So would that be the if you were driving, if you were coming in, you have an RV. Mm -hmm. Which way would you feel most comfortable? I I would feel comfortable going either way personally, and 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 I and I and I've been in smaller, tighter areas. Okay. Than the, what that is, so I I'd feel comfortable doing personally. I feel comfortable doing either or. So, um, how much do these vehicles cost? If you look at a, uh, you know, a, a smaller motorhome today out there, um, you're probably in the neighborhood uh, today starting out three hundred thousand okay. to a half a million. When you get into a, a diesel pusher, um, luxury type, you're talking five hundred thousand to two million. You go under that. There's fifth wheels out there today that are $100,000 100 to 200000 And then you have little pop-up campers, which people do go. Then they may pull a smaller tow-behind type thing and plug in and stay there for a, a little bit. And your, and your, um, your charge for the stay. Correct. Would you be at the higher end of the charges for stays? No, or, it, it, on the at the KOA on in Palm Harbor, um, depending on each each of these sites are different. So if it's a pull through site, back end site, when you look at their websites, they all have different prices based on how you want to pull in, where you want to go, and what's happening. But if you look at the at the the rate that's over, say in, at the KOA, or if you look at some that are on the Anclote River, right. Um, Right now, they're averaging $190 a night. I'm looking to be around $200 a night. Okay. So no, I'm not. I'm not higher or 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 way on ex or least expensive by no means. Well, uh, yeah, obviously, yeah. if you were yeah. staying on the open Gulf, you might have. I think the proximity no different than than yeah. my marina. It would You're warrant, right here at the it would warrant it, probably it has higher, added value. It would Correct. warrant a higher price. Correct. Than staying on 19 somewhere. Correct. Okay. And so the, the odds of somebody who is driving a, a, a vehicle that costs as much and sometimes more than a home, right? Gaming the system to like stay and then leave for a day and then come back is kind of highly unlikely, right? What, why would, some guy driving a $500,000 vehicle isn't, why is he playing those games? And He's most likely to going to come to Tarpon Springs, enjoy whatever stay he, he they would enjoy here, and then obviously go about their business. All, all I can do is is I, I've I've tried to gain knowledge right over the last two years. Okay. Because I tried to do something a little bit more with my family. So when I went to these places and talked to them and saw no different when I decided to build a marina, which was my dream. I asked, like, what do you like? What don't you like? And a lot of people had stated that they like to be as close as they can to a tourist destination area. And they are coming. And no, these are not the type of people that uh, they're, they're not here to, to camp out. Generally, I would say they're semi-retired or retired. They're business people. They're on their laptops. They're, our whole world has changed to where they're doing business remotely now. So yeah, I they, got they could do that, I yes. Got I got it. So um, I wish you could take credit for that boutique. Thing, but <laughs> it's, I don't, it, it's, it's all over the internet with boutique. And I, and I understand the concept. It's a little higher end yeah. place. It's a nice day and more amenities, better amenities. You have the clubhouse, you have a pool, you have well, all and A lot of, of those stuff. places don't, yeah, don't have a pool yeah. or a clubhouse, yeah. correct. So no, yes. I, get, I get that whole thing. So, um, and so, so on one hand, we have the traffic, right? So if people stay shorter, then there's more traffic, right? Because they're going to be coming and going more often. If, they, if everybody came and stayed one day, you'd have 16 vehicles hitting the road and then really uh, 32 vehicles, right? Because you'd have 16 leaving and 16 coming and you'd have a lot. So if they stay a little bit longer, seven, eight, nine, ten, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, it actually 
re alleviates some of that traffic issue because then they're going to be sitting there and it's only one trip. So it, it minimizes trips, right? Yes. Okay. So guys, people say in one day, which may make parties happy that they're not staying long, actually creates more traffic issues. Correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, that's my that's my only questions for you right now. Okay. Thanks. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Di Donato. Um, just want to swallow a couple of times. I, 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 I believe that the vote on the PNZ was five to two, correct? Seven zero. Oh, seven zero. Okay, that's even better. And I understand, I, I watched quite a bit of that meeting as well. They were, they didn't let too many issues go through without asking some questions and concerns. Uh, what I'm hearing here is some of it appears to be approaching to me on us telling you how to run your business. And I would just simply say my understanding of this whole process is that we're trying to decide if this is a reasonable conditional use for this piece of property. And I think that's really, quite frankly, the major portion of what we should be discussing. Um, I've heard, I'm, I'm hearing that maybe we don't think that you, your, your use here is great for the sponge docks. I remember 22 years ago, I think it was, when you, when I first met you. you were, yes, I came before you. Uh, and, and it was, yeah, longer than that. Yeah. And I remember, and I was impressed with the fact that you came into my office, we sat down, we talked for probably 20, 30 minutes. And the one thing that was impressive to me is you, to me, were relatively young to be starting that, that kind of business, but you Strangling. had the, the why. You had that. And you dotted pretty much every I and crossed every T with me. And you went through a process then through PNZ and through the commission, you were building something that had never been built in the sponge docks either. And not only have you helped the, the, the boaters of Tarpon Springs have a place to, to uh, dock or put their boats, but you've helped all of Pinellas County. The county was actually happy to see you come and build your facility. So you have a track record with us for multiple years. Uh, you've demonstrated that you take that seriously. I think that's important for this commission to consider. I think, again, we, we, we've built a lot of things through. I remember a townhome project that was built in the Sponge Dock area, and it was discussed quite heavily um, because it, it, too, was said it didn't need to be, to be there. There are some things where, where you are, this, this just makes sense to me. Uh, and I do, I do believe it is a relatively new trend in the country, according to people I know that, that have RVs. I've been on many of them, and I've taken many trips on RVs. Fortunately, I, I learned a long time ago that it's better to know people that have those kinds of things than it is to perhaps to have your own. And, and I confess to that philosophy. And I know pretty much every one of them that I know have these clubs that are national clubs and when, you, when, I, when I've asked them, why, why are you doing this? Well, I've worked hard on my life. I can afford it. I want to go see the country. And that's exactly what they do. They travel for two or three days in a location. They pull up and they take off and go to another location. And these clubs actually map everything out for them and, and, and actually show them where the restaurants are. They, I mean, it's all laid out like I, I couldn't believe how well organized it is. And some of the questions you've been asked here tonight, I, I understand the concern by the commissioners, but what I, what I don't get is that they're asking you to predict your future. You're, they're asking you to predict what the likelihood of, of things are. The fact is you've, you've, you're asking for a conditional uh, 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 approval and, and the law has pretty much stated what your parameters are just as you did when you came in with the, with the, uh, the boat slips. I think that's what we should be judging here, not, not basing it on anything else. If, if you don't think that's the right location for it, then vote that way. 
if, if you think he, he's demonstrated that he knows what he's done, uh, what he's doing in running a business, then consider that too, because I, I, I don't know the man personally other than our one meeting. That's the only time you and I have talked. But I was impressed because of the way you presented yourself. And I'm impressed here again tonight because you, uh, you pretty much dotted the I's and T's of things that you have knowledge about. You haven't tried to predict what others are gonna do. But the, the, the law here that we're supposed to decide pretty much decides what you can do. I think Costa's question to the, to the grade was right on, but that was, that was mentioned, I think, when, when, Ms. Vincent, when you uh, first discussed that, it was gonna be built up. Um, if that's the case, then we can't build anything down there because it's, it's been that way for ever since I've been here. So I, I, just, I just commend you for being here. I commend you for being a good business owner. And I believe that just as then, you saw the future. You, you did what I did when I, when I first started my business. I, I basically put pins in a map to decide where my competition was. You did the same thing, if, if I remember a conversation fairly well. For, for the voting, similar, correct. Similar. You knew that North County was going to be the direction they were going to go because they had to. They didn't have any place in, in mid and south county. So I think you've done your homework on this. I, I, I think the concept is, is going to expand just as, as the, the hotel motel things. Boutique hotels now are a big deal in a lot of resort areas. And we have been wanting one for a lot of years. And, and to me, this is a smaller scale. Um, as I see it, you meet the conditional use approval, and uh, I commend you for your patience in, in your business. Thank you. Okay, is that it, Commissioner? Is that it? Yeah, that's okay. Um, are there any further questions? All right. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have any questions for Mr. Spate? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, um, let's go to uh, public comments now. Uh, what I'm gonna do is ask, I, I don't normally do this, but I'm gonna split it up. I'd like to have those that are for the project come forward and make their comments, and then those that are against will we'll do that later. Please come forward if you're for the project. Good evening, board members. Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. I don't personally know this gentleman, but let me tell you something, he's given us something good in Tarpon Springs. He's kept it clean, he's kept it right. He is a developer in that project there. We should be proud of him. He's been a good citizen. He's just like the Stamuses. Eddie Hoffman wanted to put a boutique motel down on the bayou. Remember that? You should remember that, Mayor. And we've had others. We turned down a hotel. We want people to come here and stay and spend their money in Tarpon, not turn them away. And what we're doing is turning away businesses, people coming to spend money in our economy of Tarpon Springs, pay money to come here. What's wrong with us? We can't shut Tarpon down forever. And sometimes you have to take the best that you know that you can get, because you're not here tomorrow and we don't know what's coming in the future. This gentleman has done his homework. He's been grilled like he was a Nazi up here tonight, and that's wrong. Some of the questions asked were ridiculous. It's embarrassing. This man knows what he's doing. He's putting his money and heart into Tarpon Springs. He's one of our sons here who give us something good. Support this and make something good for Tarpon. Let's quit sending people on to Dunedin, Safety Harbor, and Clearwater. You go to those communities and see what they've done to bring the RVs into their communities and make the money. Yes, we've had a good tourist year this year, but it's not all the time. Let's show we have some good intelligence and give him this opportunity to put money into Tarpon and make something good for us. My name is Troy Bone. I live at 957 Island Drive. 
and I'm in full favor of this man putting this park down there. I'm one of two families that still live on that road. All the other, everything else is commercial down there. There are trucks that come through there all the time. There are big rigs that come through there all the time. They even tow cars sometimes. And I don't see any problem with that man putting this up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Sir, I, I, I apologize. Were you sworn in before? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. I'm sorry. I, That's all right. I just wanted to make sure we had it on the record. Thank no. you. He's a classmate of mine. Yeah. 66. <laughs> Good evening. My name is John Corliss, and I live at 609 Hope Street. And I uh, back up to the marina. I look out over the open space, and then the marina... And then beyond that would be Island Drive and this proposed RV park. And I walk the neighborhood all the time, and that is an eyesore down there. I would be embarrassed to bring company down there. I said, what is this? It's a, it's, a, it's a mess. There's vacant lots. It doesn't look good. And... I see big tractor trailer coming out of that island drive onto Roosevelt, back and forth. They seem to be fine. I mean, these are giant trucks. And um, I don't know the gentleman that owns the, the, the applicant. I do hear um, uh, leaf blowers every morning at 7.30, okay? That guy has that place tight. It, it's, it's, he keeps it immaculate. I don't understand why he hasn't included the lot to the left where that existing parking is behind the, <clears throat> behind the clubhouse. Now that should be, in my opinion, a dog park, a picnic area for the RVers, a fenced in um, common area. Uh, because I never see that parking lot in front of the clubhouse full, even on weekends. It's all, and I look at over that property every day and it's never full the parking lot is empty so i don't know if he wants to go back to the drawing board but i'd include a dog park common area a little parking area uh because that parking lot in my view never gets used um i'm all for this this is an unbelievable opportunity to bring in millionaires, people with lots of money, to spend it here. They're going to spend it somewhere. Tarpon should be taking it and needs it. And I can't think of a better use. It's the highest and best use of that property, in my opinion. And I've been in real estate for 40 years. Okay? Residential, some commercial. That is the highest and best use for that property. Something else comes along, like it's been stated, they can scrape it, put, a, put something else there. But I honestly don't know what it would be in a million years. That's all I got to say. Sir, can you indicate for the record that you've been sworn? Yes, I have. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else for the project? I don't think it's sworn. Sure, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth between before the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners here this evening? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right. My name is Dylan Spaeth, 491 Winthrop Drive, Spring Hill, Florida. Um, as you guys heard before, obviously, um, I'm down there. I'm running the operations of this place. I am down there five days a week, okay? I am the one that's walking that facility. I'm the one that's making sure stuff is right. I'm the one making sure that stuff is obviously appealing to everybody down there, okay? I'm also the one that has to walk over to that exact property every single day and make sure that people who are parked on that side of the road are out of the way and not obstructing any other cars trying to come in and out of that road who are already going down to the sponge docks, okay? And they're using our site and our facility, okay, to park on the easements and the sidewalks, obstructing people even walking on the sidewalks, okay? And they're also using our parking, our parking lots, to park and go down there. On top of that stuff, okay, there are already RVs making their appearance down there already. So essentially we're making on record, if this doesn't happen, that RVers are not welcome. They're already going down there 
and they're using our exact parking spots to go down there, okay? And I get it, okay? I have nothing more than a great respect for the sponge docks and nothing more for the great people and stuff that operate their businesses and stuff down there. And I know a big question is how does this fit in with the historic district and stuff, okay? These people are gonna be coming down here to go and walk through those shops, look at the sponges, look at the sponge boats, learn about the great history of what the sponge docks is, okay? So I guess that's kind of how it fits into that, but we're, we're, we're talking about people coming here who want to experience a place like this, and then we come back to the, pack, or, or come back to the fact of six weeks stay, okay? I'm the one down there managing that stuff, okay? I'm the one that's gonna have to be looking at those reservations. I'm gonna have to be the one that's gonna have to be looking towards that type of stuff, okay? And whether someone stays over six weeks and they go back and come for one day, that's not gonna be allowed, okay? And that's where he was talking about, and excuse, I just don't know your name, but where you have to sit there and you have to manage that property, you have to look at that, but that has nothing to do with, of, of the conditional use of that property. That's how we operate our business, okay? And I guess that comes on to the word of how we operate that business and how we do that stuff is to make sure people don't do that. But we're talking about a livelihood down there of a property that my family has had for seven years and we're being told of what now cannot be put onto it even though it falls into the conditional use of what is allowed there. I don't know what, what, what else can be put down there and how many times we have to come back and keep doing stuff to finally have something be put on a valuable piece of property that at the end of the day, everything gets turned away. And whether what happens on any adjacent properties, again, that's its own entity and its own thing that somebody else has got to deal with, but the, 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 it's fitting into what the community needs. The community needs people that wanna come down here and wanna stay and wanna learn about the history of the sponge docks. And this is, this is a portal to allow them to do that and to stay in this area. And it's just, it breaks my heart to see someone who's worked so hard since I was four years old down there and has this property and is now being told that he can't put something on there because we wanna talk about it being a boutique and how it doesn't fit into those certain things when at the end of the day, those are all just words and grabs no different than anything else that we have out there of how to make it more millennial or, or towards the generation of what everything is going towards. It's just a play on words and it's just ridiculous that we can't look at the the plans and what is actually set for that property and what is allowed in that property when we're talking about stuff that just goes back onto managing the property, of allowing those people of, of, of when they stay and whether they bring a car. I mean, that, that all just comes on to managing the business. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that has uh, comments for the project? Okay, um, I'm gonna wait until the end for the remote access. Um, to go both ways on that one. So let me get on those that have anything to say that are not supporting the uh, conditional use application. If you can come forward. Mayor, can we just extend the meeting just in case we don't? Uh, just anyone that doesn't support the conditional use uh, application, please come forward. Mayor. Mayor. Can we extend the meeting to, since we're going to be coming? Extend. Can we extend the meeting since we're going to be coming close to it? I'm sorry? Extending the meeting? Time. Is it that time already? Close. Well, we've got time. You think we okay. can finish in 12 minutes? No. Um, thank you <laughs> both. Um, yeah. Um, just hang on, uh, Craig. Um, Motion to extend the meeting to 1130. Second. Yeah. Okay. Roll call. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I guess. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, who's first? Is that it for both of y'all? All right. <laughs> Hi. Craig Lunt, 743 Chesapeake Drive. Uh, good evening. It's turning into a long one, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so I know this is quasi-judicial, obviously, um, and it should be fact-oriented rather than an opinion. So what I'm gonna do today is give you some facts that probably haven't been investigated um, as deeply as they could have been, or even mentioned, and you know me, that's 
That's kind of what I do. So as far as ingress and egress analysis, everybody's been talking about the roundabout. That's not the only road that they're going down. They're going down Dodecanese. They're going through the roundabout, down Island Way. And if you believe the directions on some of this stuff, they're going up Island Way, turning left on Roosevelt, so they can again try to get north or east, rather, on Dodecanese. Um, so that's what they've, they've suggested, the anticipated travel route for the guests accessing the site is going to be. Um, 16 spaces, low traffic generation, that's all facts as stated. Um, so as I understand it, and, and maybe uh, Major Ruggiero, or excuse me, <laughs> I'm not going to get used to it, um, can correct me on this, the, the generally accepted vehicle width, I'm not talking about length of vehicles, I'm talking about widths of vehicles, is limited to uh, eight feet on roads that are less than 12 feet wide. Well, guess what? There's a lot of less than 12 foot wide roads. I'm talking about lanes per road. So um, more specifically as it pertains to RV types, um, section, this is state code 320.01, says a recreational vehicle type unit when traveling on a public roadway in this state must comply with the length, and we've got all that sort of stuff to talk about, and width positions of section 316.515. Now 316.515 says the width limitation is going to be 100, cannot exceed 102 inches. So 102 inches, for those of you who can't do quick calculations, eight and a half feet. That doesn't include the mirrors. The mirrors can stick out so they can see what's going on. But that's on a road that's got two lanes going both ways, 12 feet wide. We don't have any of those in that area. And they're not platted that way. Um, some of them are a little wider than most. I physically went down and measured them, down Dodecanese, down Island Way, and they do not meet these specifications. So we're either going to permit them or not permit them. Now, according to state code, you're allowed to, and the way the code read it actually is, I'm going to say encouraged, to restrict access to certain vehicles based on widths exceeding 96 inches or 8 feet if the roadway is less than 24 feet wide. So rather than all this length stuff and will it get around the corner and stuff, they may not get down the road, especially not in tandem. I was there yesterday while I was measuring this stuff. One of these large tour buses came down. Um, I was right behind him, all the way down Dota Canise. He was right on the center line with his wheels, never mind his mirror. If there was another one coming up Dota Canise, there's no way they were passing each other. It just would not happen. Now, fortunately enough, he was able to go around the turnabout, which actually kind of amazed me, but but that's just a fact. Um, so those are the facts on the width problem. We have more information on that. Um, if you take a look at the site plans. Uh, as that, that was your time. Yeah. Already? Um, I know, it goes Did quick. The, Can you all oh. indicate for the record that if you were sworn? Can, Pardon me? Oh, somebody's giving you their time. Okay. Ms. Joy, and all right, I'm okay. Thank you. Um, so let me talk fast. I guess I'm not used to oh, hang a four on. minute period. Just for everybody's knowledge, on this part of the discussion for public comments, you get four minutes, and then someone can give up an additional two minutes of their time, but they don't get they they relinquish their right to make any comments. So proceed. Okay. So the the point I'm getting at here is somebody needs to take a more detailed engineering look, engineering look at the streets that they're actually going to be on and see if these vehicles are safe to be continually going down there. Um, with the site plan for Island Drive there, 
where they've actually stated that we're going to get new asphalt and new concrete curbs and so forth. No mention of who's doing that, so I assume they are. But at one point, the actual road is restricted to 17.8 feet, which is well below 20 feet. I have no idea, and this is by their little off-road thing, I have no idea how a vehicle is going to make it down there and have any other vehicle get up the road. So this is my major point with, with that. Um, I have some confusion about whether or not uh, the parking situation, because it's in the site plan, it's part of the lot, it's one of the things being taught, but so it should be all the parking spots in that particular lot are included in the site plan. And then doesn't the Tarpon or the Tarpon Turtles Clubhouse have to have a certain amount of minimum parking? How, how did, that needs to be resolved a little bit better than it has been. Sorry for rambling on here. And just state for the record that you were sworn in for your uh, testimony. I was sworn in. Thank you. <clears throat> so, public comments, please, for anyone that uh, is against the uh, application. Uh, Tina Pupavalos, I, I am sworn in. Um, so, uh, first, I do understand this is quasi-judicial and must abide, you must abide by existing codes, but I'm going to start with the bottom line. If you approve an RV park, uh, which is essentially a campground, right next to our most famous historic district, you would be partially destroying Greektown's historical and cultural character, which is why people remain living in Greektown and why people come to visit. And if our municipal codes allow an RV park in a downtown and historic area with only minor conditions, then you need to seriously assess whether our codes are doing right by this city. I don't, I'm not sure that they are. So the proposed RV park is across the street from the National Register listed Greektown Historic District and one block away from the Greektown residential area beginning on Hope and Cross Streets. In fact, it's closer to the residential area than it is to the commercial area. Those are the people it's going to affect. And we are struggling to maintain the district's historic character, which is what keeps residents and attract the tourists. So an RV park abutting the district is inappropriate. Moreover, the consultants, the Stantec study and report for the Greektown vision plan is in process and is expected this month. And there were many suggestions at public meetings for closing dodecanese on a regular basis, as it is already closed frequently for events or because of flooding. And, and what's more, this, that study is going to be important because it's going to include this area and what would be appropriate for it for the future. Another problem, the, app, the application, the, the travel route. You know, it simply doesn't include the information that this is a narrow, congested street. I mean, so narrow, as you heard that Craig Lunt just talk about. And there are going to be problems with cars going both ways down that street. There's going to be even more trouble when it's flooded. And Roosevelt and Dota Canis, as we all know, flood frequently and increasingly. The alternative routes, if they need to get out, they're down the tiny little streets of Greektown, which may not be sufficient to accommodate these very large vehicles. And you might also want to investigate the financial and municipal services, service consequences um, when that floods, because local RV parks like Sherwood and Caladesi, RV parks in Palm Harbor, have flooded badly and in recent years, and that, right next to the water, you know it's going to flood. That area constantly floods. I mean, and, and that pretty much already came out. So who, what's the, what is going to be the city's responsibility and financial responsibility for this park when that happens? Um, now, I know that staff posited that it, we need more accommodations for people and that this would allow short stay accommodations with minimal site improvements and could serve as a redevelopment site in the future. So it allows 
possibly long-term low-cost stays for a minimal number of people, which won't have that much benefit for the docs. Also, why are we planning for just now? The whole point of the Greektown Vision Plan is to plan for the future, not just what we can do right now, but what's going to make the most sense for the future. So I have to say, the property owner seems to be a competent businessman, but I have to question the wisdom of the decision to buy land that floods frequently, and then, and then expect the city to also accept development inappropriate by, right by a historic district. RV parks are not normally located in downtown areas and historic districts by historic districts. That's not right by historic preservation standards. And why should the Greek town residents who are nearby the park, a block away, and the other blocks, and those things will be going through the area, why should we suffer, suffer the consequences of a personal pursuit of greater wealth when there's minimal financial rewards for the city. What we really need again are, is a small hotel. Um, so Marcus, uh, Ann Samarcus so is dedicating, donating the two minutes. Go ahead. Ms. We Dr. need Ruth to Morales. look out for the common good and not just, you know, one or two people's personal financial rewards. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, or good night, actually. I'm Carl Wagon 498 South Highland Avenue here in Tarpon, and I have been sworn in. When I addressed the uh, Planning and Zoning Board uh, at the, their hearing on this, I introduced myself as being neutral, and I think I still remain that way. I think that, uh, as one gentleman said earlier, uh, it could be that a highest and best use for this property is an RV park, as it may continue to be as we continue to suffer the effects of global warming and rising ocean levels. I have a concept that says someday all the waterfront coastal high hazard area property in Florida will be zoned for RV parks so they can get the hell out of there when the storms come. Aside from that, I, uh, my wife and I have been traveling in an RV for about three months every summer since about 2008. As I calculate it, we have, uh, we have spent a thousand uh, nights at least uh, living in our motor home in various places around the country. We've got uh, a whole lot of experience and that experience leads me to question a comment or a statement that was made in uh, the letter from uh, Northside Engineering as was stated at the, tier, this is a quote, as was stated in the TRC meeting, most customers would not be bringing a vehicle to the site, only an RV. That is not my experience, having been a thousand nights in campgrounds with a bunch of other people. From my experience, I would say about 75% of the motorhomes do have a second vehicle with them, whether it was towed or it was driven independently. Those that don't have them are typically uh, conversion vans or people camping in tents. They don't need a second vehicle because their, their vehicle is what they came in. Uh, so I would, uh, I would ask you to, as a result, uh, deny the, uh, the warrant for the parking waiver. And uh, hopefully that would uh, result in a little bit less intense use of the entire site. A great, a great concern of mine, though, is the density of the RV sites in the two parcels. I'm going to cut right to the chase here. I did some research, and yes, I'm the one that called uh, the Department of Health. And I made sure that you were... Mr. Wagon you, you do Mr. need Mr. to Wagon address... Four. Yes, sorry, please sorry. address the commission. Thank okay. you. I'm sorry. Um, at any rate, Florida Department of Health regulates many aspects of RV park design, including the specification from Florida Administrative Code 64E-15.002, entitled Sites, Mobile Home, Lodging, and Recreational Vehicle Parks. A, each recreational vehicle space shall, not may, shall contain a minimum of 1,200 square feet. As I reviewed the site plan of this place, uh, the largest site being 54, B, 
feet by 20 feet wide, which includes both the, the paved area 10 feet and the grass area next to it. That comes to um, 1,080 square feet. So their biggest site doesn't meet minimum requirements. And it goes all the way down to a 32 feet by 20 feet or 640 square feet site. Again, totally out of compliance. Uh, it's not your role to enforce the Florida Department of Health rules. That's their job. <coughs> but I would appreciate it if you would put a, a, an additional condition, if you decide to approve this, so that it, additional condition being to receive a copy of the permit that Mr. Spaeth claims that he received a few days ago from the Florida Department of Health. And I'll end it there. If you have any questions of me, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Any questions for Joe? No. Thank you, Mr. Wagenfor. Good evening, everybody. My name is Annette Alexia Parr, 817 Gulf Road, Tarpon Springs, and I have been sworn in. Um, I don't have anything written down, so it's just from my head, from my heart. My family, and I've repeated this probably before, been here six generations. So um, we've loved and protected this town for that many years, and we will continue. Um, there's a reason that there is no hotels down there is because our town has not even thought about even putting something down there. There is residential and our businesses that have been there for generations also. So we need to put hotels and everything on 19 with the 20 um, car washes. Put something on Live Oak. They can still cross the street. They can still spend their time at the sponge docks. And again, Tarpon Springs is my town, but a day or two in Tarpon, you're done. People want to go to Clearwater Beach. They go. They they want to go elsewhere. Um, we're a destination for a few days unless you have family. Uh, everybody wants to live here, but we're just a very few day um, vacation spot. Uh, there's a reason. Another reason um, that uh, we we just don't want any. What about what we bring in there, the more noise? Um, who's going to be monitoring if people, it's like a campground or a, a, it's very close to space. Somebody's going to have their music too loud. Oh, I smell somebody's uh, smoking pot. Oh, somebody's cussing in front of my little kids. So who's going to, so what, we're going to have the cops coming down there for stuff like that? And, and, and it, it's just not a place for RV. And what, they're gonna come six weeks and what, move for a few days and then come back like we said? It, um, it's, it's just not for Tarpon. Um, protecting our town and our, our residents and our businesses. And if it's a problem of our trucks going back and forth when, and, and the smell and the diesel and the uh, direction of everybody coming this way, having two, I mean, we're going to have two of them coming across uh, side by side, that won't happen. Um, down Hope Street, down Athens Street, we just don't need that in our town. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parr. Are there any other public comments? Uh, Relax 514 Ashland Avenue. I resent the fact that we have to state whether we're for or against the project. I just would like to point out some facts. Uh, Bruno Ariola from DRMP on Monday, March 18th at 1.55 p.m. sent this information through. And it's about the turning rate. It says, we looked at the most common traffic movements for this roundabout based on the location of the pro proposed RV site, which are westbound to southbound through movement from Dodecan East Island Drive and northbound to eastbound. Results are as follows. 30-foot RVs can make all three movements. 45 RV, 
foot RVs can make the westbound through movement and the northbound to eastbound movement, but will barely make the westbound to southbound movement. RV move, towing a boat can make the westbound through movement and the northbound to eastbound movement, but cannot make the westbound to southbound movement. What's interesting is if there's something on Dodecanese going on, like a festival or an arts and crafts festival for three days, and as the applicant says, most of his people will be coming in on the weekend, that means they're gonna have to come up Roosevelt. And there's nothing in this study saying what the navigation potential is northbound to westbound to get onto Island Drive, and that's your tightest turn. That's the tight turn coming all the way around. That's the same thing as the westbound to southbound, just from the other angle. Now, I want to talk about specifics as the site plan. Now, if we could, I'd like to go back to the site plan here and re re reference the turning movements. Now, when you look at this, can we get the, if possible, can I get uh, CS2 or the, the diagram for the turning movements? But basically, the way this project is designed is you're coming in, Dodecanese coming around the island, looping around, and then to exit, you're going to come out and go out to Roosevelt. Now, as an experienced camper, I've been camping since April of 2021 now. And the design of this park is not what is typically designed for RV parks. If you go to an RV park or a state park, most of them have loops. So you loop around and you go past your site and then you back in. This is not the 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 transit thing, but if you look at this one, they show you backing in. But to get into the back one, if you're pulling in straight going in there, there's nowhere to make the loops to get to the back parcels. And also on the lower site, the same thing for the upper parcel up in the corner and the two corner parcels there. So the, the site itself is deficient. Lastly, I would like to go back to what the mayor was talking about, the underground vaults and the water levels. What was mentioned earlier is as these sites are fully, each site is individually electric, water, and as he mentioned, sewers. Now, the way these work, these RVs and campers, you've got anywhere from a 5 to a 15-foot plastic tube about this big around. You hook up to your, your uh, drain part, and then you run it to the valve or to the opening where the sewer is. Now, most parks, you got a dump station, so you don't have individual dumping. But this park wants 16 individual dump sites. What's going to be concern of mine is one, the sanitation aspect, if they're not properly secured, two, when you know when they're being used, because what happens, these people come and they just leave it hooked up. If they're there a week, two weeks, three weeks, that stuff is just flowing through just like a regular drain pipe. You get some rain, you get some activity that dislarges it, you possibly have some sewage discharge. The other thing aspect is when you have flooding, you're gonna flood those vaults, you're gonna have water backing up. You've got electrical supplies at each of these locations. What potential electrocution risk do you have when you get water backing up to where these sites are, because usually it's just a post out of the ground where you plug in to a plug. There's can, a lot more you, going on than has been discussed. Can you state for the record that you were sworn, please? Yes, I was, dear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other public comments of anyone that's here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? Um, Ms. Jacobs, no emails. Okay. Um, Mr. Spate, you have an opportunity to rebut anything that was said? Uh, there were quite a few things said. Um, all I can say is, you know, what I've told you is in good faith of trying to do something right down there with a piece of property that I've found no no ability to do anything else with at this point, as well as if I were to bring a townhome project or condominiums or whatever down there, same situation with traffic, with flooding, you name it, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, yes, I do have the assigned approved permit from Florida Department of Health showing that 
with the site plan that it does meet their criteria for the administrative code of each site meeting that. So you guys are more than welcome to it. That will be given if things move through tonight uh, when I submit for um, basically the building permit. Uh, and I don't really think I have anything else to add at this point. Okay. Um, is Vincent closing summation? I have nothing to add to the... Nothing? No. Did you want to say something? I do. So before um, you close the public hearing and, and bring it to the board for discussion, um, I just want to remind the board of who is a witness and who is not a witness, right? So everybody sitting up here, you, you know, whatever comments you make um, are your comments for discussion and deliberation and opinion, right? But the witnesses are the people who, who testified and were sworn, and I will say that that includes my comments. So I do appreciate, um, you know, that the, the questions you were trying to ask me, but I am not a witness. I give legal advice, okay? And, and that is my role. So anything that I say should also not be considered as testimony. It should be considered as legal advice. And I, I think what you're, let me just add for clarification, I can't say in the discussion, well, you know, I, I agree with Commissioner Eisner because he said so-and-so, and, and, and that's different than what the, uh, is that correct? I'm, I'm sorry I used you, but <laughs> not I'll necessarily allow you, you to agree with me, though. Yeah. I always agree with you, but um, is that what you You cannot saying? rely on, the, on what somebody said who is not a witness, correct. Okay. It, right. it is for deliberation and, and discussion and persuasion. Okay. All right. Um, let me let me just let me start this off because I've been starting them off all night. Um, I we're closed the public yes. uh, meeting. Okay, so now what we're going to do is have a discussion among the commissioners, and then there will be a motion and a vote of uh, of some time. And um, I, I'm not against the project per se. I, I'm not. I, I think maybe there's room for an RV park, and the way I see it. Um, um, the, um, if there's a need for it, it'll, it'll continue. If there's not a need for it, you're not going to have it open because it's simply not working for you. That's pr pretty much my philosophy on all the, 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 uh, the businesses that we have in town. Um, the problem I've always had is just the details that I've been asking tonight with regard to drainage. Um, I, I see that we're increasing the, the, actually I went back and looked at it, we're increasing the elevation about three feet on the properties and, and that's something I, I did not catch, I should have, and I would have certainly asked a little more uh, information from our staff concerning that. Also um, regarding the, um, 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 I, I, uh, regarding the um, uh, drainage itself, I, I would have liked to have gotten some additional information, just the comments from the, uh, um, from our drainage engineer with regard to what his view is and, and everything that was stated uh, this evening. The, um, I do have concerns about flooding, uh, but, but maybe the, you know, maybe our drainage engineer could help us with this. The, um, um, as far as the, um, there is a little inconsistency that I see with regard to um, the traffic in terms of, uh, we do have damage to the, the, the roundabout from just, you know, it just happens. I'm not going to tell you who's at fault, but it just happens. So I would try and, and prevent that from happening. There's a whole lot of nuances that go along with, with uh, larger vehicles down to the uh, down to sponge docks, and we've learned to live with them. And, and even the neighborhoods have learned to live with them. Most of the routes that you see when they, I, I live down there, and I don't have an issue with them because I know the businesses need them. <laughs> Hellas's main, main route for their large trucks is right down Spruce Street. Uh, it's actually angled at the correct way to go out Athens Street out to um, alternate 19. So these guys that come down there all the time, they know their route and they, they know when, what time of day they should go and everything else. It's not like anybody that comes here for a visit on, a, on an occasion uh, to see that. Um, I, I think, uh, I, and again, I'm not against the, um, uh, the, the uh, project per se, 
But for me, I, I do need some additional information along the lines that we discussed. I wouldn't, I would like to see the um, engineers, our engineers, staff drainage engineers comments on that. And I would also follow up with some additional questions concerning the height uh, of, uh, and it is a conditional use. Uh, that's the other part of it is that we need to be very careful. Once we say yes, to your project, it's not easy to go back and say, well, um, you know, we can't, we, we made a mistake. Um, we could put that into the conditional use, but generally we don't do that to revisit that in a year or five years. We just want to make sure we do a thorough job on it. Um, I'm not, for me tonight, so everybody knows, I'm not prepared to deny the project out of hand. I'd like to have some additional information um, and, and um, 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 on the other hand, if, if the majority of the commission doesn't want to support it tonight, um, I, I do know that there's a reapplication process as well. So, I, but I guess the main point is I'm not ready to approve the conditional use based on, on just what I've heard this evening. Again, it's not an issue on the RV aspect of it. It's more of the details that, that have to be considered. Uh, your, your your Approval from the state would have been very helpful and extremely uh, supportive of your application, by the way. <coughs> but that's a little, that's a, 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 a discussion for a different day. Um, that's what I had to say, uh, Commission, uh, Vice Mayor Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I'm not against the project as well. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, as, as everybody's aware, there's a quasi-judicial hearing. As a quasi-judicial hearing, um, if you fit the criteria, it's something that you're entitled to have. Where my issue comes in is how big the units are that are coming down the streets. So um, earlier I was only allowed to ask questions, and that's what I did. But I did pull, and now I want to give you some information. Um, I pulled all the national parks in the United States, and there are 30. And these are all locations that are designed for RVs. That's what they're made for. And each one has its own, I'll stay close to the mic. Um, we have, and I don't want to give you the names. I have this if you want to see it. But it's 35 feet max, 30 feet max, 40 feet, 50 feet, 24, 28, 25, 40, 45, 25, 50, 30, 24, 23, 25, 35, 35, 46, 27, 21, 24. Um, one has no limit. Another one has no limit. Um, then it has an average of 40 feet but it ranged from 25 to 50, and Yosemite is 40 feet. So it, it's a wide variety of items, but none of these items sit at the end of the sponge docks, and that's my drawback. So most of the parks that I pulled the information, it's 35 feet, some allow 42. That was the synopsis of the average. The average national park, as I said earlier, was 27 feet. But all of them, and I mean all of them, have an age of no more than 10 years. And they have something called the Airstream 10, which, because Airstreams are an older fashion RV, and you, you don't know by an Airstream how old they are, but none of them allow anything in there longer than 10 years. Um, and appearance is a very important thing. The other big drawback that I have on this is the time of stay. Um, I did pull that information as well, and that information says most, if not all, do a 14 days, which is two weeks, with a three-day leave. Um, I'm in favor of that as well. I'm a little bit flexible if the board decides to extend that a little bit or even shorten it. Uh, again, I'm not, I, I, I'm okay with an RV park where it is. I just think it has to fit. The other thing I would like to do is um, I may want to defer this 
or table it, whichever way we dis decide, because of some of the comments about if the sponge docks are closed, and a lot of times they're closed for two days, um, and you might have a two-day with flooding, how else do you bring the RVs in but through, you know, routes that are, are the roads are 17 feet, 18 feet, and we need 24 feet. We run into the same exact problem over at uh, this, the uh, Craig Park with, track, with trailers that bring their boats there. So <clears throat> these are some of the things that um, I, I also want, one more thing I wanted to mention. We've been talking back and forth about boutiques, boutique <coughs> RVs and all that stuff. I looked it up. There is um, a lot of things that are claiming boutique RVs, but there's no definition of what it is. I mean, you could claim yours as a boutique RV because you have a pool. Some people claim it's a boutique RV because they charge more. There's no real, um, you know, definition of boutique. Um, I know that came from the boutique hotel, but what we w asked for with the boutique hotel was 50 rooms, and we got all kinds of things that were different than 50. Um, I know there was also a comment about um, our Air Airbnbs, but we have a minimum of six weeks for an Airbnb. So it's opposite to what we're, what the request is for a RV. And an RV, your, your, your maximum was six feet, uh, six weeks, sorry. And for our Airbnbs, it was a minimum of six feet, six weeks. So I just want you to know that there was a big difference. There was a lot of things said here. So I'm trying to compile some of the things. Um, I would really be concerned about, and I know those streets, uh, during the shows when we do have Dodecanese closed, um, people are parked all over, and I know they're parked all over your property as well. It boggles my mind to think how a large RV is going to come down that street and get into the location. I know that our police will be constantly called to be towing people away. <clears throat> so again, I'm not against the RV. I'm not against what you want to do with your property. Um, but I think there has to be some sort of conditions uh, that are different than the um, quasi-judicial part of it. The quasi-judicial part of it, I didn't really see any criteria that would uh, deter me from voting for an RV. So that's where I'm at. Okay. Ms. Jacobs, we need to extend the time. May I have a motion to extend the time in a second? Motion to extend the meeting to 1230. Second. 12 uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Donato? No. Yeah, turn your mic on. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vaticotis? Yes. Um, okay. Um, Commissioner Koulianis, go ahead. Okay. So when I first heard about this uh, RV park, you know, I, I actually it was my friend Craig who brought it to my attention. Um, you know, I had, I had, I went back and forth. I had mixed feelings, and I still have mixed feelings. Um, one is, I, it's a, a decent, a good use of the property, right? It, it's not, um, it's adjacent to your marina. It fits, um, you know, people are bringing their boats, they're coming there, um, they're hauling their boats sometimes to come to your marina. Um, they're, you know, those, and they have oftentimes large trucks that are pulling large boats, so they're very long. And, and I think like um, the former vice mayor said that it's maybe not an issue of length as it could be an issue of width. Um, and then the other thing is that I, I thought it's, it sounded attractive is that it gets us the hotel effect without, um, without a structure, right? So we, we get the effect of having a small boutique hotel, people coming, staying, eating in the restaurants, going shopping, um, and using tarpon as a, 
a, a place to, um, as a home port, to go out and visit the, uh, the Tampa Bay area. So I, I think it's, from that regard, you know, every, the, many of the merchants during the whole hotel uh, discussion, you know, this gives them at least more people staying there and uh, doing that. And, and I think that, you know, uh, Ed, you, it, like the uh, Commissioner DiDonato said, it does matter that it's you. And if it wasn't you, I wouldn't even be on the fence on this. But the fact that it's you and that you have added a lot to the commerce of that area, uh, all the people that have their boats at your marina, uh, I'm sure have helped, you know, the, the restaurants and the, and the commerce of the, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, sponge dock area. And for that, you should be commended. And uh, I, I do that at this point, I, I do commend you. Um, you know, the vehicle size, like uh, Vice Mayor Eisner said, um, they're not professional drivers. You know, we do have professional drivers that come down with the, the commercial vehicles and, you know, the RV people with, again, with a 45 foot, um, RV and, you know, 56 feet with the Holland. And I mean, it could be me. I could, I could go get me one of those and be driving it tomorrow and I have no clue what I'm doing. So, um, and then, you know, the routes um, going, you know, again, I, you know, I'm, 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 you can't get away from who you are in your own perspective I'm thinking if I'm living there and they're coming down to Athens, it concerns me. <coughs> but vehicles come down Athens. They're coming down, big trucks are coming now. Now, if we approve this, are we just exacerbating a problem that already exists? You know, that may be the case. Um, but here's the thing that, that bugs me the most is we bought, the city bought a 1.8 acre parcel. And one of the things that was discussed with the use of that parcel was parking. And we could put 100 plus parking spots on Roosevelt. And now I wanna ask the city attorney, can we regulate what vehicles go to that parking spot? to that parking lot? If it's open to the public, it's open to the public. Yeah, so if somebody has an RV. If it's a legal in, drivable haul a, vehicle. Haul in a parked. car, they could go to that parking lot, right? Correct. And we could have 100 spots there. And easily there could be 10, 12 of those vehicles there because all those vehicles that he showed us in this, in this report are going down to the docks, right? And they could go to that parking lot. So we we are buy, we have bought property with the intent with one of the intentions. I heard that during all the conversation that it would be a parking lot. And if it is a parking lot, they're going to be coming down there anyways, whether they're staying at his place or going just to park there and hang out. And and so we've already <laughs> have that set. I think um, the concerns that former Vice Mayor Lunt said. Uh, with the, the width on, um, what's the name of the, uh, the uh, what's the name of the road? Um, the road that it's going to be on. What is, island. What, island, right. So that's concerning. Now, whether that's going to get widened by, as part of this project, I don't know. Okay. And what Tina Bukavalis said, it resonates with me as well. We are doing a Greek town plan study that we haven't yet worked through. Um, 
that could end up either making this park feasible or not feasible. The mayor brought up some points that need research. Um, and then the vice mayor brought up the fit criteria as an important thing. And, and I don't think we have enough information to recognize right now whether it fits or not. So I would like to I would like to table this. Let's wait to hear, yeah. Commissioner. That's where I'm heading. Yeah, that's a good okay. comment. I'm heading toward yeah. uh, approval on of tabling this, working through the technical issues that you discussed, the issues that the former vice mayor brought up, and it may need to be tabled till the, the strategy and plan has been completed. And then we see if this fits in to the whole idea of what we want to do down there. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Let me get commissioner. I just want to make a clarification. If Go ahead, and clarify. So I need to make a clarification of what uh, the commissioner just spoke about. Um, you can't compare a RV pl uh, park where you plug in to where they can park for the day, even though I know that's what you said, as far as we bought something where an RV can pull in but they're there for the day and they're gone. It, that's, it's like a car. Um, it's not plugged in, it's not uh, into electricity, it's not plugged into the sewer system, it's just there for the day. That's what- Can I comment? That's for that. So my name. Sorry, <laughs> No, I, can I comment since he mentioned- Mayor, Let him go. I, can I comment since you yes, mentioned yes, my name? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. You two are having fun right. over there. <laughs> no, uh, Vice Mayor, what I was referring to is the size of vehicles going down there. I wasn't talking about how long they stay or what amenities yeah. they're using. I'm just saying we, we couldn't stop big vehicles from going down and we'd actually be encouraging them if that's where the parking lot is, they're all gonna be going down there to park and they're all gonna be going down around the roundabout and, and going into that space. And that's what I was talking about. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Cuyas. Uh, let Commissioner DiDonato speak if he, if he would like to say something first. I think I've said my piece. I, I uh, wouldn't be against tabling it. I, I, I do, however, feel that uh, it meets the conditional use. We're going to get some help from Ms. Kardash when we get to that point. Go ahead, Commissioner Cuyo. <coughs> I'm not one of those people who are going to sit there and tell you I haven't made my decision yet or this needs to be, there's more information that needs to be gathered. I'm going off what you presented here tonight. I don't care about your prior work, and that seems to be the problem. That's one of the reasons why I ran for office. Too many people's past work and you know their who they knew in town, and you know well that stuff ended. That's why there's no more recusals. That's not. That's why we look at each situation as independent as possible. So it's not who you know or what you've done. It's the application you present and how it affects the community. And the way I look at it, sir, I asked you several different questions, so many different ways, um, really addressing your planning and zoning speech as well as up here, and you fumbled big time. A lot of the words that you said, a lot of the statements you said, you just didn't match up. And so we're talking about big changes in this community and Conditional uses are conditional uses. I don't care if they're 30 years ago or today. And you start setting precedents in areas, well, guess what? We're gonna allow you to have um, a conditional use for your overnight stay. So then how are we gonna say no to Mosquitos and that property down there? How are we gonna say no to Miss Severus and that property? How are we gonna say no to the Villaracuses or the Bolerises or the Hulises? when they got parking all in that same area just to appease you and change the actual characteristics and romance of the sponge docks. I will not sell out. And I don't care if some people wanna sit up here and tiptoe around and they wanna say, oh, well, I'm ready to come back and review this. I don't care about the traffic in the turns. It doesn't fit what you're trying to put in there. You're trying to put overnight stay 
in a person's personal vehicle, RV. It's not an overnight stay in a structure that you don't own as a hotel, a motel, an Airbnb. And so throwing in that word, that semantics of short-term stay doesn't match or fit that application. And number two for the criteria, I just want to go over this again so uh, people understand. The proposed use is appropriate to the property in question and compatible with the area. So the short-term stay, and you even said it, sir, it was the first time that was being presented, not only to the area, but to the sponge docks. And uh, I'm disappointed in the PNZ board. I'm not gonna lie. There, there, there are a few people who are lifelong Tarpanites. They claim to have the romance for town and, you know, but they contradict themselves so many times on different applications that it's concerning. It really is. And there are some people who have been, haven't been in town enough where they really don't know the history. And so for those who have been in town long, long enough and you're on these boards and you have the ability to, to sway a vote and make decisions and push boards in certain directions, I suggest you do so. But that PNZ board, they're not in connection with us. And all they had to go do is look back at the hotel and, and other uh, properties to get an idea of how this board thinks. And so we're up here to weigh and balance. That's what we were elected to do. So we can talk about how the conditions and the uh, uses are acceptable or not, but, but those are words and opinions and we were elected to weigh and make those decisions and back them up, which we fully do. And so, as I stated, I hope there wasn't any pressure. We, we, we had two commissioners bring up, oh, your weight, your experience brings weight. We had some other people in the planning and zoning board mention that. That's not right to me. And I will never make decisions on that. The special area plan. There's one word that strikes me and it's not area and it's not plan, it's special. And there's nothing about that application that you're presenting to us that makes it special enough to allow the conditional uses you're requesting for to allow that project. And then what? We're gonna have future board's hands tied, bound behind their hands when other attorneys and applicants come through on properties in the SDB uh, area and the T5C and other parts of the, the special area plan come through with their big wig attorneys and say, hey, you set the precedent over there. We want the parking lots filled up. So next thing you know, you look down the Vicanese 10, 15 years from now, and you see RV parks covered. You won't even be able to see the water. And for what? Because we're selling out who we are as a history, as a culture, as a community. That's why I'm so thankful I'm on this board right now and I can see how people are gonna vote and we can hold them accountable to it because that's culture killers. That's community. You know, that history in that place is gonna far exceed all of us. And I'll tell you what, I'm not gonna allow any application, especially the way that was presented, to come back and, and for me to look at it, you're gonna have to bring a lot of different uh, facts and evidence to the case. Uh, be more prepared, sir, for as knowledgeable you claimed you were as an RV expert. You didn't answer too many questions as an expert. And so, and another thing, that, that was not the first marina that's built in the sponge docks. If you look right across the street, as one commissioner stated, you have Captain Jack's, you have, um, Bell Harbor's a little bit more down, but you have other marinas in the sponge docks. It's not the first one. And so the vision plan, we're gonna wait for this vision plan. I'm in no rush. If some of these people wanna make some decisions and, and go against it and, you know, make some very important decisions that are gonna mess up this town for 10 to 15 years, that's all it takes. 
the domino effect, but you probably don't care. Maybe some of these people don't care. They don't really have any ties back to the, the, the historical town or perspective or love for the town. I don't know, but I didn't sign up for that. I hope some of you guys, we can get on board with this. I'm not interested to hear, as the evidence was presented to us tonight, to go back and table it. This needs to end and you need to wait. And when you're ready to present something to us that makes sense, then that's okay. But as far as what you're presenting, first time ever, and we're gonna approve that, I'm not setting that precedent. And so just wanna make sure I have anything else I wanna say, because I wanna be very clear. <coughs> Um, Commissioner DiDonato, you had your comment. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Kulianis, your light is on. Uh, say one thing. This board and many of the past boards have made conditions of transferability of projects. And we have put store in who is building a project and who was managing a project. And we have put um, conditions that it's not transferable to another owner. We've done that on multiple occasions. No, we haven't. So, um, you know, one of the concerns that I had, and I, I voiced it, uh, uh, I asked Ms. Kardash today, and I, and I apologize for not giving her more time to properly research it, was, was twofold. Um, one is that, and this is something we have to think about for even future projects, where we have um, faith in an owner, faith in the project as, as, as brought forward, but we don't want it to be transferable. And in this case, one, the, question, the reason I asked the question about that there were multiple entities, corporate entities that were on this property. If, if you say that, um, you know, let's say Mike Geisner is gonna to build a, uh, we're giving him conditional use to do some, pro, to, to do some project. And we have faith in him. He's, come before us, we, he's, we feel he's capable of managing that project well, but we don't want him to sell that to somebody else because we don't know who that other person is going to be, whether they have the same, because uh, remember we did that with, remember the, the, do, the lady with the dogs, remember? It was, it was contingent that it only be her because we knew she was properly trained. We didn't want her <clears throat> selling that dog uh, business to somebody else who didn't have her credentials. So the, it wasn't transferable. So we've done that before. So the, one of the con concerns I have is that if, if you approve something, it's in a corporation and they sell the stock of the corporation, so the owner is still the corporation, then that would get around something right. like that, right? So if you have multiple corporate owners, we have to be concerned. So I know, I know in corporate, uh, in, in uh, business practice, you, you can have conditions where you say, if 51% of the, of the interest in the stock changes, that's considered a change of ownership that would trigger that event. Um, the other thing is, the, when we talked about conditions, about, yeah, I mean, again, and I don't, I, I'm in, not to make any comments on uh, the other commissioner's uh, highbrow uh, approach to everything. Um, the, uh, you know, things that we want to, and sometimes we want to test drive up things. And in this case, um, we know there's big vehicles going down there. There's, um, you know, again, a parking lot that could have big vehicles going down. We're going to have a hard time managing that. We have this thing. We don't know if it's going to be intrusive or problematic or not problematic. And so we having a condition, but what concerns me is the ability to pull that condition, right? Like if, if, and, and, and in this case, 
it concerns me that if we had to say five years, well, five years of a, of a problem is too long to handle a problem. So um, I think, again, the reason that I would consider tabling is I am not against the concept of the park. I think that it has merit. I think we have too many pieces here that either need to be researched legally, researched on that basis, and I would definitely want to wait for the, the report to come back and so we have a concept of what we're doing down there. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to live there, okay? Yep, sorry. I, no, I'm going to live there. This isn't, this isn't live theoretical. Live. Yeah, of this isn't theoretical. Yeah. My father was born there. My family has always been down there. We've had businesses down there. So to, to make any comments that somehow I don't care, you can, you can take those you know, with you wherever you go. But the, I, we have a duty to hear testimony, make a decision. I do not feel like I, ha I got enough information tonight to approve this. I would, ta I would table it, see if we can get some things answered. If they do, if not, again, we're gonna know more of okay. what we're doing. This is quasi-judicial, so I'm gonna ask Ms. Kardash what our options are in that regard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Uh, unless we're done with comments, commission. Okay, Ms. Kardash, please. Um, so you can approve it with the conditions, with conditions that you have crafted. You can um, deny it and provide the reasons for the denial that it doesn't meet you know, the criteria that you uh, have in your code. Or you can um, table it for the requested information. It is not a deferral because a deferral is the entire hearing going forward. This would be tabling your decision um, so you're not providing uh, a decision on whether it meets or does not meet the criteria. So when, criteria. We, when we bring it back, um, do we start the whole process all over again with Ms. Vincent and the applicant and so forth on new information or? Um, right, and you would want to um, make sure that it references this particular hearing. Okay. I mean, I think that's the fair way to do it rather than just getting the information and going from there. So, right. okay. All right. Um, does anybody have any comments concerning the, the, sure. the approach that Ms. Kardash has laid out? I don't think, Mayor, I don't think anything needs to be tabled. I think there was enough evidence here to, to deny the project. If you guys keep talking about evidence that needs to be brought up or edge it, what is it? What other evidence that needs to be presented that you can't make your decision yet? Because yeah, yeah. there have been a lot of different variables that have been discussed. I don't think this should move any forward. And I don't want to waste their time right now. And then we're going to come back here, do this all over again. And short-term stay in the sponge docks is a situation. And so if you guys want to talk about now what needs to be addressed in the future, bring it up. But you can't just say these vague statements. There's a lot more evidence we need when there's not. They presented their stuff. Oh. I don't think there's enough there. It needs to be turned down and we can move forward. I, I, I do think one thing that uh, needs to happen is there, there needs to be some reconciliation with um, uh, Ms. Vincent and also the applicant as far as exactly the six weeks, what that means. It, again, it's an analogy to something that we have. We don't have an animal in a special area plan call, called an RV or a smart plan. So we just need clarification. So for everybody, and including the commission, they know what that means. And, and uh, it, it, in six weeks, if, if the short-term rental was one month, it would be one month. That's what we would be talking about tonight, but it just happened to be six weeks. So um, I understand what you're saying, Commissioner Kulias. Uh, okay. Um, I'd like, to make, Mayor, a mo I'd like to make a motion to table. You, you shut your light off? I did. I'd okay. like to make a motion to table. Okay, is there a second to that? I'll second it. Okay. 
Is there any discussion, further discussion? Again, I think you guys are just leading on uh, a hope of a situation that's, uh, you guys don't even have a grasp of it, neither does our vision plan, and you're just putting in the situation the character of our charm and the, and the, and the city and the so, people so. that have elected us to make the right decisions on not really changing the quality of life in our town. And so you guys want to table this for another day when I don't think it even needs to be done at this point. So thank yeah. you. Uh, city Manager of course, go ahead. Just two things I want to say and have the attorney help me on it. One thing is we need to determine what the table is. Is it the time to be determined? Right. Um, is it next meeting? Is it what it is? And then the second thing, we need to know what we are what, directed on, what we are bringing back, what we are looking at. We'd have to have all that information of, of what we need to do in the table. And time. That may have a factor on when we're going to table it to, but we've heard table it until the Greek town plan is done. We've heard table. So we just need those two things clarified of, of the time frame and, and what we need to be working on to bring back either with our consultant, with our stormwater, with our, with our uh, people. Engineer. So yeah. uh, good point. So one thing I do want to say is that legally the, uh, the Greek town plan has no effect on this application. Correct. So that's something that you all should understand. You said it does have an effect? It does not. It does not have an effect on this application. Um, the, it, it is not a regulation. Oh, oh, it's not? It's relevant. not a regulation. Okay. It's, not, it's not going to be an adopted regulation um, or, or anything like that. So that's something that you should understand. So you, I would not recommend tabling it based on when you're going to get the, the Greek Town Vision Plan back. So you're looking for something specific as far as a time frame for... Uh... And what you need to bring you from a staff aspect to answer the questions that is causing this why item we, to be tabled. Why don't we do this? Um, rather than continuing to deliberate this tonight, unless Ms. Cardass says you've got to do it, how about if we each commissioner writes down what their concerns are and sends those to... No. You, can't you do have that. no. You need to put it in the motion so it's clear to the applicant, so it's clear to the public. You need okay. to state what the expectations are. All right. Well. Um, so that so would go to the maker of the motion. Right. Ms. We've Ms. got Kern. a motion and a second, but we Commissioner, need. Commissioner Coulias yeah. made the motion, or Coulianos, sorry. Yes, he made the motion. <laughs> He's the troublemaker. Yeah. <laughs> um, made made the motion to table. Um, my understanding based on the conversation is that you want information back um, from legal on uh, the transfer of potential transferability condition, right. correct? Um, that you wanted information on, or more information or clarity on the um, engineering on the stormwater yes. retention. A better, I'd like a better uh, street traffic study, so we know uh, along the lines of the items that former Vice Mayor Lunt presented, um, and yeah, and the and the length of stay. And the length of stay is that a legal opinion that you're looking for for the length of stay? I clarified. Uh, or clarification yeah, from the clarification planning and zoning and, department. And, and uh, a reduction of length this day. Okay. And the other thing is the um, the approval from the state that, that I, I raised it as a dimensional inconsistencies between the Florida Administrative Code and our code, but the applicant has an approval from the state. I don't know that we can ask that for per se, but I think it would be very helpful in support of his application if we were able to at least Ms. Vincent to review it. If he if he chooses to submit that, it is not currently something that is required as part of the application right. packet. Okay. And then you need a time? Yes. So I need a date, mm -hmm. uh, the date and the time. Um, your next three meetings are Tuesday, April 2nd. How, how long out can I go? Just a clarification. 
when you're talking about something, and right now it's vague, I need more clarification what a traffic study is. You're talking about engaging somebody, and that's not an overnight or a two-week process, that's at depending least what this traffic study you want. Well, so when we table it, we table it just to table it. At some meeting, we have to untable it unless we give a, a specific In date. order to table this, as a, you have to do it to a date and time certain. certain okay. And it can't be more than two months from the date of advertising. You can't defer for more than two months without re-advertising it as a conditional use or, or re-noticing. So. Okay. Two months. Hang on, give us. Um, so. you, you, I would also should ask. We take, should we take just a five minute break and let you and, and city manager, of course, put your heads together and, and Ms. Kardashian <coughs> as well? I don't have an issue what time. I just don't want to put you in a, in a challenging I mean, position. The, the, the worst case is we had to have to send out mailed notice again. And, you know, if we're the ones doing the deferring and stuff, it, we're not talking about a lot of money to send out public notices in the mail, even if it's on the city's dime. You're the boss. What mm -hmm. do you want to do? I'm just not, again, depending when you clarify to me what traffic study you want done, that's probably going to be the time frame of when when we can get that done and engage let, in the... Let me clarify. When I, when I say traffic, I'm not, I misuse the word. Okay. I'm talking about street study. That the, the width of these streets to handle those vehicles. So here, here's had, the we problem. Had, we, we had, yeah. we did not have any... Uh, definitive study. We had a, a resident go out and measure on his own and give us give us an, uh, a an interpretation. An interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. I would like that that our I would like our professional staff to do it and know that for sure that that either these amount of vehicles cannot you know transverse on those roads. The of all the if you do this and you identify that type of a deficiency in your road system, it is going to apply to all vehicles, hmm. not just RVs. Sure. It will apply to yes. <laughs> everything and that is photographed in here and, and all of that. I so I just want to be clear about that and but the, the it, road that even, you're walking down. I understand. If, but we're not going to exacerbate a problem if, in fact, we don't have the widths for these, these vehicles then we're not going to, in my opinion, I don't, I wouldn't want to exacerbate the problem, but I'd want to know for sure before we kill a, a project that we know for sure, again, we have uh, an ad hoc study uh, done by a, uh, a resident, but I'd like to have it actually looked at by staff. I think in my terms of what she's saying is you may force us and the police to start enforcing and then the semis and the police. You may force us in a position to stop those. That's um, not, which, that's which not is the not point. No, that's not the point. That's not the point. It's not the point, but that's not something the point, that, but that might be the result. That's the result. That's what I'm trying to say to you. That might be your so, result. So what you're saying is we have roads that are insufficient. We're allowing these vehicles to go up and down, and we're going to kill any project. So how do we, how do we uh, do th build that parking lot back there where we're now inviting all the vehicles that visit the sponge docks to go all the way to the back of the sponge docks area. We're inviting them to go back there. And we're not, and, and they're gonna be RVs. We know RVs are gonna be involved in going back. I just there. wanna explain the cause and effect. You have to understand when you do this, there could be a cause and an effect from it. And that's all I gotta bring out to you. Do what you want, but there's a cause and effect, I think, what you're asking to do. I'd like to add something. If you guys are going to make this motion, which I'm not going to support anyways, I want it to include all historical perspective and history of short-term and overnight stay in the sponge docks in that special area plan. I want all the history about it to be included because that's part of our decision-making process and the character and, uh, of it. But I'm not supporting this uh, tabling. We're wasting the residents' time. Uh, you, you know, we can't even come up with what we really want to come back and table and, and provide more information. We're really wasting their time and we're appeasing to the applicant. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I, I think, 
I think the differences between the vehicles that go down there are there that that's not their that's not their destination. That's the part of their, you know, uh, what would you call logistics, <laughs> and um, and I think what we're talking about is creating a destination for these, uh, a, a des the city actually doing something to create to to make the situation worse. I, it may take some research on your part to kind of, unless you think it's black and white. So I don't want to wind up doing something that's unintended. On the other hand, I completely understand what um, the, the logic behind, we don't want to make a situation any worse either. You know, you're not going to stop a, a large 18-wheeler uh, going down a substandard with road. I mean, we're just not going to do that. But, but that's, the, that's a public road unless, we, uh, unless there's a, um, it, we're not requiring them to go down there. But by approving something, we are requiring them to go down there uh, as a destination, which is, I think, a different, different way of looking at it. It's just an observation. Yes, Vice Mayor Eisner. So the fact that we get this information stops us from having tractor trailers going by, or is it the fact of us restricting his use because of that determination? No, if you're, if what you're saying is that your road is unfit for vehicles of that size, then it's unfit for all vehicles of that size, and it's a problem that you as a city will then have to find a solution to. Well, nobody said it's unfit. It just we wanted to know what sizes they were. So if you're saying, but the underlying reason you're looking to examine the width of the, this, the width of this roadways is to say that it's unfit for these, this size of vehicle is what you're saying. And if it's unfit for this size of vehicle, then it's unfit for all vehicles that size. I'm not sure that that we're making a determination that it's unfit for those vehicles, but we do have situations where the sponge docks streets are closed. And when they're closed, you wouldn't get tractor trailers going by but you could still get RVs going by. I believe at this point it needs to be voted up and then voted down. Thank you. Um, Ms. Vincent um, or Ms. Kardashian, either one of you, uh, can the applicant reapply in, as far as the time frame goes with conditional use? Yes, they, they have the opportunity to resubmit an application if it's denied. How long would that, uh, they have to wait a certain time frame? I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. I, I think I think you have the ability to deny, as a, as a term, is it without prejudice, or just a way to let them reapply sooner without than prejudice. would be statutorily, but I don't know. Hold on. Is that? And there may not be a limit on for a conditional use. That would be use. better for you. Yes. That would be but better for the city manager as well. What was that? I'm sorry. It would just be better for us to do it that way than if we were able to have, reapply. So if you deny it, state the reasons why you're denying it with respect to the information that you feel is missing that does not meet the criteria. So the information that you're discussing that you wanted to see in the table, you would say it didn't contain this information, this information, and this information as part of your denial, and then it gives the clear basis for it, and when they bring the application back, they can address that, and you can rehear everything all at once. I'll withdraw my tabling motion, and I would entertain uh, a motion Six months is that, the has, that has yeah. that criteria. Six months. Any final action for denial shall not have another identical application filed on any part of the subject property for a period of six months from the date of such final action. I think that's good. Identical. That's but hard. Being a key, that's, that, that's, that's a our, hard number. That's our that, conditional use okay. criteria. That's in your code. Okay. So I'll, I'll pull my motion for tabling. 
I'd like to make a motion. Uh, can I, how do you make a, do I, can I make a motion in the negative? No, I don't think so. Make a motion to, I, how, you make it in the positive. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm but I, I, if I'm gonna make a motion. So that, you, yeah, your, the way your rules of procedure are written is that all your motions are supposed to be affirmative motions. Motion right? to approve. So you'd have to. Um, how do I introduce those? Those yeah, that's what I was just wondering. Terms. I don't, I don't see how you would do that. As I suggested, this needs to be voted, voted down, and then I get to this point. We'll see the application, possibly six months. Do a motion. Do do a motion to suspend the rules of the pr procedure so you can make the motion in the negative. No. Okay. I make a motion to suspend the rules of procedure. Second. I'll second. Okay, roll call, please. Uh, well, I, clarification, I didn't hear all of that. Could you repeat it, somebody louder? Uh, so I made a motion to suspend the rules of procedure so I can make a uh, motion in, in the negative. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner DiDonato? Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? No. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Batikiotis? Yes. Okay. Now I'd like to make a motion to deny the, the um, application with the, um, with the, re the reasons, uh, help me with this. Okay. With the reasons mm -hmm. being um, mm -hmm. missing In Insufficient information, information In regarding um, traffic is what I'm hearing. Um, and, uh, Drainage. Drainage and engineering and um, corporate ownership. legal ownership legal, and transfer. Legal ownership. And compatibility to special and area plan, as well as the historical perspective of overnight and short term lodging and stay in the Sponge Dock special area district, character district. All that. Com compatibility. 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 I'll second that. Thank you. Is that sufficient, Ms. Kardashian? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on that item? All right, roll call, please. Commissioner DiDonato? No. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vaticanis? Yes. Do you, I know it's after the agenda item, but do you, do you understand what we're trying to do is just to get some additional information so you can, okay, well, Ms. Vincent can explain that to you or, or the city manager for that matter. So I think um, okay, we've got one last item, and then we've got a CRA meeting. Thank you. We get the item. Okay. Item 11, Ordinance 2024-02. Um, Ms. Kardash, if you could read that by title, please. Thank you, Mayor. Ordinance 2024-02, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances, Appendix A, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 6, Development Agreements, Section 96.00, Authority and Requirements, providing for severability, providing for inclusion in the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, and providing for the effective date of this ordinance. This was advertised in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on February 7th, 2024 and March 6, 2024. This is second and final reading. Okay, Ms. Vincent, I know it's uh, second reading. No new information to be added to the record. So Just, uh, the main approval. crux of it is changing the uh, length of term for a development agreement to not exceed five years, years. with an automatic, not an automatic, but a one five year extension with, by super majority vote of the board. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any public comments on that item? No. Here at Alex 514 Ashland Avenue, uh, it's good to see the board correcting this that was changed previously. Uh, I do want to remind the board that the way it's worded, the extension can be up to five years, not five years. 
and it's important the fact that uh, you've put it where it does require a supermajority. So I would full heartedly recommend you uh, pass this ordinance. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? No raised hand at this time. Okay. Um, any commission comments? We have a motion and a second to approve, please. So moved. Second. Uh, this is for uh, clarification for Ordinance 2024-02, application number 23-07, amendment to the Land Development Code. Development agreement, second reading. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner D. Donato. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to sign a form, but. I'm sorry, you're voting on the ordinance. Oh, yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes, um, okay. Let's go to board and staff comments. Uh, Assistant Chief Ruggiero, any, anything? No, okay. Uh, Ms. Karnash? Nothing further, sir. Thank you for being patient again with us tonight. No you get a gold star, as they say. Uh, City Manager LaCourse, with that scowl on your face. Friday, 11 p.m. will be the Dorset Park, uh, the, Dornace, the Dorset Park plaque. That's 11 o'clock on 11 a.m. on Friday. On Friday. On okay. Friday. And Saturday is the city's Easter egg event, 10 to 1, at the sports complex. Okay. Um, Ms. Jacobs, anything? I have nothing. Okay, let's go, uh, Commissioner Di Donato. Anything, um, Commissioner Koulianis, Anything? Yeah, one. I was going to hit this button. Um, I appreciate your uh, your tolerance with me and my uh, little ailment that I had, uh, and I appreciate your uh, changing the meeting. I I never asked for it, but it's it's appreciated. Um, you're talking to Ms. Kardash? Yeah. Okay. No. What was that? Everybody. No. Well, everybody? Everybody. Oh. You. Even. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> even you. So, um, you know, I was... Uh, I only say good things to Ms. Kardash. Everybody else is rotten. So I just need a clarification. Go ahead. I like Frank DiDonato. Yeah. And Frank. He hey, counts, Frank. too. So... Um, a, 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 I was I was asked to speak at a um, at a um, a eulogy for a neighbor of mine. Um, I wasn't able to attend. Uh, his name was Jerry Conrad. I don't know if any of you know him. If you did, you were lucky. Um, but I couldn't attend because of what I was dealing with. Um, but you know. Uh, this my my neighbor Frank um, Jerry Conrad, you know he was, you know amongst us, um, there are silent heroes. There are those just good people. Uh, they don't all need attention like we all do, um, and they Jerry Conrad would do anything for anybody in our neighborhood and probably anywhere else. Um, if you were painting something, he would get a brush and come over and help you. If you were cutting trees after a storm, he'd bring his saw over and he'd jump in and do that. And those special people are in our town. Again, they're not famous. They don't run for anything. Uh, they go to work, they come home, they take care of their families, and they help their neighbors. And we have those special people amongst us. And they don't always get attention um, because they don't ask for it. But any, anyone from the Conrad family that's listening, um, Jerry was special. So thank you. That's all. Okay. Um. Commissioner Didon Nato. I'm sorry. Yes, 
uh, ask you already? Uh, Commissioner Kulianos, you got anything? Yeah, I uh, just want to wish everyone, uh, all the Orthodox faithful, a great and strong Lent and um, Kali Pascha. So thank you. Okay. Vice Mayor Eisner. To whoever's left and can hear this, there's a plant sale at Mother Mears on the 23rd. Please feel free to come and buy a plant. Okay. Um, we had a very successful Greek Independence Day celebration over the weekend. A lot of activities going on, a lot of people, and um, and um, it went well. So, and I appreciate the uh, uh, police department's patience <laughs> in, in the uh, logistics of carrying that out. It went well. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, meeting adjourned at 1219. Men's room. Um, if, unless you want a break, oh, uh, Commissioner Kolianis, do you, do you want to take a break or? Okay, let's. We're okay to continue. Okay, let's go ahead and this will won't take long. Um, okay, let's have a change of attorneys. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kardash. Okay. All right. I call to order the Community Redevelopment Agency meeting for the downtown Tarpon Springs redevelopment area on Tuesday, March 19, 2024, um, at 12.20 p.m. Uh, roll call, please. Chair Vatikiotis. Here. Vice Chair Eisner. Here. Commissioner Kulias. Here. Commissioner Kulianis. Here. Commissioner DiDonato. Here. Okay, uh, City Manager, uh, LaCourse is your name tonight, right? Yes. Yeah, if you would like to go ahead and proceed. <laughs> yes, um, actually, this is a resolution, isn't it? So, yeah. Ms. Card, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me get my act together here. Mr. Lewis. Yes. If you could read resolution 2024-01 by title, please. Yes, a resolution of the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for fiscal year 2023 through 24. Okay, thank you. Um, City Manager, of course. Yeah, Ron Herring will give this. Ron? Sure. No, thanks, yeah. Well, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Ron Herring, Finance <laughs> Director. Um, CRA Budget Resolution 2024-01 is being brought forward for, to, for budgeted items from fiscal year 2023 that were in process and or not completed as of September 30th, 2023. I just tried to itemize the three items in the cover letter there for you. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Or any public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And there are no raised hands at this okay. time. Okay, is that Mike? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Mr. Racy's. Um, commission comments, anything? Yes, I wanted, uh, Ron, this $200,000 for parking downtown, is that is that is for us to continue to try to get more parking for the downtown yes, area? Yes, we've, we've been budgeting for about 100000 a year. So those are the prior two years that we budgeted for, but they haven't been spent yet. Okay, there, there, there has been a, um, a property real nearby that, chiropractic office between Copenhagen and stuff. Uh, they've been willing to want to talk about parking stuff, but we've given it to the city manager to talk about. Um, it's prime location, close to a lot of businesses in town. It ain't going to get much closer. They just, they just they not come into the price we can give you. They, they won't come down to a reasonable price. So okay. I'm still waiting if they come back. I'm st still waiting. <laughs> Work with them a little bit, but I'm yeah. sure it's one of those properties where we might have to pay a little bit more because that's oh, how yeah. close it is to downtown. Yeah. So something to I can go a little bit more, but not quite where they are right now. So. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, any other commissioner comments? Yeah, I'll just ask a question. We have the 92000 for the Jitney um, building. Um, I know that Ed Hopper was doing it, uh, for, you know, for free. What is the money that we put aside there? What is that for? Oh, this is for the parking garage. Parking I, I understand. I for know the garage that. for the Jitney. Okay. 
No, sorry. what we're sorry. waiting for <laughs> is is for him to give us a proposal that meets that price frame. Um, that's basically what we're waiting for. We're waiting for him to design something and bring something back to him to meet what, what you as a commission budgeted. Um, and it's taken a while to, <laughs> it's taken a while and it may not come to fruition, but you still have an opportunity to bring us back a plan and, and I understand we've got some contingencies with some underground stuff that may not be able to meet this price. So we're still waiting, the ball's still in Mr. Hoffman's court and we're waiting to see what he'd propose to get that cost to ability to meet the budget. Okay, I mean, you can't answer what he has to do, so we have to wait for him. Just figured I'd ask, because I just bring the money forward. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else, Vice Mayor? Commissioner Kulianis, I don't have anything. Um, if there's no further comments, roll call, please. We need a motion. Motion second. So moved. Oh, we need a motion and a second. Thank I already you. so yes. moved. I'm sorry. Second. Yeah. We're Roll done now. now. Commissioner D. Donato? Yes. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Vice Mayor Eisner? Yes. Chair Betty Kiotis? Yes. Thank you. What is this? We vote Born in a magazine? I'll bring the rest on. Go back and start your time. This is a requirement we do every year to have to present this report. It's, it's a requirement, requirement we do it in March. So this is the report to bring forward. And I'll turn it over to Karen Lemons to give the economic development report. Thank you, Karen Lemons, economic development manager. This is the annual CRA report for the fiscal year 2023, which covers October 1 of 2022 to September 30th of 2023. And as Mark said, it needs to be done in March of each year by state statutes. Uh, the CRA map is on the right. As you can see, it's bounded by Mears on the south, the Anklet River on the north. It goes up and down Alt 19, and it goes east on the downtown area to Levis and then west to Spring Bayou. It was created in 2001. Um, the goals are to stimulate redevelopment and um, encourage economic growth in the area. We've had some good business activity again this year. This is a list of the businesses that have opened and or expanded. The expansions are really exciting for us because it shows that there's economic activity in the area and we've got a good um, business growth. These are some openings coming in 2024. Some of these have already opened but did not fall within this fiscal year. Um, Catalina's La Cantina, we're hoping that they're gonna open this year. Um, JoJo's Diner is expanding into the adjacent storefront. Um, DK's is the former um, Tin Man, which was Copper Mule, which was Irish Kelly's. Uh, Five Branches has relocated downtown, and then Cohatch and Kikolis are still projects that are ongoing. Our incentive grants are a big part of our CRA. We have four incentive grants that we offer that help to attract businesses and keep our businesses here. The facade, the restaurant, the building code, and the mural grant. Each of these are 50% reimbursable, capped at a maximum amount. 50% um, reimbursable, meaning the applicant pays up front and then is reimbursed at the back end once the project is complete. The facade grant is the oldest. It was created in 2011. The restaurant grant in 2015. The building code in 2020. And then our mural grant is the newest one in 2021. Just looking at over the years, we've offered and had approved 99 facade grants, 20 restaurant grants, 13 building code grants. And then this past year, we've had one mural grant that's not completed yet, but that's at the um, uh, Five Branches Brewery. And then just looking at who applies for the, uh, for, the, for the grants, the building owner primarily does, as you can see on the facade, and the building code grants, and the restaurant is about 50-50. Here's just an example of the impact that the grants have. This is Sponge City Brewing. You can see the before and after. Uh, Sponge City Brewing also got a restaurant grant for Grease Trap and some permanent kitchen fixtures. 
And then this is an example of the building code grant. This was twisted orange that had to do a complete um, redo of their mechanical and their electrical systems. Economic impact of the grants, we've had 132 projects, um, about $812,000 expended in grant funding, which leveraged private investment of about $4.5 million. And as you can see, we've got a good rate of, in, uh, rate of return, and then the average grant amount is a little over 6000 If you'd hold on for a minute, I think we need five more minutes. Is it that time again? Thank you. No, no, this is a different meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're oh, okay. All right, never mind. Just finish it up. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that, yeah, that's correct. You're, you're correct. It's yeah, a different okay. meeting. It's a different agency. We can go forward. Go ahead, Ms. Lemons. Yeah. Excuse the interruption. <laughs> <laughs> and then projects within the CRA um, in this year. These are the Tarpon Springs Apartments. This is that eight-unit development that was approved um, last year along the Pinellas Trail. The Liberty Stable Hotel, an adaptive reuse of a historic structure in the historic district. This will be an eight-room hotel. Um, they've got all of their approvals, and they're in for permitting right now. The Enclote Distillery, um, this is a working title. They're not being called the Enclote Distillery, um, but they're taking another adaptive use of a Quonset Hut building. That'll be our second distillery in the city. And Five Branches Brewery, they are now open. Uh, they purchased the former Krusty Bread Bakery last year, um, expanded and relocated um, downtown. I think you can see there's a theme here with the adaptive reuse of these older structures. That's exactly what the CRA is meant to do. Between the, con the Quonset Hut, you got Krusty Bread, the Tea House also um, on Orange Street, those are all taking old buildings that have really been um, not in use, putting them back on the market and getting them um, back to use again. And then downtown parking, this is an ongoing project for us with the business activity comes the issue of parking. So within the last um, three years, the CRA has leased three private parking lots, uh, recently installed seven new parking directional signs to point motorists in the direction of where the parking is. Um, with the help of the Tarpon Springs Police and the Public Works, uh, we've created 12 new on-street spaces on East Tarpon and on East Court Streets. So within the last three years, um, through our own city solutions and private partnerships, we've created almost 115 new parking spaces. Beautification and uh, historic preservation is also part of the CRA activities. Uh, landscaping, planters, lighting. We'll be doing a project this year, lighting on uh, North Safford Avenue between East Tarpon and the dog park. It's pretty dark there, so we'll be adding some lighting there. And then the historic markers. We now have 30 historic markers throughout the city. Uh, this slide lists the ones that are inside and outside the CRA. These are both the state historic markers, as you can see on the top photo, and our local markers that are on the bottom. Um, thanks to the partnership with the Historical Society, we've been able to add four more this year. And that project has become more popular as people are learning more about it. The semaphore signal was restored at the train depot this past year to um, replicate what it had looked like back in the day. And then our festivals and events listed here, these are the ones that are within the CRA. They continue to be popular, bring tourists and locals downtown, help our businesses. And then ongoing and future projects, uh, as you know, the CRA owns the lot on the 100 block of East Harpen Avenue. We also own the Spring Bayou, West Tarpon Avenue property that the Community Redevelopment Center is located. Um, the proposed Jitney building is, is a work in progress. And then we've got the code amendments and the comp plan updates and implementation of all of those that will have an effect on the CRA um, moving forward. And with that, I just want to thank the CRA board for all of your support and also the downtown business owners and property owners for all of their support and all that they do for the city. It's really a pleasure working with all of them. Um, with that, any comments or questions? Okay. Um, Ms. Lemons, uh, you know, when you, when you kind of go through day by day uh, during the year, 
um, you really don't get a sense of how much is really going on until you actually collect it in one spot. And then you see there's a whole lot going on. And um, all of those that you mentioned are, are really good businesses. And then um, I know that citywide, we've had a lot come in through new chamber memberships and, and things and ribbon cuttings. And uh, so there's some real activity in Tarpon Springs, but the type of activity is um, not anything that is changing the character of the town, which is good. As a matter of fact, it's adding to it, uh, such as the breweries and things, uh, those old buildings. So I'm really happy to see that. Yeah, it's the infill projects, like you know, the acid-based approach is taking what we have already and making it yeah. better. Mm -hmm. That's a needs-based, yeah, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Eisner, anything? I just want to thank you for all you do. Um, I love the way the town looks. Um, I, I appreciate all, the, all your hard work. What can I say? I have really, uh, I mean, I get on nothing but good feedback. Everybody says that it's going in the right direction. And uh, I like to keep the um, tarpon tarpon. So uh, it looks really good. And, uh, you know, I see more and more people. I know you have a women's, not you, but they have women's night and they have these get togethers. and. It really is, you know, you pass by and it's a hustle and bustle. So uh, it's, it's really, from what I remember being down here 10, 11 years ago to what it is now is like night and day. And, uh, you know, I just see it being younger people, not my age, but younger people that drink and, you know, party and it's good food. It's good, uh, it's good vibes. That's all. So thank you. Um. Commissioner Koulianis. I'm sorry, Koulias. Koulias. Sorry. Koulias. Uh, thank you, Karen, for all your hard work. I'm, I'm happy to see that sketch for the he uh, heavily AC building, the old former building where the what, Inclo Distillery is going to be. That looks sharp. And mm -hmm. anything we can do to try to enhance that corridor, as I talked about, you know, land use, switching some uh, ability to build more mixed use along there as we try to get people to come head down towards uh, downtown. So thank you so much. Yeah, we're trying to head south and north on the trail and fill that in. Perfect. Uh, Commissioner Kulinernis. Karen, thank you for all you do. You know, Karen is a fellow marathon runner, so she knows how to put the hard work in and uh, how to make it work for her. So thank you so much for everything. You know, you, you, that's how you approach your job every day put your head down and get so, a little bit of done every day and eventually it turns into something. So thanks. Okay. Um, thank you. Commissioner Di Donato. I will echo and offer you kudos. I go back a ways with you and I, I know that you've done a tremendous job and, and your job is very much needed in this community. So thank you. Okay. Um, there are no public come. There are no public here. I assume Mr. Racy's. There's nobody that's got his hand up. Is that correct? You are correct, sir. There are no raised hands at this time. All right. Um, we need to have a motion to accept the re uh, annual report. Right. Yes, this way. We have a motion to accept the annual report, the CRA report. So moved. Sir, second. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Di Donato. Uh, yes. Yes. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Vice Chair Eisner? Yes. Chair Yes. Okay, that, unless any commissioner's got any questions, um, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. We also have uh, a couple of documents here that need to be signed as well, so before you leave. Meeting adjourned at 1237. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you so much. Yeah.